Hey, and welcome to the Know It All podcast with our Oscar special. We're doing a two for one today due to the medical community poisoning me. We had to break this into one whole show and go our picks and then our real picks for the Academy Awards instead of breaking it up for a Wednesday and Saturday show. So we're getting both things done. We're first going to go over our picks for our best movies of the year, and then we're going to break down and do our picks and best bets for the Academy Awards on Sunday night. So with me, of course, is Rita Cinema and Dr. M. Sage, our entertainment analyst, here to break down the Academy Awards. Are you ready to get into some movies here today? Yep. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to go into our picks, and these are our picks. They don't have to be Academy Award-nominated uh, films. They are just the films that came out in uh, 2020, which feels like almost 10 years ago. Uh, I went exactly. back and looking up, and I forgot that half these movies even came out in the time period up to the Academy Awards uh, end date, which was February 23rd of 2021. So let's start out at the bottom with best visual effects. Rita oh. Cinema, what did oh. you have as your best visual effects in the 2020 uh, Academy Awards? Okay, well, I did not have any alternative films in this one um, to add to those already nominated um, and because I think there's only one film that could possibly win this award, uh, and that's Tenet. And I believe um, I'm going to give my, it actually was probably one of the better visual effects I've ever seen in a movie, period. It, it was not a movie I really enjoyed that much, but the visual effects- well, I don't think you're going to like my list then. <laughs> well, it, it was absolutely awesome. So I'm just gonna go with Tenet on this one. I'm not even gonna offer any alternatives. All right, Dr. M. Sage, what do you have in the visual effects category? Well, I don't even know if mine was technically eligible, <laughs> but, I'm going with Wonder Woman 1984. It was eligible. <laughs> and right. I don't know why it wasn't nominated. What a tremendous <laughs> movie with an awesome, like, 80s montage in it. You know, the, the um, whole trying on the clothes thing. And it had an invisible plane. So, I mean, come on. Yeah, uh, I had Tenet as my best visual effects film. And then uh, as a couple runners up, uh, we'll go with nominees. I had Wonder Woman 1984 in there. Yes. I had <laughs> Bad Boys for Life in there. I had Ooh, the Birds yeah. of Prey film in there. And I also had the film Soul in there. So uh, those were my uh, five films. But my winner in the best visual effects category was definitely Tenet. I just thought that was a ridiculously put together uh, visually effective film. So uh, we'll move on from that. And we'll go into the musical categories. Uh, best <laughs> score. So Rita Cinema, where are we going with best score? You're moving around a little bit, so I'm going to have to move my notes around a little bit. I think I'm going from bottom to Actually, top. Actually, she's going from bottom to top. I know, but my list doesn't follow <laughs> that exactly. Um, okay, to be perfectly honest, I found this one hard to do. I, I can't even, I'm not sure, because when I watched the movies, um, I wasn't really thinking about original score. Sometimes I noticed the music. But the fact that it's an original score, it's not always something I pay that much attention to. So I have to admit, other than the ones that were nominated, I really didn't go out and look for anything else. Although I will say, I do remember that I thought the music in Mank was awfully good. So maybe it's just that it wasn't... Um, Am I looking at, yeah. Oh, it is nominated. Sorry, I'm yeah, looking at original there. song. <laughs> I'm looking at the list for original song. Sorry, because Mank was very good. Yes. Um, however, I'm going to give the award to Soul because I thought it had very good, uh, you know, sound uh, music. I'm not, sound is a different thing. Um, That's next. That, that was very original sounding. And look, it worked so well with the story itself and the characters and, so I like the way the story and the characters and the music blended. So um, I will say also that I thought maybe 
if I'm going to offer an alternative, that Tenet also had a very interesting original score and probably should have been nominated. So. Yeah. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with best score? Well, I'm a little off the board here. I have two picks. One is Hamilton because, I mean, it's Hamilton, right? <laughs> the other is the documentary, The Bee Gees, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, which had awesome music. It you had were, awesome music, but I would, don't think that would be considered an original You're going score. by weird Golden Globe rules in your... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just ask it. See, that's what I'm saying. When you think about original <laughs> score, doesn't that mean the music has to be written... I think, we, I think we're okay with it. Uh, right. These are my awards. <laughs> yes, I know. Let me it's, own them. But that's what I'm asking. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's hard when you're watching a movie uh, to review it or to think about it or just to be entertained by it to think about, is this an original score or not? You know, well, that's what I'm, uh, next year you, you, can, the you can you focus know. more on original <laughs> scores. So you well, I pay a... more attention to original <laughs> song, which you didn't include on this list. I, I sort of threw that all into original scores. It was well, a it's very different, actually. <laughs> yes, I know, but it was a universal uh, music thing because I didn't want to make twenty-five musical awards that we had to go <laughs> over on the day. But uh, best score for me was also. Tenet I had in there. Uh, my nominees for it was Judas and the Black Messiah. Mank was in there as well. I, I really actually liked uh, The Life and Times of David Copperfield as well. And then uh, Hans Zimmer, uh, Wonder Woman 1984. Uh, I, I really love. Now, it was much better in the uh, original Wonder Woman movie, but it's still yeah. uh, really, really uh, a fun theme. Uh, also, I had Mark down there, uh, Defy Bloods. Uh, Spike Lee usually has a really good score for his film. I did not think this was his best one, yeah. but uh, it still needs uh, at least a little mention. But uh, Tenet got my best score for I this I went back and so. listened to the, I went back and watched Defy Bloods again because I watched it so long ago, a, a, a few days ago, because I was interested in listening to the music more. And it, I, I was kind of surprised that it was nominated, actually. I mean, I enjoyed the music, the score, but I was a little surprised. Yeah, it, it was not Spike's best, but uh, that's grading on a very uh, big curve. But uh, we'll move from score to sound. Uh, Rita, where are we going with best sound? Well, I don't even, I, hang on, I gotta find my page here, I'm moving. I didn't, oh, well, I thought, again, um, just like with original score, I thought Tenet should have been nominated here as well because the sound, as it followed the things that happened in the movie, were, I, I just thought that- Well, it's I been was just, punished for ruining movie theaters, so I, I guess it was get just awards. amazing. I just thought Tenet's sound was amazing. However, I think there's only one movie that can win this award. I couldn't go beyond it again, um, so I don't have a long list of, and that is Sound of Metal, because what they did, to convey the story with the sound and the, it, it was uh, amazing. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with best sound? Sound of Metal. Sound I of think metal. that it's amazing what they did with that movie. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think this is actually a pretty deep category, but uh, I went with Tenet again, but also <laughs> in there was uh, Sound of Metal. And uh, I thought Mank was really good too, the way they uh, <laughs> drived in the old school sort of uh, feel of Hollywood in mm -hmm. there. And uh, then lastly, uh, Bad Boys for Life also <laughs> gets my best sound. Uh, you know, I watch Bad Boys for Life, but I can't for the life of me remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was because it came out in pre-pandemic times, oh, no, and we really? were all happier and uh, more joyous people at that uh, point in life. Uh, all right, so Tenet has swept my awards right now, but uh, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but uh, it might be fading out as we get into uh, the next handful of categories. Uh, we're going with best editing, so. Uh, Rita Cinema, where are we going with best editing here? Well, this one was a hard. I again, I think it's awfully hard not to include Tenant in this one <laughs> as well because of the way it was put together. 
you know, technically, the problem is technically that movie was just very well done. It's mm-hmm. just that the Nobody movie liked itself, it. <laughs> I did not like the movie, which makes it hard with most of the other awards. But with, I, but to tell you the truth, again, I, I felt like the two best, uh, th- there were two that w- I thought were the best in terms of editing. And one was um, The Trial of the Chicago Seven with the way they uh, put together um, the older Oh, the film, old footage? The older footage with and blended it with the current, uh, I mean, with the movie itself, mm-hmm. plus the courtroom scenes as well, I thought were so well done. And so, you know, it definitely, to me, was one of the better edited films. But I would also throw in Nomadland because the way the photography flows and you see the, the way they put together the scenes the where vistas. the individuals were talking and... Uh, you know, living in their trailers, it, I, I just, it's hard not to say that's not the best edited film. Yeah. Uh, Dr. M. Saved, where did you go with the best editing? Well, I'm going in a very different direction again. I think that Borat, subsequent movie film, was extremely well edited to have all of those different sides. I can't argue sides, with that. <laughs> all of those different Move, you know, all of those different scenes and put them together in a movie that actually flowed. Where they I were faking the people editing. out as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Borat, uh, so you really are making a pitch to get on that Golden Globes committee. You've had the Bee Gees documentary <laughs> and uh, Borat uh, nominated exactly. for the <laughs> Academy Awards uh, today. I'm just waiting for my invitation. <laughs> uh, best editing for me was uh, Chloe Zhao in Nomadland. Uh, if mm-hmm. there was something I really, really uh thought that film did excellent was just the way it uh, was put together and moved and uh, the shots were just uh, ridiculously good. So uh, I I thought that uh, deserved the award. And if uh, Nomadland uh, wins anything, that one she should definitely win uh, for sure. The other ones, uh, Mikkel Nelson for Sound of Metal, I thought was a really uh, nice piece of filmmaking, especially on the budget that they uh, you know, sort of had to work with uh, there. Uh, James Herbert, uh, The Gentleman, the Guy Ritchie movie, which nobody probably remembers, came out uh, also around the same time as Bad Boys for Life uh, because (laughs) it was pre-pandemic and we were all living the good life. But uh, The Gentleman was a really solid film. And then uh, Jay Cassidy for Birds of Prey were also in my nominees for Best Editing. But I I think Chloe Zhao and Nomadland really, really uh, deserve that award. But... uh, Next up, we have costume design. Where are we going with that one, Rita Cinema? Well, actually, I think um, one of the ones that was left out here was Wonder Woman in this case, where they did the 80s kind of thing. I thought that was kind of interesting in costume. Oh, um, it was terrible. But, but um, <laughs> the, the, they, they, it won't, you know, it's not winning my award. I just thought okay, it was good, kind of good. interesting. Um, no, no, I think, uh, and I did wonder, the list you sent out of films included Coming to America, but I assume it's in next year's group, because I think so. cos- the costumes for that movie. Well, no, were... you had to look at, I sent you 2021, but you had to look at the cutoff date. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, I think it's after the cutoff yes. date. Yeah, it is. Well, it better be nominated next year. It better be. Those were, those were great your costumes. Mind great. Yeah, they, I, I don't know how anybody will beat that. No, I think Emma by far. I and that I also went back and watched that recently. Um, the costume, and I was amazed because the first time I saw the film, I was really watching more for the story. This time, I watched for more of the things around the story, and one of them being the costumes. And oh my goodness, this movie needs to win best costume design. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going here? I I would agree with that. Now, Borat's costumes were pretty amazing, but (laughs) Emma's costumes were beautiful. You can't, there there isn't anything else in that category. I don't think that can compare. Well, this is uh, one for the ages because it's a three-way sweep here because I also (gasps) had Emma. uh, It's a sweep. 
Alexander Brine uh, for Emma. I had best costume design. Now, I did think there were two others that were really, really good. Uh, Trish Somerville and Mank. I thought the Mank costumes were they ridiculously were. good, too. And then uh, uh, Bina Dagler uh, for Mulan. Uh, the Mulan uh, movie mm. uh, really was uh, something you know, to behold. I forgot I, I really about did Mulan. Like that as well. Well, I have trouble. I two. There are two animated films that are nominated, and I guess you know you design costumes for animated films as well. But somehow or another, when you don't put real people in them, you know it. it um, I think they're talking about the live action. Mulan, not the animated one. Yeah, oh, the, the live the, action. Mulan. Yes, I know, but it had it, it was it had animation in it as well. Did it? No, no I guess it was it all live action. action. No, yeah. it was yes, all I'm live sorry, action. Sorry, having a senior moment here. <laughs> Maybe well, it's just Mulan. Pinocchio. Pinocchio was it a live action? <laughs> yes, I didn't yes. see it. Okay, well, I, I feel don't think better anybody now. watched it. No, no, I feel better now. I because I looked at that and I thought, why would you include? <laughs> But yes, I watched and I watched Mulan too. I can't believe it. Okay, my Sorry last one that. in there. I, I was you know throwing what? In a, though none a of more us modern one. Wait uh, a minute. None of us mentioned Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which everyone actually will do this in our next show. Which, but is what everybody thinks will win. Yes, uh, but uh, the other one I threw in there, a more modern style, was Bad Boys for Life. Uh, Donya <laughs> uh, for best costumes. What costumes did they wear? They're all wearing very nice designer shirts. Go look at what Mike Lowry's wardrobe is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Check out Mike Lowry's wardrobe in Bad Boys for Life, and you'll see. It's a very stylish uh, movie. So uh, that Let me throw out one more thing about Wonder Woman. <laughs> I know I've been chastised here for picking a bad costume design, but one of the things they do in that movie is use clothes to show power on the women. Yeah. Wonder Woman's costume in this movie is fantastic. But the cheetah If they hadn't too. done the stupid thing where he's trying on all the 80s clothes, which just drove me nuts. It was too long. I hated that scene in the whole movie. Well, but Wonder Woman's costume and I thought, is fantastic. I, actually, I, thought it, I thought it was kind of funny because I can remember wearing those stupid clothes <laughs> like that. Well, I didn't wear well. those clothes, but, you know, I thought it was pretty accurate, actually. They were stupid looking clothes. But, you know, they as that character um, that Kristen Wiig plays changes they yeah. change her clothing. Oh, yes, absolutely. her personality, which, you know, but it yeah. doesn't yeah. even approach Emma, so. No, I, 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 uh, or, Wonder Woman yeah. had some really nice uh, costume design, but uh, I think Emma and then Mank and uh, I, I think. Yeah, Mulan. they're all better. Yeah. Uh, no, no question. To the best uh, looking film, we're going to go with best cinematography here. So uh, cinematography, where are you going, Rita Cinema? This one was, I didn't add any additional movies, although I suppose Tenet could kind of get in here. Um, I think it's more visual effects than it is cinematography, if you want to, you know, truly define cinematography. I think the two best are, I, I don't think there's anything better than Nomadland and Mank. I think those two were by far the best in terms of cinematography. Um, I would probably... And it's hard for me to say. I can't pick between those two. I think they're very different kinds of films. One uses more digital. The other uses more true photography. But I thought both of them were very good in terms of the, the, yeah, you know, the cinema so. aspects. I haven't seen News of the World. Um, I kind of wondered. I don't know whether it, you know... Uh, cowboy hats and uh, okay. I think we're okay. Well, just in terms of the landscapes and the yeah. cinema yeah. aspect. I haven't had a chance to see that I one either. Seen it, so I feel like I haven't, it wasn't nominated. Well, it was nominated, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Where are we going, Dr. M. Sage, for best cinematography? I have to agree with Rita Cinema on this. And um, I would give it to Mank over Nomadland. I like the cinematography in Nomadland. I mean, it's pretty amazing, the photography in general there. But the look of Mank is so similar to the movie it's trying to emulate that I just really thought they did a good job with it. 
Yeah, uh, I, I think this is a fairly deep category. I, I could have probably written down about uh, 15 or 20 movies uh, down here, but uh, I have Eric Messer Schmidt for Mank as uh, my best cinema photography, but uh, I think Hoyt Van Hama for Tenet definitely deserves a little bit of a mention. Uh, Angus Hudson for The Life of Head, uh, the Italian movie with Sophia Loren, oh, I thought definitely yeah. uh, at least deserves a, a yep. mention there. Uh, Sean Bobbitt, Judas and the Black Messiah, definitely uh, I, I thought had a really nice uh, had a great look, yeah, as well. And then uh, uh, of course Nomadland and uh, Joshua James Richards, I thought were really good, but uh, I don't think there's really anywhere to go but uh, Mank here because uh, that thing. Uh, while it's not my favorite film, it, it looked and sounded uh, ridiculously well. It, yeah, it did. All right, we'll move very on. much conveyed the period, the time yes, period. Yes, definitely. It so did. You got the old Hollywood uh, sort of feel out of that thing. Uh, best screenplay we're going to. So uh, I think we probably well, all. Two, by the way, there's two screenplay. Yes, awards. I know, but I didn't feel like researching whether it was an adapted or <laughs> original. So uh, good screenplay for you, Tim. Good for you. <laughs> so which so, one are we doing now? You can any you screenplay. Can do either or <laughs> both. All right. Thank so, you. So best screenplay. What are you looking for? <laughs> Oh, am I up here? Yes. Okay. Sure. Uh, let's see. I think in terms of original spring, I seem to have not written any of my notes on this one. Um, Go from the top of your head. You could do it. Yes. I'm just trying to remember if I had any films <laughs> I wanted to add here. Um, I think uh, original screenplay, I really... Uh, I think the trial of the Chicago Seven is my favorite. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, while I did like Promising Young Woman, I would give the screenplay to try. I thought, you know, it was. I know a lot of people don't like Aaron Sorkin, but he does this fast-paced dialogue thing. Yeah. And he did that in that movie, and it just made all the scenes work. I think by doing that. And so um, I, I liked that. As far as adapted screenplay, again, I haven't seen The Father. So this was a little more difficult in terms of picking a winner. But I thought One Night in Miami was very good because he took his play and made it a movie. And it's very contained by the fact that it's all in one room with these five characters. And yet he was able... Uh, Unlike Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which I think did not do well in terms of adaptation, this one did quite well. So I kind of would like to give the movie um, the the award to to One Night in in Miami. Doctor M um, Sage, where are you going? Well, I have two for this category. One is an animated film, Shaun the Sheep, Farmageddon. Awesome story. <laughs> How can you do better than a great story of a cute alien that loves pizza and lands on a farm, you know? And then I actually like Sound of Metal screenplay because mm -hmm. it just tells such a good story. And Minari, of course, has a great screenplay, but I'm saving that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, best I screenplay. didn't finish, by the way. Oh, oh, oh okay. sorry. I had a couple of others to throw out there. All right, go give us your other. I don't know. This is where I don't have. My, I don't know whether they're adapted screenplays or original screenplays. Does it matter for us? All right, um, we'll accept your answer. This is okay. why I did one These are two because of my I didn't want to look that I'll talk about later in my overlooked list. One of them is Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, which I thought had a very, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was just. It, it was a moving story with a great screenplay. And the other is The Assistant, which I thought was quite a interesting uh, yes. concept and the way it was written and everything about it made me really love that screenplay. Now, I don't know, I would guess that both of those are original screenplays, but I'm not yes. sure. Well, uh, yeah. I, I think uh, we can tell uh, you are my mother because uh, my uh, winner is Aaron Sorkin in the trial of the Chicago yeah. Seven. 
Uh, wow. My other, my other screenplays are Kemp Powers, um, One Night in Miami, yeah. Kitty Green and the Assistant, and uh, Eleanor Catton and uh, Emma. So, uh, but yeah. my winner is Aaron Sorkin. I, I don't like his directing, uh, but uh, he can write a screenplay or a TV show, I will admit. Yeah, this is what happens when That's I don't true. have my notes, because Emma was on my list as well. That would be, of course, adapted screenplay. Yes. Yeah, uh, but, but it was just adorable. Yeah, so. It was. It was very good. So uh, you hit everyone I hit down. So uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> shared brain. And neither huh? of you liked Sean the Sheep Farmageddon. I cannot believe it. No. I don't think I saw that movie, so I can't say. But I did see <laughs> the other animated film that was uh, getting, that's getting a lot of attention, Wolf Walkers. Wolf Walkers. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I I assume I don't know if it's from an Irish tale or if it's original, it is. but wow, that's you know, yeah, yeah. Very yeah that good. one was really good. I almost put it into my movie list up here, but it didn't quite yeah uh, edge out. But uh, we'll move to the big time awards here, and we're gonna start out with best supporting actress. So, uh, Rita Cinema, where are you going with best supporting actress? Oh, you didn't put that on our list. But I did. Oh, it in. yes, it is. Oh, is it? I yes. just, it is. I, I just didn't write it down. That's all. Okay, but I did it anyway. Which one are we doing? <laughs> Best supporting actress. <laughs> actress. Well, I couldn't yes. tell you said actor or actress. Okay. Uh, Best supporting actress. Should I start with the actresses I think were overlooked? Yes, go with your nominees. This is our Academy Awards. We aren't yes. even into that part yet. <laughs> well, because I think, you know, well, we get we have our will win, should win coming up, and I know who exactly. will win. I think there were two actresses who did very just beautiful jobs in their roles who were overlooked. One is Ellen Burstyn, who played the mother in Pieces of a Woman. I think her acting was, she, I... And believe me, I think Vanessa Kirby is great in that movie. It's not a good movie. Um, you know, it's not going to win any awards. But those two actors stood out. And I yeah, thought, they Ellen, were, Burst they were I thought Ellen Burstyn was overlooked. The other one, who actually I think might be somebody who should win the award, I'm going to go with her, was Dominique Fishback in Judas and the Black Messiah. She oh. played his girlfriend slash partner and... You know, I think she's overlooked because there are two male stars in that movie who stand right. out so much. And yet, Fred Hampton was who he was and did a lot of what he did because of her, the, that character. And yep. she played that so subtly and yet strong woman. And she, she, you just felt her influence. I just thought she did an astounding job and was overlooked and should have been a best supporting nominee. I, I would agree. You know, like, she was take fantastic. Glenn Close out. Take Glenn <laughs> Close out. I know she's a, you know, like, and put <sighs> Dominic Fish back in. Yeah. yeah. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with best supporting? All right. I'm going out into left field here. And I know Rita Cinema is not going to agree with me. But <laughs> I liked... Kristen Scott Thomas as Mrs. Danvers in Rebecca. Mm. Oh my. I thought yeah. she was an awesome Mrs. Danvers. <laughs> so Kristen Scott Thomas. All right. I don't, I, I'll live nice. with that one. <laughs> that might be her career achievement award there. <laughs> Uh, I didn't really. No, like... she was a good Mrs. Danvers. Yeah, she scared she the was... crap out of me. Okay, I don't want to live with her. <laughs> uh, Come on, my best supporting actress. I really didn't like any of the ones who were nominated in the real <laughs> ones, uh, other than Amanda Seyfried for Mank. I thought she was yeah, really she was good. My favorite character in the whole yes. film. Uh, you mentioned yeah. Dominic Fishback in Judas and the Black yeah. Messiah. It's uh, ridiculous that she wasn't nominated. And then uh, Kristen Wiig in Wonder Woman 1984. Kristen Wiig was, was good. No, she no, was she was the good. best. She was no. actually the best part of the film. They should have had more. Oh my goodness. They should have I had more. I couldn't disagree more. If they had more Cheetah, 
we would have been okay. The problem is we didn't have more cheetah. So Cranston wig in 1984. But oh, my winner no. overall for best supporting actress is uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead in Birds of Prey. She plays the huntress. Uh, I really, really liked her in that film. Uh, she was really, really great. I thought she just, uh, that's probably the best uh, role she's ever had. So uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead in Birds of Prey. So that's my winner. Well, you liked Birds of Prey a lot more than I did. <laughs> yes, I don't think you quite, uh, that's probably not hit your comic book genre. You don't understand the cheekiness. It's a I understand the cheekiness. I just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we'll go from the girls to the boys here and the best supporting actor. Where are we going with best supporting actor? Okay, well, I have actually, this is, this is strange because this one, I had several that I thought had been overlooked. Oh, I don't think that's strange at all, Rita Cinema. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one is actually Chadwick Boseman who got nominated for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom as Black, as Best Actor. And of course, you know, is we, well, there are issues there. It's okay. Anyway, we all know I actually, why. I actually thought the nomination that he didn't get that he should have was as Best Supporting Actor in Defy Bloods. I, I thought he, you know, that movie was not, you know, I liked it when I watched it, but when I watched it again, I realized the things that were kind of wrong with that movie that, you know, why it didn't get nominated. Yeah. Although, um, you know, anyway, but Chadwick Boseman uh, playing a supporting role in that was very good. Very good. And the other one, I don't know. I, and I never see anything about this. I thought Mark Rylance playing William Kunstler in the trial of the Chicago seven. Of course, he's one of my favorite actors. So there's a little bit of a personal thing here. I really like him. But I thought he was pretty convincing. <laughs> I just loved him as William Kunstler, although probably Kunstler was a little more druggy. I think he was probably <laughs> high on marijuana or LSD most of the time he was in court. But anyway, and, and that, I, I don't know. I, I really think there, I'm going to say for the next show who I think should win this award. But those are, the, those are the ones I think were overlooked. Yes. So, right. okay. Actually, just as a fun nominee, to <laughs> Bill Nahi in, I, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing his last name right, uh, in Emma, played the father. He oh, was hilarious. Oh, yeah. He was fantastic. He was hilarious. But, you know, I wouldn't put him as a best supporting actor yeah. necessarily. Dr. Ibsage, where are you going for best supporting actor? Once again, I'm going into. Far, far away from this is the sheep again. Everyone else, <laughs> it is Christopher Jackson as George Washington in Hamilton. Yeah, I couldn't do Hamilton. <laughs> You're really big on the <laughs> Hamilton, so uh, I enjoyed I, watching Hamilton. Yeah. And when I make up my awards, it's about if I see this movie, scro well, I'm scrolling through the channels and it's on, will I stop and watch it? Yes, I will. I'm not sure I categorize it even as a movie. I think I need to categorize it as a film. But it has an Oscar nomination, so yes, that's why I, I did it. I know, but... <laughs> and I love uh, George Washington. He's a great character. Uh, my best supporting actor probably is... Uh, the favorite to win it is uh, Daniel Kaluuya in uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, he was just great in that film. Uh, the guys I, I, I thought uh, my nominees, uh, Hugh Grant and The Gentleman, I really, really liked uh, him there. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> Mark, you mentioned Mark <laughs> Rylands in The Trial of the Chicago 7. Uh, really, really good. Uh, Chadwick Boseman in Defy Bloods, the actual nomination he should have got. I, I thought there were two really good performances in the Five Bloods, even though it's not really a, a film I loved, loved. And then uh, I, I thought as a token nod, uh, Bill Murray on the Rocks. I yeah. thought deserved a little bit of love. It was, he was he was the funnest part of that movie. So uh, he was he very was. good in that, but he played himself. Yes, I know, but uh, yes, it's pretty okay much. for Bill to play himself. <laughs> All right, so we'll move from supporting actor to best actress. Where are we going with best actress here? Best actress. I want to tell you that actually this year, I think this is one of the strongest fields I have seen in a while in terms of best actress. To me, 
This is the hardest one. This will be the hardest one. If I were, if I were a member of the Academy and had to vote on the actresses that are nominated, I don't even know if I could choose. I, they are all so, Interesting. they're just so good in their roles. I think all of them are. Now, do I think there were some actresses overlooked? Yes. I think that Julia Garner for The Assistant, um, I thought she was outstanding. I'm sorry she wasn't nominated, but you know, you can only pick five. And I actually thought Anna Taylor Joy, Anya Taylor Joy, was quite good in Emma. She, yes, she was. I, I don't know that she, I don't think her performance stands up to these five who have been nominated, who have, you know, different really meaty roles, I think. Um, you think Viola I, Davis should have been nominated? Yes, I think she should have been nominated. I, I interesting. I, she's actually I would replace. The, she's actually the favorite right now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm reading. Um, yeah, I think she should have been nominated. I just my problem is I don't want to drag an actor or actress down by virtue of not liking the movie. And that movie I didn't like, but I thought she did do a good job um, playing the role. But she wouldn't. I wouldn't give her the Academy Award. I. I think maybe I'll give the Academy Award to Vanessa Kirby. Oh, Ooh. Vanessa Kirby. All right. Dr. M. Sage, where are Nothing you Nothing else. She Vanessa? didn't get enough attention from the crown back when she played Margaret. So. <laughs> she was awesome in the crown. Yes, she is. Oh. All right. Dr. I M. Would Sage. Give, I would give Best Actress to Julia Garner in The Assistant. She carried that movie. The yes, movie wouldn't be great. there without Julia Garner in it. Right. Well, and now her I... subtle acting was so good. Now I think we're realizing we're all related here because my winner is Julia Gardner. Garner for the assistant. <laughs> so, well, it's too bad the Academy overlooked her. Yes, I know. It uh, is. It's a shame. That, that movie I really did like. I, I sort of forgot it did come out when it had come out. And then uh, when I did my research, I remembered it. And I was like, that was really probably one of the better movies of the year. Yeah. And it just sort of got lost. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if it's sort of being on Hulu or something uh, just sort of uh, made it disappear. But uh, you mentioned Anya Taylor-Joy as Emma, I really thought uh, was really good. Uh, Margot Robbie in Birds of Prey uh, was another nominee. Sophia Loren in The Life Ahead, yeah. I have. Uh, and then uh, the two nominees that got nominations, uh, Carrie Milligan in Promising Young Woman, and then uh, Frances McDormand in Nomadland were yeah. uh, my nominees overall. But I, I really liked uh, Julie Gardner in the-, uh, the You know, it is kind of a shame that Sophia Loren really was not, I, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't put I'm her surprised. in this, but she was so wonderful in that film. Um, I'm surprised. Well, keep well, that in I think your the mind film just, for uh, best actor. <laughs> I think it just didn't get any much attention. It didn't even get a nomination for best international film. Yes, no, it I didn't. know. Uh, but they might also not have put it in there too. They, you know, so there's no telling. But uh, we'll move on to best actor. Uh, Rita Cinema, where are we going with best actor here? Okay. Well, I'm gonna actually. I put Bill Murray in here. That's where I included him. Okay. Maybe, you, best, oh. maybe supporting actor would be. Well, I that's think that's okay. Where, Lakeith Stanfield ended up in like. Okay. <laughs> well, that's yeah. one of my best. That's one of the things I want to mention. He is on my best actor list. I think he yes. should have been nominated for best yes. actor, not best supporting actor. Somehow I he's agree. in every scene in so the movie. He's and actually, he's and yes. I thought he was excellent. Um, but I also, this was a category where. I'm not as impressed with the list. Well, I am. They're all very good. <laughs> um, but Delroy Lindo from Defy Bloods, how did he not get a nomination? He really was, his acting, it, maybe it was a, it's just the film. I don't I know. Think I think it's maybe so. a little of the film. It also might be a little of the character. I, I don't yes. know if the Trump loving black man is yeah. going to sell it. He played yeah. the the far right black, the only one in the country, I suppose. No, that's not true. That, but he played a black man who, uh, you know, has very conservative feelings and wears a Make America Great hat again. And but his acting should have been recognized. It was, and also I thought Dev Patel in the Personal History of David Copperfield was just wonderful. I I would have nominated him. Can we have ten mm -hmm. actors nominated? Anyway, I'm well, give it 15 to 20 years and we probably will. <laughs> I, I think 
that, I, you know, I, I'm going to tell you, this is who I think should win the award. Okay. I think right, Riz Ahmed, Ahmed oh, yes. Sound of Metal. He, I'm, you know, he, that was a hard role to play and he was darn good in it. Yeah. And most of the, I haven't, I will tell you, I haven't seen The Father. And so I can't comment because I suspect Anthony Hopkins. Of course. Really Anthony Hopkins is pretty yeah, much yes. always good. So it was hard for me on this one. Yeah. Uh, Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with best actor? Now, see, I tried not to pick the actors that were in the categories that were going on in the next show. But Lakeith Stanfield should have been nominated as best actor. And that's who I would choose. Yeah, the yeah. other person that I thought is wonderful in his role and i'm gonna put him in best actor because he was in the movie in almost every scene is alan kim in minari yeah. oh the little boy yeah yeah he's well, really good i had uh riz ahmed nominated in sound of metal and delroy lindo into five bloods that was the other great performance i, I thought in the five bloods lindo and chadwick boseman and then uh but my winner is uh the little boy in the life ahead, Ibrahim Agay. Oh, uh, yeah. I thought he was oh. ridiculously good. Uh, <laughs> right. And I, yes. I don't think this category is all that deep. Uh, I, I haven't seen The Father yet, so I, I sort of left a spot open there uh, for uh, uh, Anthony Hopkins. Uh, so, uh, but uh, that little boy in the life ahead, I thought really, him and Sophia Loren carried that movie really, really nicely yeah. together. So uh, that would be my uh, number one choice, but uh, we'll move on to best director here. So where are we going with best director? Uh, hang on a second. Got my pages all mixed up here. There we go, best director. I mean, I know what the, <laughs> the answer is, but okay. Well, there were a couple who were overlooked and I'm sure you don't think Aaron Sorkin was overlooked, but I think he was because I like the trial of the Chicago Seven um, as a movie, as a film. Um, I also I also think Regina King, who directed uh, One Night in Miami. Right, Miami. She had to take those actors in in a very contained situation and make it work. And I really and you know, with a play that's been adapted to the screen. I thought she did what she needed to do to make that work uh, and give a feel of a movie and get the most out of those actors um, that, that were in the film. Um, so I did think she was overlooked, but I can't not give the award to Chloe out. She's, you know, she did a, that was a masterpiece. Yes. All right, Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with best director? Well, I have three directors here. Of course, Chloe Zhao. I mean, you can't not. So that's a shoe in. But even though they did not have a movie this year, I will always choose Joel and Ethan Cohen <laughs> because they are my favorite directors ever. <laughs> and then I'm going to give it to Frank Marshall for the Bee Gees documentary. <laughs> Oh, all right. <laughs> Frank Marshall for the Bee Gees talk. <laughs> all right. So, uh, well, I hey, a... the Cohen brothers did do Fargo. They worked on it, which didn't get any nominations for anything. And I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, but they're just more producer credits than director directors. So, well, season four got overlooked. And I yes. It was pretty good. Uh, for Best Director, I had a couple nominees, uh, Natalie Erica James for Relic, uh, Kitty Green for The Assistant, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, Guy Ritchie for The Gentleman. But uh, I have a two-way tie for Best Director. Uh, Chloe Zhao in Nomadland, definitely in there. But then Adele and Bilal Fala for Bad Boys for Life, I thought really <laughs> resurrected that series. To uh, take that- Oh my God, is it gonna be your best picture winner too? Oh, I hope so. Well, it might be nominated for <laughs> sure. Boys but for life. To take that uh, 90s piece of uh, great cinema and to uh, <laughs> revive it and make it actually a good uh, 
film with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence being uh, now in their 50s uh, really uh, was kind of a nice place to be, especially. It takes when, some work. Yes, it takes some work. Especially when we've seen uh, these kind of old school movies uh, revived. <laughs> if anybody would like to go see the latest Rambo installment, uh, you can see what happens when we take uh, very old actors and put them back in their uh, action movie uh, series. So uh, no. to uh, bring back Martin Lawrence, who really hadn't acted uh, for a very long time, and then uh, Will Smith and put them into Bad Boys to Life. At least it deserves, deserves some love, and then tie it with uh, Chloe Zhao in No Man Land. All right, we'll go to the big one. Uh, best picture. Where are we going, Rita Cinema, with your best Oh, picture? I'm excited. Okay, here is my list of overlooked films. Um, <laughs> I'm not... These were the ones that were not nominated. <laughs> My excitement is waning. <laughs> <laughs> the Assistant, Emma. Really, Emma, a few years ago, that would have won Best Picture. Nowadays, it doesn't yes, even it get nominated. <laughs> the Personal History of David Copperfield, On the Rocks, The Life Ahead, One Night in Miami, The White Tiger, and Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. Those are all... Now, I will say, this is what I'm going to say here. The films that were nominated really are the best films of the year. But these films are equally good, um, I think. You can't nominate everything. And, you know, they're, I guess these just, you know, they could have popped up in here. I mean, sometimes you see something like that. Um, but I do think the films that were nominated uh, were probably the best. But... Drum roll, please. I'm picking Here Emma. It comes. Emma for best picture. Emma. And let me tell you, I have a personal attachment to that movie. It was the last film I saw in a theater on March 11th before the pandemic hit, and I haven't been back in a movie theater since. So everything else has been on my TV. <laughs> well, we the Emma. All right, Dr. M. Sage, where are you going for your best picture? Well, I don't think that either of you will agree with my best picture. I have a tie. It's not the Bee One of them, doc, I'm sure you can guess, is <laughs> Bee Gees, How Can You Mend a Broken Dude, Heart? <laughs> and the other movie that was overlooked that I would watch in a heartbeat any day of the week is Eurovision the story <laughs> of Fire Saga? <laughs> I thought that and might there be you a, have it. Uh, best uh, sound thing for you, uh, maybe. But uh, it might have been as good as Bad Boys for Life. I can no. <laughs> I think it was better than Bad Boys. No, for Life. it certainly was not. Uh, a couple nominees I have. Uh, Sound of Metal definitely made my list uh, for uh, Best Picture. The Assistant made my list for Best Picture. Uh, the film Relic, uh, which uh, technically is the father, but uh, the Australian version of it and actually might be uh, probably oh, yeah. better, but uh, nobody... Uh, <laughs> caught up to that one. Uh, I, I thought Soul sort of got lost in there. Uh, yeah, it did. It, well, it was nominated for Best Animated. Film. Animated. Yes, I yeah. know, but that's And it will win, probably. Whatever <laughs> picks are. Oh, it will win. Uh, gets nominated. They could just show a blank screen with a bouncing ball and they uh, <laughs> nominate it. <laughs> Uh, but I, I thought it was really a good film. Uh, and then The Gentleman and, of course, Bad Boys for Life uh, is in there as well. But my best picture is Tenet. I really, really oh. love it. Got uh, screwed over I can't here. believe you didn't choose Eurovision or the Bee Gees documentary. Come on. <laughs> Uh, if I was choosing a documentary, it would have been the Michael Jordan doc. So yeah, <laughs> but that was that was a television series. Yes, we're talking Emmy awards. A, that wouldn't count as a movie. Yes, nope. but it would have like four years ago when they changed it because the OJ doc was uh, <laughs> seventy-five hours long. And, uh, <laughs> but so uh, when the Emmys come up. That one will be on my list. Yeah. All right. So those are our uh, Best Picture and Academy Award nominees. Now we'll go into the odds for the real ones.
All right, so let's get into the real uh, Academy Award picks. Let's start out with best visual effects. Tenet comes in, it is a four and a half to one favorite with then Midnight Sky at plus 285, Mulan at plus 1500, Love and Monsters at plus 2800, the one and only Ivan plus 3000. Rita Cinema, where is your pick for best visual effects? Okay, are we supposed to do what will win or what should win or both? You can both. do your best bet and what you want to win. All right. If you want to choose Ivan, that is fine. <laughs> so we're doing, this one is best <laughs> visual effects. That's correct. Okay. Well, just put your money on tenant. You won't win very much, but I don't think anything else here will, will win. That's probably a safe bet. Dr. M. Sage. I would say that's a safe bet. I don't think there's anything else in the category that, even really very interesting. And I'm shocked that Midnight Sky was even nominated. I thought their visual effects were fakey and like they had miniature. I just hated that. <laughs> that yeah, that's I, why this category is, there's just nothing, there's nothing to no. it. Uh, yeah, Tenet would tenet. be my choice. And uh, if you take anything else, uh, you're pretty much insane. Uh, so uh, ride with Tenet here if you, uh, want to win a, a couple dollars. Though the odds, my guess, are spiking even higher as uh, the days go by. So uh, I would say so. So uh, we'll move on to best uh, sound. Sound of Metal is a minus nine to one favorite. Mank comes in at plus 850. Soul at plus 850. News of the World at plus 1800. And Greyhound at plus 2200. Uh, Tom Hanks can no longer get real nominations, but he's in a lot of movies that have good sound, apparently. So uh, where are we going for best sound, Rita Cinema? Well, at least in this category, they have some st substantial nominees that actually could deserve yeah. the award. But I think that um, there's both, I, I'd put all my money on Sound of Metal. I thought the sound, you know, the, the fact that they were dealing with death and, and they made you, I mean, you transitioned from full sound to muffled sound and no sound. And it yeah. was just so great the way they did that. I, I think they will win. I'd put my money on sound of metal. Yeah. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with this one? I would also put my money on sound of metal. The, the movement from third person to first person like Rita Cinema said, was just amazing. It was just a, a very well done movie. Yeah. And I uh, think people should watch it just for the sound, frankly. If you don't have any interest in it, yeah. you still should watch it for the sound. Yeah. But you'll the, get pulled into the story too. The the sound is really good in that one. Uh Mank at plus 850, I, I think is a little bit live. Uh, we'll see where everybody's uh, fascination with Fincher goes because mm -hmm. it, it could be a bit of a live underdog here, especially with a film like Sound of Metal. That's a really, really small film. You, yeah. I don't wonder yeah. how many people actually even saw it who were voting on the uh, the award overall. So, uh, Well, I think Mank or Soul both could yes, sneak a little in bit of an upset here, but they shouldn't. Yes, Mank they was should good. Know. The sound was very good. Yes. So was soul. Mm -hmm. It was. All right. We'll move on to best original score. Soul is the favorite here at minus 800. Mank comes in at plus 500. Minari at plus 1200. News of the World at plus 2500. And Defy Bloods at plus 2800. Where are you going with best original score, Rita Cinema? Um, I think Soul's probably going to win it. But to tell you the truth, if I wanted to go out there on a limb, I think I might put my money on Mank. Mm. Yeah. That's a, I, I, I'm with you there. Uh, Dr. M. Sage, what are you thinking about best original score? I liked both Mank and Minari's original score. I thought they did beautiful music. Uh, when, when the music enhances the movie, but doesn't take over so you're listening to it, that's when you know you have a really good score. I think Soul will probably win, but I would probably go if for my choice with Mank. Yeah, uh, that's where I, I was curious about, uh, you'll sort of see where uh, the Fincher thing sits. Like if he wins something for like best sound, I think it could sort of start to sweep all these little 
uh, sound and music categories here uh, for Mank. So I, I think that five to one's a little bit of a, a live underdog, uh, but uh, solid 800, I think will be hard, hard uh, to beat for sure. All right, let's go to best makeup. Uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is the favorite at minus 250. Hillbilly LRG at plus 550. Mank at plus 650. Pinocchio at plus 650. And Emma at plus 1400. What is your favorite for best makeup? I think that probably Ma Rainey's Black Bottom will win. Um, <sighs> mainly because I actually, I hate to almost say to say it, but I think Hillbilly Elegy actually did a pretty darn good job with the makeup and it could be a dark horse. However, I think everyone hated that movie so much <laughs> that they're not going to give it an award for anything, including makeup. So Mank would be my other choice, but I think Ma Rainey's Black Bottom will win. Yeah. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going for best makeup? I'm going with Hillbilly Elegy. I think it will win and I think it should win. Yeah. I did not like the makeup in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. I thought they did, and I thought they overdid Ma Rainey's makeup. I know a bit about Ma Rainey, and I know pictures of Ma Rainey, and she didn't look like that. Yeah, uh, I, I think Hillbilly Allergy. It depends how much they hate the film overall, but uh, I, I do think it's probably the best out of this choices. Uh, so uh, at five fifty, worth a shot. But uh, I, I think they're going to want to give uh, Ma Rainey uh, Black Bottom some love somewhere in there. I think I, that's I'm not a hundred percent sure why, but uh, it. it just seems like this is a nice token Ostriger to give it, and uh, no one will really uh, pay attention that it doesn't win anything else. Uh, we'll move up to best film editing. We have the Trial of the Chicago 7 uh, at minus 130. The Sound of Metal at plus 160. Nomadland at plus 600. Promising Young Woman at plus 1400. And The Father at plus 2200. This is a pretty tight and uh, deep category here. Uh, where are you going, Rita Cinema? Uh, I will put my money on, the, I think the favorite here, minus 130 at Trial of the Chicago 7. I think it will win. I think it should win. Although I do think Sound of Metal um, deserves some kudos. Yeah, definitely so. If I, were, if I were going for it a long shot, I'd, I'd go with it. I don't know whether Nomadland might sneak in. A lot of people really like what was done there. But, yeah. You know, I'm uh, thinking Dr. in terms of the, uh, the Academy <laughs> voting, you know. Where are you uh, going with I, I actually think that Nomadland will win uh, for best editing. Uh, putting all of that together, um, that was a good job. I would go with that one. Yeah, uh, my choice would be Sound of Metal or Nomadland here, but uh, I, I think the trial of the Chicago 7s cut a little too clean, and I, I think uh, the Academy will definitely probably lean that way, but uh, and uh, I, I think they'll save uh, Nomadland's awards for probably Best Director and Best Picture here, so it might get a little looked over at Best Film Editing. Uh, like I said, The Sound of Metal, which I think probably deserves the award here. I, I'm just really curious how many of the uh, people who are voting yeah. on this have uh, watched that one, uh, you know, all the way through. So uh, I, I think Trial of the Chicago 7 probably wins it here, but uh, Nomadland, I think a little bit of a, of a live choice uh, there. All right, let's go up to costume design. Uh Emma at plus 120 is a co-favorite with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom at plus 120. Make at plus 350. Uh, Pinocchio plus 2200. And Mulan at plus 2800. Where are we going with costume design, Rita Cinema? Well, I think Emma should win. I was really impressed with the costumes in that film. But I think Ma Rainey's Black Bottom will win because I think they want to give the award to that movie. From what I've... Dr. Kind of M. Sage... Uh, I think Emma will win, and yeah. I would pick Emma to win. I, I just, I'm not taken with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and I'm not taken with the costuming or the makeup at all, frankly. I'm not either, but the Academy is, apparently. <laughs> I'm going with um, Pinocchio here. <laughs> Are you really? Okay. No, I'm not going with Pinocchio. Oh. I can't even believe that stupid movie. Yeah, put a hundred spot on that movie to win <laughs> 
Pinocchio. That would be an interesting choice. No, I, I think Emma might steal this. They seem to like those uh, sort of Victorian era of uh, uh, period dramas. Films. So uh, I think this might get uh, Emma a little love here. So uh, Emma at plus 120. I uh, hope so. I do really like here. I do think it's the deserving winner. Uh, a little love to Mank as well at plus 350, but uh, I, I don't think it stands a chance for uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom or Emma. Okay, we'll go on to best cinematography. Nomadland is the favorite here at minus 210. Mank comes in at plus 190. News of the World at plus 1200. Judas and the Black Messiah at plus 1600. And The Trial of the Chicago 7 at plus 2000. Where are you going with cinematography here? Well, once again, I think the favorite will win here. I think Nomadland will win. Um, I kind of think Mank should win, <laughs> but I think Nomadland will win. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going? My goodness, Rita Cinema and I agree. I think Mank should win, but I think Nomadland will win. Yeah, see, I, I think Mank's a play here at uh, plus 190. Um, this has Fincher written all over it. They'll hand uh, Fincher these type of awards, and then they can skip him for his bad movie that he actually made <laughs> instead of just making something that looks visually pretty uh, despite the movie being stupid. But uh, so uh, I love I, I, the movie. I did not find that movie stupid. Oh, God. Sitting watching Gary Oldman be drunk for two hours is not my... Yeah. Uh, thing of entertainment. I watched that throughout the 80s. No, I really, no. you know, I wanted to like that movie and I just hated all the people in it. And we, it, I, so I couldn't, ex except for Marion Davies, they were all just despicable people and I disliked them and it made me, unfortunately, See, dislike the movie. They were despicable people. But I cared what happened to those despicable people, which I made me really like the movie. Mm -hmm. I, I loved that they movie. Didn't even I would the best part where you could have had Mank and Orson Welles uh, pretty much hate each other throughout. That's the story they should have told, and they didn't even tell that till the last, you know, <laughs> right. last scene of the movie. But the movie isn't a about him it's about Mankiewicz yes yeah. I Mank. know but Mank being drunk in a room it's boring <laughs> that's it it was that's exactly what I said about that movie who the it's hell was it boring at all I <laughs> thought that movie was fantastic I watched that movie with someone who hates absolutely hates Citizen Kane who said I think I want to watch Citizen Kane again after this well, yeah, because I mean, Citizen Kane something. is good. <laughs> All right. I well, liked Mank a lot. I, I liked the way Mank looked. <laughs> Mank is almost as good as the Bee Gees documentary. <laughs> All right. We'll go with best animated film. Soul at minus 900. Wolfwalkers at plus 450. Onward at plus 1400. Over the Moon at plus 2800. And Sean the Sheep at Farmageddon at plus 4000. Is uh, Dr. M. Sage going to take a long shot here and Sean the Sheep? Where are you going, Dr. M. Sage? Long shot back I am, here? I am not going with the long shot because everyone, <laughs> I think, knows that Soul will win this category. <laughs> Rita Cinema, where are you going with the best animated feature? Well, I will tell you that I think Soul will win, too, because it's Pixar, it's Disney. I think everybody's seen it. Everyone was looking forward to seeing it. But to be honest, I, I've seen, I have not watched Over the Moon or Shaun the Sheep, so I need to be honest about that. I don't know. But I'll tell you that Wolf Walkers is a wonderful tale with very eye-catching art. It is not Pixar sharp kind it's of it's different. old school animation. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it sh but um, I, I wish it could win, but I'm pretty sure Soul will win. Yeah, anybody who doesn't take soul in the Pixar film, uh, yeah, probably should go. Uh, yeah. back and to I love it. soul. I really Soul's enjoyed it. It's a beautiful it, movie, though. It's a good movie. Artistically, yeah. I was just very impressed with Wolf Walkers in the story. Well, yeah. I, I think that's where they sort of need to separate, do a separate category for these animated films. One like Wolf Walkers, that's an old school animated film like that, needs to be separated from you know these. Uh, yeah you know, computer generated animated films. It's two totally different styles of, right. you know, movie making now and 
the Wolf Walker stands no chance when you have an animated film like Soul. So uh, it, it just, Soul will win it, but uh, Wolf Walkers, uh, go watch it if you haven't. I, I believe it's on Apple, so. Uh, yeah, it is. Check that out. All right, we'll go to, we're going to separate the screenplays in this one. Best adapted screenplay. Uh, Nomadland is the favorite at minus 350. The Father at plus 450. Uh, Borat's subsequent movie film. I'm not sure how that even has a script, so I'm not quite sure how that works out. But uh, One Night in Miami at plus 1600 and The White Tiger at plus uh, 3000. Where are you going with best adapted screenplay? Um, I think Nomadland will win this. Um, I don't have much doubt about that. However, if you want a long shot, I, I think both One Night in Miami and The White Tiger were beautifully adapted for the mm. screen. And if I were just going to say, heck with it, I'm going to put $100 down on The White Tiger. And if it won, I'd be rich. <laughs> Although one night Miami is more likely to win than the White Tiger, but both yes, of them I, were, were, I thought, yeah. uh, excellently adapted. Maybe we'll go over to India and the White Tiger has a better chance to. <laughs> oh, you don't want to go to India right now. They're no, nobody here. wants to go to India right now. They're all dying from COVID over there. All right, Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with this? Well, my pick would be Borat because I just think that Sasha Baron Cohen is just amazing at putting that story together. I think Nomadland will win. Uh, I think Nomadland's a pretty strong favorite. I haven't seen The Father, but that would be probably my second yeah. choice uh, if I was looking for anything in this. Uh, it, it, I thought One Night in Miami probably deserved a couple more nominations, but uh, I just don't think it has a chance in uh, adapted screenplay. But uh, no Madland, solid uh, choice here. Let's go to best original screenplay. Uh, Promising Young Woman, the favorite at minus 250 here. Uh, the Trial of the Chicago 7 at plus 175. Minari at plus 1400. Judas and the Black Messiah at plus 3,300, and Sound of Metal at plus 3,300. Really deep category here. Yeah. Uh, do you think the favorite promising young woman deserves those kind of odds, or are you going somewhere else? I am going somewhere else, although I do think promising young woman, this, is a, this category is loaded. Every one <laughs> of these is just a great screenplay. Yep. Um, I, it's hard to pick a winner. I. I have to say, I think that Trial of Chicago 7 will win, um, but I think Minari should win. I thought that screenplay was just so touching, and I loved it. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with original screenplay? I would like to see Sound of Metal win, but I think Minari will be the one that wins. I yeah. think that's a, just a fantastic story. Very well written. This is good a good family story. A really tough one. Uh, I think Minari's hurt because it's not totally in English. So I wonder if uh, that might hurt it a little bit in original you screenplay. Read, you can read the subtitle. <laughs> yes, but that doesn't mean the people who voted for it wanted to read the subtitles. Right, <laughs> You have to uh, watch international films. I, yes. I'm curious how much they watch of the international films and how much random to buy uh, well, arms I do lords know, off for a vote. I do so. know someone in the Academy, and she does watch every film. But uh, the uh, But the that's trial just one person. A few of them, though. <laughs> <laughs> The Trial oh, of the Chicago that's... 7 at plus 175. I, I think really good value here. I, I, I think I find it very hard that they pass on uh, giving Aaron Sorkin some sort of uh, nod hmm. to uh, being alive. So uh, plus 175 for uh, the Trial of the Chicago 7 here. All right, let's get into the acting awards. Uh, best Supporting Actress, Yoo Jung Yoon, minus 300 favorite as a Best Supporting Actress. Maria Baklava, plus 275 for Borat's subsequent wow. film. Uh, Glenn Close, Hillbilly Allergy at plus 1100. Olivia Coleman, The Father at plus 1600. And Amanda Safride at uh, Mank at plus 2000. Uh, where are we going with Best Supporting Actress here? Uh, am I up? Yes. Yes. Yes, okay. please. 
All right. Well, she's been winning all the awards all season, and she certainly deserves it. And that's Yoon Young, Young, who um, is in Minari. I, oh, she just won my heart. <laughs> you know that I loved her portrayal of the grandmother, and so she. You're not going to win much money on that bet. So if you want to go for a long shot and bet a little money, go for Amanda Seyfried because she. Oh. It's kind of a shame that I don't know she wasn't in a film that's now kind of getting as much attention and I thought that's probably as good a role as she will ever get and play and I did think she was outstanding and I I don't really think she'll win but um it's too bad (laughs) yeah she was very good um I have to go with uh Yoo Jung Yoon I think that she should win. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion that Glenn Close may be, because she hasn't won before, and I'm not even sure why she was nominated, so I hope she does not win, but I have this just little nagging feeling that she might. Yeah, if they haven't given it to her for any of her actual good performances. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's I, I, sad, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know yeah, if it this is, is sad. the one she's going to end up winning it for. Uh, I, I, I hope not. I, I actually hope not. I think she's still got better roles in her. I, I really I think like... she's an excellent actress and probably should have won an award by now, but I, I just hated that film so much. I couldn't get <laughs> into it. I didn't... It was okay. It just, you know, it's just... A, <laughs> It's just such a terrible story. But, it's, but it, her performance doesn't come close to some of the others in this category, no. I don't think. Uh, I, I really like Amanda Seyfried in this, but uh, I, I don't think there's any way you can probably take her with any good conscience and think she's going to win. Uh, I do think Yu Jung Yoon's probably the uh, uh, a big favorite here. Uh, I, I find zero chance that the Academy is going to hand uh, Borat uh, subsequent movie film a Who Academy <laughs> Award. So uh, I, I think Yu Jung Yoon probably pretty safe to win here. All right, we'll move to a another loaded category: Best Supporting Actor. Uh, Daniel Kaluuya's a heavy favorite here, but uh, he's got Sasha Baron Cohen in The Trial of the Chicago Seven at plus nine hundred. Uh, Leslie Odom Jr. in One Night in Miami at plus. Uh, 1400 uh paul rossi at uh plus 1400 and then uh, his partner in the film for some reason who's in every scene is uh nominated for best supporting actor like east stanfield at plus 2500 uh where are you going with best supporting actor uh well i don't think there's any question that daniel kaluuya will win i'll be shocked if he doesn't and he was excellent in the film um but if you want to place a bet that might bring you some money. I do think Paul, I don't know how you pronounce it, Racy or Rossi. Oh, um, so good. <laughs> he is a long shot. I'd put my money on him. I think he could win. He was the, he conveyed so much with his words and his facial expressions. And, um, you know, it's just, again, Sound of Metal isn't a movie that's been widely seen. I don't think he's an actor that people know real well, but he's my long shot. And unfortunately, I did think Lakeith Stanfield was very good in Judas and the Messiah, but he, you know, he stands behind Daniel Kaluuya, who played Fred Hampton, and it's, it's just not going to happen for him, I think. But Paul Racy could sneak away. With Dr. M. Sage? I would like to see Paul Racy win. I think he was amazing in that movie. I would really like to see Lakeith Stanfield win. Uh, I thought that he, he, I wish he would have been nominated in the category where he was supposed to have been nominated for right. Best Actor. I think that Daniel Kalula will probably win, but I would, I really, really thought that Lakeith Stanfield was fantastic as Bill, Neal, Bill O'Neill. Yeah, uh, I think I'd lean Daniel Kaluuya, uh, I, but with Lakeith Stanfield, I'm very worried. Like, uh, like they cr- cross the, the, each the other vote, out. They're going to split yeah. votes. You, you see it sometimes in sports awards where yep. two guys on the same team are both up for, you know, like an MVP award and then end up uh, splitting half the vote 
to each other and it uh, sort of screws them over. So uh, uh, I think if that happens, uh, there could be a long shot in there between uh, Cohen, uh, I doubt Odom Jr., but uh, Paul Racy and Cohen could end up getting this if uh, the votes get split. Uh, once yep. again, I have no earthly idea how like, Keith Sanfield is in a supporting role when he's literally in every scene of the movie yes. from start yes. to finish. So uh, how that worked excellent. out, I, I yes, have no idea. Fantastic. Uh, but uh, he doesn't understand how he's in that category either. Yes. But uh, anyway, we'll move on to probably the deepest category. And uh, I think really uh, you could make a case for every one of these uh, women winning the award here. Uh, best actress, we got Carrie Mulligan as a slight favorite at plus 135, Viola Davis at plus 185 for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Frances McDormand at plus 350. Andrea Day, who uh, has really moved up as Billie Holiday in the United States, first Billie Holiday at plus 600, and then Vanessa Kirby uh, in Pieces of a Woman at plus 1400. Easily the deepest, a tough category. Easily the deepest category of the whole Academy Awards. Uh, where are you going with your choice here, uh, Rita Cinema? Well, here's where, if I've got some money to bet, I'm going to put some money on every single one of these actresses. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, one of them will win, <laughs> but they're all so good. Um, you know, back when I saw Nomadland, I kind of thought nobody's going to beat Frances McDormand, and I do think she's one of the great actresses of my, gener my generation, my time. Um, but I don't think she's going to win. But unfortunately, I don't think Carrie Mulligan's, Mulligan's going to win either. I I'll tell you, while I hate to say it, I think Viola Davis will win. I don't want her to. I would not pick her. But I, if I were advising people to put some money on this, I'd probably say go with her. But to, And honestly, it's even hard for me to say who is best because Andra Day, uh, wow, she just, I, I was shocked when she won the Golden Globe. And then I watched the movie. I hadn't seen it. And wow, she blew me away. She is great. The movie is not great, but she is great. And the same with Vanessa Kirby. The two of them, unfortunately, are in movies that can't carry them, but they carry the movie. Mm -hmm. Doctor, uh, absolutely. I say, put your money. You better put your money on Viola Davis. Like it or not, she's not my choice. But like it or not, you better put your money there. Doctor M. Sage, what is your thoughts on Best Act? I will not put any money on Viola <laughs> Davis. I think that Audrey Day for Billie Holiday deserves the award. She did an amazing job. I was right. so impressed with her performance. Um, that movie is all over the place. It didn't yeah. know what it wanted to be. So yeah. it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a good movie. But watching her in the movie mm -hmm. is just uh, enlightening. I mean, she's fantastic. I still think that Carrie Mulligan could possibly win this award though. Be happy yeah. to see her. Uh, I, I think uh, you both said it. I, I really liked Andrea Day uh, in the United States first Billie Holiday. Uh, the movie is uh, a, a pretty much an abomination uh, other than her. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't even know. It was long. Uh, I don't know why they just didn't split it up and make it into a mini series. And then she probably wins an award, an Emmy award, and we're probably okay. But uh, the movie is terrible. So I just don't think no they can focus to the movie. You don't know. You, no, you, you and can't tell the stories about. You know, there's already movies about Billie Holiday that are better than this yes. one. Uh, so, so I, I don't think you could probably give it to her, though. I think if I was leaning, uh, it'd probably be her. Uh, I, I would go Francis McDormand at plus 350. I, I think that's probably uh, the best money to odds if I was laying money to win it. Uh, but uh, I, I think any three of uh, Milligan Davis and Francis McDormand could take it. it. It's just too close to call. And then if you went based on performance, uh, Andrea Day really could, <laughs> you know, probably deserves it yeah. over all four. So uh, I, I probably lean Francis McDormand in uh, Nomadland, but uh, a, a whole lot of good actresses to choose from in that right. category. <clears throat> we'll move on to... Uh, Best Actor, which isn't quite as deep. I, I don't think these roles were probably the best. Uh, 
Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is a minus 1,600 favorite. Uh, Anthony Hopkins, the father, plus 700. Uh, Riz Ahmed at uh, plus 1,400 for Sound of Metal. Steve Yoon for Minari at plus 2,500. And Gary Oldman uh, for Make at plus 2,800. Rita Cinema, what's your choice for Best Actor? Well, this wasn't nearly as strong a category, I think, as Best Actress. No, it's uh, not. Um, and the well, favorite doesn't you know, even deserve to be nominated. Chad I would agree with that. Everyone thinks he's going to win. Yes. But let me tell you a little thing I read, and that is <laughs> that, and I have, the problem is here, I have not seen The Father. But a lot of people think that the members of the Academy who would vote for Chadwick Boseman would also vote for Riz Ahmed. And that group of people are going to divide their vote. And then oh, the interesting. Old, all the old guard are going to come up and vote for Anthony Hopkins. And Anthony Hopkins is going to win. Interesting. The, this, is the, this is your vote divided, Matthew, with MVP. Yes. So I'm kind of saying, put your money on Hopkins, because I think he might just win. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with Best Actor? I also have not seen The Father. That's just a movie I don't think I can take. But uh, my choice would be Riz Ahmed. I think his performance was excellent. I think he could steal the category. I think Chadwick Boseman will probably win. He's the sentimental favorite. I don't think his performance was good. I don't think it was close to, to Riz Ahmed's performance. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know even if the vote comes out where it's uh, Anthony Hopkins, if they're going to be able to not say Chadwick Boseman here. So, but uh, I have not seen the father either or, but uh Good people who I've seen said Anthony Hopkins' performance in it is uh, ridiculously good. So uh, I, I'm sure I put, it is. I, I put a little money on uh, that plus 700 for Anthony Hopkins. And uh, maybe everybody sort of uh, comes to their senses a little bit and realizes, well, we all like Chadwick Boseman and he was in numerous uh, very good films. Uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom really was not one of his best ones. And we just don't have to give him an Academy Award because he sadly passed away this year because it's the last movie he made. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think uh, a little money on uh, Anthony Hopkins here might uh, be uh, a little uh, safe to bet. Uh, Riz Ahmed's performance was outstanding. I, I just, uh, you know, I mentioned it was sound of metal. I, I just don't know how many have seen and, uh, that film and we'll uh, vote Riz Ahmed uh, to win it. But uh, I really did like his performance. All right, uh, down to the final two. We're gonna go best director here. Uh, Chloe so Zhao for Mad Madland is the favorite at minus 2,500. David Fincher at plus 1,000 for Mank. Uh, Emerald Fennell, Promising Young Woman at plus 1,600. Uh, Liz Isaac Chung at uh, plus 1,600 for Minari. And uh, Thomas Fitterberg, Another Round. Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, uh, really uh, pretty good film. So uh, maybe check that one out at uh, plus 2,800. Uh, where are you going with uh, Best Director here? Well, I have not seen Another Round, so it's hard for me to evaluate Thomas Vinterberg and I haven't really read a great deal about it either. Um, and frankly, I think this is Chloe Zhao's award this year. I mean, that's all you ever hear. It, I'll be yes. shocked if she doesn't win. Totally <laughs> shocked. So will she, I think she, you know, and everybody else in the film world. However, I do think if there's a long shot who could sneak up and beat her, it's Lee Isaac Chung for Minar Minari. <sighs> Very yeah. well directed. <laughs> I mean, if you can get a little kid to act that way. Uh, yes. You, you, it, it, very, very good job on directing there. But that's a long shot. I think it's Chloe's house to win. Yeah. Uh, Dr. M. Sage, where are you going here? I think that Chloe Zhao will win. Um, I think that Fincher is a long shot that could win, actually. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, a couple minds here. Uh I don't think uh, 
Chloe Zhao at minus 2,500 is a good bet. No, uh, <laughs> no, it's not a I good get, bet. I, I had a long shot bet too. <laughs> uh, especially when you have uh, uh, two uh, directors in here. Uh, one, David Fincher, who uh, pretty much everybody uh, loves and regards as one of the great directors of our time, sitting there at plus 1,000. And then uh, Lee Isaac Chung. I, I think the Minari movie is a bit of a sleeper here. I, you know, I, I think it's closer to Nomadland than uh, people think. Uh, overall, we'll get to that. In I think so too. Sure. So at plus sixteen hundred, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be uh, afraid to put you know a tad of money on Fincher or Lee Isaac Chung here to see if maybe uh, they don't like Chloe Zhao and her uh, van. Uh, traveling movie uh, <laughs> all that much uh so uh i i i would lean that way but uh I, I do think chloe zell will win it if we're asking that but uh i i think the minus 2500 uh betting odds uh i'd stay away from uh we'll yeah. go to the big one here uh best picture here no Madland, the favorite at minus 600. The Trial of the Chicago 7 at plus 600. Uh, Minari at plus 1400. Promising Young Woman at plus 1600. Mank at plus 3000. Judas and the Black Messiah at plus 3300. Uh, Sound of Metal at plus 10,000. And The Father at plus 10,000. Rita Cinema, what is your best picture this year? Okay. I'm on pins and needles, Rita Cinema. Well, first of all, let me say that. There was a point this year where I felt like the movies weren't that good. But I've gone back and watched several of this more than once, and I've really thought about these films. And actually, I think this has been an outstanding year, and that these films are all I think so too. just absolutely <laughs> excellent films, plus that whole alternative list that I gave you. Those were great films, too. Um, so I really, this is hard. I think these are all very good films. I think no Man Land is probably going to sweep and, you know, get a lot of awards, and I think it probably will win. But I wouldn't necessarily want you to put money on that film because you're not going to win anything. So if you want a longer shot, take Minari, because it is also an excellent film, and you might win a little money with that one. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going? I thought No Man Land would win this category. I thought it would be best picture, but I started thinking about it again, and I think there are a lot of people who may not like that movie, who may not actually relate to that movie. I think Minari might win best picture. I would probably choose Minari, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, I I think the film year, I, I agree with you, there are a lot of good films. I, I think the problem with this year, there's not that one or two like great, great films where you go, wow, that's the most amazing film ever, where, you know, in past years, there's usually one or two that separates itself really from the pack. And you look at this list and it's all, you know, a list of good, solid films that are well made and well done. So I, I think it was a good year, but I wouldn't go like greatest year ever. And uh, that also might be because we were all stuck in our house for a year and a half now. So uh, that might have affected a little bit. Uh, I really thought a couple months ago, Minari might make a push uh, up the board and uh, steal this. But uh, I, I don't know if it's because COVID and they haven't been able to do their little, you know, press tours around that it's gotten, you know, quite the, you know, ball rolling that it usually does. So I don't love it quite as much to steal this. I, I think this is going to be nomad's land. But it, it would be very hard for me to bet the uh, minus 600 uh, here. I, I don't think I'd touch the trial at the Chicago 7 as the second favorite. If I was taking anything, I'd lay a little mo money on Minari. Uh, but uh, I think Nomadland will definitely uh, be the choice that will win Best Picture here. Can I say one I more think thing? Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I, every year, there is some movie, one or two, that is nominated that really affected me emotionally and I really felt something about the movie. Now it's not always the movie that wins, but it's usually the movie I want to win. This year, there were two in this list that actually, I think brought my emotions up and you know, uh, cried a little bit, whatever. Um, and they are The Trial of the Chicago Seven because that ending where he's reading the names of the dead soldiers um, that just tore me up. Um, and I don't know how many Academy members were young 
adults in 1968, but if they were, um, they will have felt that too. Um, the other was Minari, which was such a touching family. I mean, it was heartbreaking. Yes. Um, I cried like a baby watching that, the end of that film. So I would say those two films of this list, I mean, I felt things in all of them. I, I haven't seen The Father, but I, it, they, those two films impacted me emotionally watching them. And, I, and, and so I, that's why I like them so much, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, I think that a little, there's a little bit of uh, suffering here from not seeing things on the big screen. I think that if you watch Nomadland on a big screen, that it probably would be even more the favorite, just because that had to be visually amazing on a big mm -hmm. screen. And, you know, right. we had to watch it on our big screen TVs. Right. So I think that that is one reason why we're, we're not seeing a movie that we think pulls away as the big favorite, because we watch them in a very much more small way than they were meant to be seen. I think Mank also, mm -hmm. if you saw it on a big screen, it would be like, wow, this is really much more than I actually thought it, it would be. So I think that uh, I think the movie suffered a little bit from that. Yeah. All right. So that's our Academy Awards show. We first gave our Academy Award picks, our own films, and then we gave the actual best bets for the Academy Awards. Be sure to find us on greenlightnetwork.org, Greenlight Network on Facebook and YouTube. Like and subscribe for our show. That's our show, and we're out.
Hey, hey, and welcome to the Winning Daily Show. We're here for April 25th, and what a Sunday it is. We are loaded with Major League Baseball, soccer, some NBA, the last of the tennis in Belgrade and Barcelona, and then the big race in Talladega, the Geico 500. We got a whole lot of bets to get into on that one, but we got a whole lot of bets overall today. Let's start out on Major League Baseball, and we're going to take the Baltimore Royals plus 118 versus the Oakland Athletics, and the Oakland Athletics are on a run. Let me tell you, they have won, I believe, 13 straight games, so uh, we're going against them here, and if they're going to lose a game, it might be with uh, Baltimore's only all-star, uh, John Means on the hill, so we're going to take this at plus 118 uh, against the Oakland Athletics and hope maybe they cool off a little bit here and uh, finally get a loss after that uh, slow start to the season. They've been red, red hot, so let's see if they go down today uh, with uh, Means on the hill for the Baltimore Royals at uh, plus 118. Next up, we're going to take the Kansas City Royals and uh, Danny Duffy minus the 126 versus the Detroit Tigers and Michael Fulmer. Really like Kansas City here. They've been playing really, really good baseball. Really uh, surprising how good a baseball they've been playing in this division uh, with the Twins uh, not playing quite as well. The White Sox been a little hot and cold and uh, Cleveland sort of just uh, being a little hot and cold as well. Uh, the Royals have been pretty steady and uh, with their best pitcher on the hill and Danny Duffy going against this uh, poor Tigers outfit. Uh, it is Michael Fulmer who's probably the Detroit Detroit Tigers best pitcher but I really like uh Danny Duffy here and the uh minus 126 so uh Kansas City Royals uh minus 126 today uh next up we're gonna go with the Dodgers Padres matchup we've been uh red hot on this matchup all week long uh hit the winner in each game of this one we're gonna go with the San Diego Padres to get that win back that they uh blew yesterday we're gonna Ride uh, Musgrove in the plus 108 uh, versus uh, Dustin May and the Dodgers here today. Uh, just think the Padres bounce back. Um, the Dodgers really should have lost that game yesterday. Came away with the win. I think the Padres will come into this one and uh, be ready to uh, win this game and win this series overall. Uh, and really like uh, Musgrove, who's uh, been really, really good for the Padres Uh Overall, uh, including that no hitter uh, at plus 108, uh, really good value there uh, versus uh, theoretically the um, worst pitcher on the uh, Dodgers staff right now in Dusted May. Now that's not saying stuff because I, I think he'd be a, a one or a two for uh, a whole lot of these major league baseball teams out here. So uh, we're going to go with the Padres and Musgrove at the plus 108 today. And then lastly, we're going to have an over under in major league baseball, the New York Yankees versus uh, Cleveland Indians. We had a big time pitching matchup yesterday. Today, I think we're going to get a whole lot of hitting and uh, a whole lot of uh, command issues with both McKenzie and Talion on the hill. So Yankees, Indians, we like the over the eight on uh, that one right there. Uh, next up, we'll head into the soccer world. We'll start out in the Premier League. Uh, really want to watch that Leeds Man United game, but couldn't find a good way to bet it. So uh, we're going to skip the Leeds Man United game and just watch it for the uh, sure enjoyment, one, of just watching Leeds and uh, see if that game uh, can open up and uh, we get a really, really entertaining game uh, coming up. It'll be interesting to see how uh, Man United deals with uh, Man City coming up and then uh, uh, also their Europa League matchup. So uh, be interesting to see what team they choose as well in that matchup. But uh, we're going to go with the other game in the EPL. Uh, we're going to ride Aston Villa at the plus 105 here. Uh, just did not like the way West Brom looked on Thursday. They're playing another short uh, uh, schedule. They played uh, Saturday, Thursday, and Sunday. And uh, this team looked worn out. They got beat up really good by Leicester. Uh, Villa needs a win here. Uh, Tough uh, loss during the week. Uh, I think they'll bounce back here. Uh, still no Grealish for them, but they, they look to be uh, sort of finding uh, their legs uh, without Grealish. Uh, so uh, let's see if Villa can get a win. Really like this price at uh, plus 105. So going to ride Aston Villa on the three-way here at uh, plus 105. And then uh, speaking of... Uh, Premier League teams we're going to ride in the Carabao Cup. Uh, the final here, uh, Man City versus Tottenham. Uh, I really wanted to take Tottenham here, but uh, I just don't know if they 
uh, can really win this game. So we're going to do two things in this game. We're going to have Man City and Tottenham both to score. Uh, minus 110, really like that value. Uh, Tottenham has found ways uh, to score on Man City and uh, beat them in the last couple of years with uh, this very same team. Uh, so uh, I, I think this will be a little bit of a, a shootout game, even with the uh, sort of new style that Man City's played. Uh, there have been some cracks in that defense lately, so let's see if uh, Tottenham can break through, open this game up, uh, uh, especially in a sort of a, a cup final like this. Uh, let's see if we can get that uh, both teams to score Man City uh, versus Tottenham here. And then we're going to have uh, Hung Min Sun uh, to score a goal at plus 250. He should have gotten two goals uh, over the uh, uh, games over the week, but uh, uh, Mora was just off sides in a really, really tough call. And uh, then he got the penalty, uh, which uh, was really, really nice. But uh, I, I look for uh, Hung Min Sun to score here. He's really, really uh, scored well versus Man City. So I look for that to continue, and I really like the value at plus 250 for Hung Min Sun to uh, score a goal here. So let's see if Sonny can get one uh, against Man City here, uh, get behind that back line. So uh, Sonny to score at plus 250, Man City, Tottenham both to score at uh, minus 110. Uh, we got one Serie A game to take today. Uh, uh, Calgary uh, really in a fight to uh, sort of stay out of the uh, regulation zone. Uh, Benvenido uh, lost again today, so this game doesn't totally become uh, mandatory. Uh, and uh, I just like Roma at plus 140. Roma's made their uh, whole, whole uh, season on uh, really beating up these uh, lower tier teams. Uh, they did look awful versus at Atlanta uh, during the week. Uh, the, at Atlanta probably should have scored four or five goals before they got that red card. Uh, they couldn't find a way, missed their opportunity, and then as it always does, uh, Roma found the goal late and uh, tied that thing up. So to get a point out of that is really, really something. But I look for the trend with uh, Roma to continue here uh, where they beat up on the lower tier of Syria, definitely so. So uh, Roma plus 140 on the three-way, I think is really, really good value. Next up, we're going to go to La Liga and uh, to uh, big-time Spanish teams uh, matching up here. Athletic Bilbao plus the half goal at uh, minus 110 versus Atletico Madrid. Now, uh, Atletico Madrid has bounced back uh, uh, since we uh, really stopped writing them and having us cost us money, but I'm not sure it's for real. Uh, they've played two weaker uh, La Liga teams. Now they step back up in competition today uh, with Atletico uh, Bilbao, so uh, really, really uh, think Atletico Bilbao will give them a bit of a matchup. So I uh, like this uh, getting a half goal, even money here at plus 110. We're going to see if Atletico Madrid really is uh, back to uh, playing uh, in their top form or they just scored a couple victories over some uh, really, really uh, low-level uh, low Liga competition. So Atletico Bilbao uh, plus a half goal, minus 110. And then we're going to go to Liga. There's some uh, really, really good matchups uh, in Liga uh, today. But uh, this one uh, I'm going to uh, make a pick on really it is not one of them uh Laurent uh versus Bordeaux uh really troubling news out of Bordeaux and we're gonna try to take a little bit of an advantage of it uh, uh these two teams sit just above the regulation zone uh right next to each other they're both been playing really really poor soccer of late but uh with uh, Bordeaux going into administration, I, I just think this might be one uh, Laurent uh, could steal here at the plus 115. Now, uh, I, I would be scared of a, a draw here, especially on the three-way, uh, but uh, I I'm just going to ride it. And uh, if it's a, a really bad, uh, like, nil-nil draw, uh, I, I think... You just sort of take it, but uh, I, I like Laurent uh, getting plus 115 versus uh, Boudreaux here today. And then the big matchup in Liga, Lyon versus uh, Lille. Uh, this should be a great matchup. I, I think Lyon's coming on here, and uh, they might have a little bit of say on who's going to win this uh, Liga title. Uh, PSG uh, jumped up to take that top spot after not being there and Lille being on top for a while. Uh, Lyon... 
uh, and uh, Monaco have been uh, sort of really pushing in there. It'll be really, really interesting to see who comes out on this race. But I just love the way Lyon's been playing. So uh, we're going to take Lyon plus a 110 uh, on the three-way versus Lille here uh, and, and see if Lyon can make that push to see if they can get on top of uh, that Liga title. All right, out of the soccer and onto the hardwood, into the NBA. We're going to take two games today. Uh, we're going to start with the Indiana Pacers, minus five and a half versus the Orlando Magic. Really like the uh, Indiana Pacers here. I think this will be really good value. Uh, Steve Clifford just got COVID. Who knows uh, what's going on with that Magic team? They get killed every night anyway. They're clearly in uh, complete shutdown and tank mode. Uh, and even with this Pacers team, which has really, really been uh, disappointing uh, almost for the last uh, two-thirds of the season, but really this last half of the season, I think they should cover this pretty easy and cover the uh, minus five and a half. All right, on to the uh, Milwaukee Bucks at minus six and a half for the Atlanta Hawks. Now, I usually don't like taking teams playing on back-to-back as favorites, but the Atlanta Hawks have injuries. Uh, the Bucks cruised to uh, a pretty easy victory yesterday. Uh, Giannis only played about 24 minutes, so they should be uh, able to go in here and uh, really, really put it on the uh, Atlanta Hawks uh, as well as they did on the Philadelphia 76ers uh, last night, albeit without Ben Simmons and Joel L. Embiid. But... Uh, this is where I, I think Milwaukee maybe starts to make a little bit of a push and blow a handful of these uh, teams out as they start to get into playoff mode. So uh, Milwaukee Bucks minus six and a half uh, versus the uh, Atlanta Hawks. All right, let's go to the two finals in the tennis uh, on the men's side of things. We're going in Belgrade. We're going to keep riding our Aslan Krostev uh, minus 120 versus Matteo Ber. Berrettini. Uh, we took him in round one, and then he ended up uh, riding his whole way in there. We probably should have t taken him more and more. We had been riding Aslan a whole lot. Uh, he's really, really played well. Uh, d ended up defeating uh, Novak Dok Djokovic yesterday. Uh, we didn't even need the spread, which we took, but uh, we're going to ride Aslan and uh, take him uh, to beat up on uh, Matteo today and the minus 120. And then in Barcelona, we got a big time matchup with uh, Stefanos Tipsas uh, versus uh, Rafael Nadal. And uh, really like Tipsas uh, getting the plus three and a half, minus 125 here. Uh, I know Nadal has blown past everybody, but he really has not played anybody even close to the level of, of Tipsas here. So I look for this to be a pretty big uh, close, tough, tight match here. So I, I really do like the three and a half uh, for Stefanos uh, tips us. All right, let's get into the big race at uh, Talladega tonight. We're going to get into our top tens and then our top fives and then our winner bets. Let's start out with our guys we like uh, in the top ten. We're going to start out uh, with Austin Dillon here. Uh, Austin Dillon had, has had a uh, some success here at the Talladega racetrack. Really, really like him uh, overall uh, here at Talladega. I, I think he's poised to finish in here. He had a, in 2019, a, a number six finish. He had a number 12 finish uh, going back to last year in the uh, fall. So I think this is really, really poised. And uh, he's had... Uh, Four races on the year. He's had uh, three top tens, one top five. So I, I think he's really, really poised to make a move here and uh, finish in that top ten. I really do like... Uh Overall, his value in the top 10 at minus 115. So uh, let's take Austin Dillon top 10 at uh, minus 115. And the other one, I, I another top 10 I really, really like, and I almost wanted to put him in my top five, is uh, Tyler Reddick, who's also had three top 10 finishes this year, one top five uh, in his nine races. But I really, really uh, like the way he looked at uh, Talladega in October. Uh he had uh, started at the 30th spot, ended up finishing 7th in that race. So uh, he's run the uh, Talladega track twice, two top 20 finishes, one top 10 finish. So uh, there might be a little bit of sleeper status with Tyler Reddick. I couldn't quite pull the trigger on him to go uh, top 5 or uh, 
maybe the really, really long shot in to win it. Uh, but I do think there's really good value in uh, Tyler Reddick today in the top 10, uh, getting decent value at minus 175. And uh, my last uh, uh, top 10 choice, Ricky Stenhouse uh, Jr. Uh, at minus 250. Uh, Ricky has a long history, a long good history at that track. Uh, the only hesitancy here is he's really, really had a, a pretty poor season. Only one top fin 10 finish in his nine races this year. Uh, but his average finish has not been uh, too, too bad uh, this year. But uh, overall, uh, at uh, at uh, at this price, it's a little bit tough to go. Average uh, finish this year is at 13.11. So he's just outside that top 10 and on, on a track that he's really, really comfortable on. Uh, he won this race in 2017. Uh, he has numerous top 10 finishes. Basically, when he doesn't have a wreck, he finishes in the top 10. Um, in June 2022, he finished second in this race. Uh, then he finished a ninth in 2019. He had an accident, and then uh, he ran two clean races, had a third and a fifth. And we talked about the one in May 7th uh, that he won, and he had a fifth before that. So basically, if he's able to run clean, he's probably going to finish in the top 10 here. So I, I really, really like uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. for the top 10. I, I just haven't liked the way he's raced so far this year. And uh, so we're only making him a top 10 bet. All right, let's get into our guys. We're taking William Bryan to finish in the top 10 and the top five here. The top 10 is minus 200 for William Bryan and uh, uh, plus 250 to finish in the top five. We found really good money on William Bryan uh, last week. I look for that conti to continue uh, this week. Uh, I, I know his average finish has not been all that great this year, but he's been getting better and better. He has seven top 10 finishes this year, uh, two top fives and one win. So uh, other than the race that he uh, bounced out, which is what uh, is really hurting that uh, average finish uh, stat here this year, he has been really, really solid. He looked really, really good last week. And uh, if you look at him at Talladega, uh, other than that accident race, he's gotten better and better each race. Uh, he started in 2018. He finished a 29th, then a 20th, a 21st. Then we talked about that accident where he finished 33rd. And then uh, last year in 2020, he ran an 11th and then he made a, a fourth in the uh, fall race at Talladega. So uh, he, he's just been improving uh, week to week this season and uh, year to year uh, at Talladega. So I really, really do like uh, William Bryan here. I, I think that's really good value to get him on the top 10. And I really do like that uh, top five at plus 250. I think there's great, great value there. Uh, we're going to go with Denny Hamlin. Uh, easy money on the top 10, uh, though you won't make much at the minus 600. And it's pretty easy money at the top five at uh, minus 120. Uh, if you need me to uh, give you stats on Denny Hamlin, uh, you haven't been watching racing uh, too much this year. He's pretty much finished in the top five in every race other than the uh, one race where he uh, wrecked out. So uh, I, I think uh, Denny Hamlin does not need to be going into. But uh, we'll go from those into our winners. And uh, we got three guys we liked uh, on the winner uh side of things. We're going to go with Eric Amarola, who's had a terrible year, but uh, we think this racetrack really will suit him really, really well. And I think there's a really good value in Eric Amarola here today. Uh, we're going to look at him in the top 10 at minus 250. Good value there. And then uh, top five, getting two to one to finish in the top five at plus 200. And then winner value at plus 1600. So I really, really do like uh, Eric Amarola. Now, uh, the things against Eric, he's only had one top finish top 10 finish this year. So he's really, really struggled. But this is a track he really, really likes. Uh, you can watch him when he doesn't uh, wreck. Uh, once again, he finished third in June of 2022, fourth in uh, 2019 in the fall, ninth in uh, 2019 in the spring. He won this race in October uh, in uh, 2018, uh, a seventh, a fifth, a fourth, an eighth, and then he had an accident. Basically, if he's running uh, since about 2016 in this race and he finishes it clean, he's 
clearly going to finish in the top 10. And there is a very, very solid bet that he finishes in the top five. And, uh, and, and uh, you got to win in there. So he knows this track. He's been able to win on this track. So uh, despite his really, really poor season so far, maybe this is the one where uh, he finally uh, breaks out. All right. The next one we're going with on the winner side of things is uh, Ryan Blaney. Uh, top 10 at minus 400. I, I think that's pretty easy money. So you win a couple dollars to cover some of these uh, winner and top five bets to see if you can get them. At top five, uh, this is what I really, really like. Top five, you're getting plus 130 with Ryan Blaney here. And a uh, winner, you're getting 10 to one. And uh, Ryan Blaney, been on a really good uh, run this season. Uh, top four, he's had uh, top 10, he's had four top 10 finishes this year, two top fives and one win on the season. And this is a pretty good track for him. Uh, he's won back-to-back -back races on uh, this track here in October and June. Now, he did have an accident in the uh, fall race of last year. But uh, if you go back to all this, uh, the spring start, he won this uh, race from a 12 start. And then he won it in the also in the fall uh, from the year before at uh, a number nine spot. Uh, he has a fourth place finish here in ninth and 11th. So uh, he can really, really run well on this track. There are a couple bad results in here. But uh, I, I think you're getting really good value uh, for him, especially in the top five there. So I really, really uh, I like Ryan Blaney here. And then... Uh, we got one really uh, big long shot that we're going to ride uh, at uh, Talladega today, and that's Ryan Priest. Now, uh, top 10 value at minus 115, really, really do like that, and the top five at plus 450. Uh, now, you don't necessarily have to take winner here uh, because I don't know if he can win this track, but uh, if you've watched him race recently, he, he's been really, really solid. His uh, racer rating is not quite what you want it to be, but uh, his finishes are where you want it to be and uh so i i put a little on the winner value here at uh plus uh 35 to 1 maybe that long shot gets in there maybe there's a big wreck he finds his way through and uh then we're racing with a, a lower set of uh racers on there and uh ryan priest comes out on top but uh ryan priest i really really do uh like here uh at this race track. Now he's had two top 10 finishes this year, uh, but this is where I like him here on this uh, racetrack. Uh, in his first start at Talladega, uh, he went from the 30 spot and finished at number three in uh, April of 2019. Then he has an 18, a 15th, and uh, then in the fall of last year, he started from the 25 spot and finished 10th. So he's shown that he can run this track and run it well. So for a long shot like this, uh, I really, really do like like him. He's had two top fit 10 finishes at Talladega in his four races here, and all four finishes have been in the top 20. So he'll be there in contention, and I think he can make a move here. So uh, I really, really do uh, like the long shot Ryan Priest if you're looking for a uh, long shot value here on the day. A couple head to heads we got, uh, we mentioned. Uh, about William Bryan and how much we like him. He's getting plus money uh, versus Kurt Busch here. I, I have not liked the way Kurt Busch has run all season long. Now, this is a much uh, better suited track for Kurt Busch, but I think it's just as well suited for William Bryan. And him getting plus 110, I, I think, really, really is uh, good value here. So I'm taking the head-to-head -head of William Bryan at plus 110 over Kurt Busch. Next up, we're taking William Bryan at plus 190 versus Joey Logano. I did not love uh, Joey Logano's uh, stats here. I haven't loved the way he's raced here, so I think the uh, almost two to one in the head-to-head -head matchup here, really good value for uh, William Bryan. Now, the head-to-head uh, -head that I probably like the best here is uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. at uh, almost even money at minus 115 versus Bubba Wallace. If you look at Bubba Wallace, he's really struggled at uh, Talladega. I know he likes that Daytona track, but he has not been as good on uh, the Talladega track. So uh, I think this is just really, really easy money, especially getting uh, uh, even odds uh, here. I, I don't know how long that'll last. I'm guessing money will pour in on Ricky as the uh, day gets uh, longer and longer. But uh, Ricky Stenhouse at minus 115 over Bubba Wallace here uh, on the head-to-head, -head, I really like. And the last one I like, it's a little bit uh, more inflated on the things, but uh, Eric Amarola at minus 175 versus Charlie Bell. Uh, I'm taking 
take an Eric Amarola on that pretty easy on the day. And uh, overall, we're going to go with, uh, uh, I don't know if it's, it's going to win, but uh, I, I think the value is too good to pass up here, uh, especially with a couple of the uh, drivers you get. So we're going to take Team Penske winning car plus 375 on the day. So a uh, whole lot of NASCAR bets at Talladega on the day. Uh, full slate on the Sunday. So uh, be sure to follow us on greenlightnetwork.org, Greenlight Network on Facebook and YouTube. Like and subscribe to our show and you will not miss any of our contact. Be sure to uh, watch our Oscars uh, show. We give our picks for the Oscar there and our best bet with Reader Sima and Dr. M. Sage. You can find me, Champ Chesterfield, on GLN Champ 5 on Twitter and Instagram. That's our show. May the odds be ever in your favor. And we're out. Green Light Network presents Football Time. Hey, 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 and welcome to the Football Time Podcast. We're here with our man Dynamite David to continue our NFL draft special. We had our man Achilles Rain in the other day to do the NFC needs team needs now we have our man dynamite david to go over the college side of things and do a breakdown on the college player rankings dynamite are you ready to get into some college player rankings yeah we're a little less than a week out and i'm excited uh, to see how it plays out yeah all right so we'll start out at the top we'll go with the qbs uh i i don't think number one probably is uh too much of a, a leap here, but uh, let's start out with your uh, number one QB here. Yeah, the quarterbacks. Everybody's high on the quarterbacks this year. Uh, I, I, I think it's an okay quarterback class. I'm not quite as big on it as most of the mainstream media is, but you can't question uh, number one, Trevor Lawrence. Uh, he's, he's probably the most highly touted quarterback coming out of college for at least probably since, what, Andrew Luck? Uh, and I think he even rates higher than Andrew Luck as far as uh, pro arm and, and ready to go. Uh, don't see too many weaknesses in his game, and uh, we'll see what he can do in the Jag with the Jags and Urban Meyer. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he's probably the best one I've seen since uh, Andrew Luck came into here. Um, 
we'll go past number one because I, I don't think there's really too much to say about number one. We've all seen him play. I, I think next is where it gets a little bit jumbled here. Uh, there really are three guys who people, you know, have been uh, spinning around in Trey Lance, uh, Justin Fields, and Zach Wilson. Uh, I, I'm curious how you have those three guys uh, ranked out here. Well, I'm I'm a little uh, kind of I'm I'm a little different here. I actually am a big fan of Trey Lance. Uh, I think he's the number two guy. You know, you look at going into before last season, and you know everyone was talking about Trevor Lawrence and Trey Lance. Not many people were talking about Justin Fields. You know, he he left Georgia. Not many people were talking about Zach Wilson that much. Uh, he actually had a pretty terrible year uh, the year before, uh, missed some games due to injury, and I'm just. Uh, I don't know. I think Zach Wilson got a lot of fluff this year, played a pretty manageable schedule, and in the big games, he he didn't really show up. So for that, I'm going to give Trey Lance a little bit of credit, and I, I think I think he's the number two ranked in, in my list, followed by Justin Fields, and then at fourth spot, Zach Wilson. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm surprised Trey has dropped as much as he had, considering – you know, I, I think we'll get into this when we get into the tackles, too. Guys who really didn't get to uh, play this year somehow seem to drop out uh, uh, of their ranking because uh, coming into this, I, I think Trey Lance was pretty much the new number two guy uh, across the board. Everybody, you know, was raving about him at uh, North Dakota State the year before, uh, all his tools. And then, you know, he didn't really get to play a season this year. Uh, they threw him into that one, you know, random game out of nowhere uh, which I'm like okay we watched him all last season we're gonna judge him out of a random game when he hasn't been playing or practicing for you know months and weeks so I, I really do have Trey Lance as my number two uh guy too um I'm a bit torn between uh Justin Fields and Zach Wilson here uh I I see a lot of talent in Fields but uh I just think that there's too much of a, this guy could be an absolute bust to, uh, you know, be a great quarterback and you're taking too much of a leap there. And then Zach, I, I just don't know what to make of, you know, he, he was really, really good, even, you know, with the competition this year. But then you look at him uh, the year before, I think we got a pretty close view of him in that Tennessee game uh, two years ago where we were, I, I think everybody was like, this is the worst quarterback play we've ever seen between our, our team and their team. Now he did make the one throw to end up winning the game, but uh uh, this leap he's made and now all this fluff he's getting for his, you know, crazy arm. I, I'm just surprised that he's going to, you know, now go number two. But uh, I, I just uh, really don't uh, know where that jump came from. But I, I think I would have Zach Wilson ahead of Justin Fields just because I, I think they're at least I, I've seen more from Zach this year than I saw for Justin this year. I think the way I look at it, I think Zach Wilson's probably got a, a higher ceiling, but he's also got a lower floor. I think Justin Fields, you kind of kind of know what you're getting, but it might not be what you need. You know, uh, he he could roll in there and just be an average, mediocre bust two, three years down the road. Zach Wilson, he could be a bust right away, or he he could be a shining star. He's he's a little bit more of a risk, I think. Yeah, it doesn't help that he's going to end up on the Jets. So. <laughs> you know, I'd actually really like to see Trey Lance with that Jets team. I think I think I, I like Trey Lance's arm, and and I think his uh he's big. He's he's probably hopefully going to be able to avoid injury, but. I think the Jets are locked in on Zach Wilson. Yeah, so do I. All right, uh, we'll get to probably the uh, biggest uh, leap uh, jumper of the whole group and uh, Mac Jones, who now is supposed to go three. Um, you know, I, I, we touched on him a handful of times during the season is where do we put his uh, overall like NFL value? Because it, it really was hard to judge because, I mean, Really going into the season beforehand, uh, we were trying to make the other Tua take over his job, and then we were trying to make Young take over his job, and now all of a sudden he's going to be the number three pick in the draft. So I'm curious how you have Mac Jones ranked. Yeah, I actually – I've got him down at six. I've got Kyle Trask jumping Mac Jones in my rankings. I've, I, I like – I think Trask has been in uh, – I think a lot more pressure has been put on him. He led the league, uh, led the nation in touchdown passes last year, 
And, you know, if, if you want to throw all your passes, you know, 10 yards or, or in, Mac Jones is your guy. Uh, you know, most accurate quarterback in the country, less than 10 yards. But, you know, what else has he shown that he can do other than that? Uh, you know, that, that may fit well into the 49ers, you know, run heavy, tight end use offense. But uh, I just can't believe that he goes number three, you know, that's been back and forth from everything I'm hearing that he's going to go number three to the Niners. And that just blows my mind. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, we'll get past those and into the ones that, uh, you know, are probably going to be back in. This really is not a, a deep quarterback class. I think this is as light as I've seen in, you know, these uh, second, third, fourth round uh, type quarterbacks. I, but uh, I guess you probably answered your own question there with uh, Kyle Trask. So what do you like about uh, Kyle Trask? I just think, you know, he's, he's, he's really good pocket presence. Uh, he can, he can get out of bad situations, good arm to back that up. Uh, and, I just I like the way he distributes the ball. Uh, he's he's really good at getting it around to different wide receivers. Never really locked in on one guy, except for when uh, he's throwing three to four touchdown passes to Kyle Pitts. Um, but I I just you know I I think as far as uh, making things happen on his own compared to Mac Jones, I, I like what I've seen from Kyle Trask, and I just I I don't understand the the infatuation with Mac Jones other than he was the quarterback on the best team in the country. Uh, Past that, rounding out my top ten, uh, I've got uh, Davis Mills at seven. Uh, he was a big-time guy uh, coming out of high school, but rough injuries and and didn't have a whole lot of starts. But he's he's pretty solid, and uh, he's got that NFL body. Um, and then after him, I like Jamie Newman actually over Kellen Mond. I think his uh, I think he did actually pretty solid at Wake Forest, and. I just I, – I'm not infatuated with Kellen Mond. I think that offense doesn't really translate uh, very well to what you're going to see in the NFL. And then rounding all off, I like Shane Buscelli at number 10 at SMU. Uh, beat Notre Dame at Texas, transferred to SMU. Played pretty solid there, but that, that finishes up my top 10. Yeah, uh, the only really one um... – that I like in the, uh, you know, outside the uh, elites is uh, probably Jamie Newman. It, it's sort of a shame we didn't get to see him play at Georgia this year because uh, I, I thought he really would have uh, made a leap into there. Uh, I watched him a lot at Wake Forest because I liked uh, betting those Wake Forest teams in years <laughs> past because uh, nobody thinks Wake Forest is good at football and they were sort of good at football at that point in time. So the the only one I really think I, I think might have a possible chance of one day really maybe, maybe being a starter consistently would be Jamie Newman. I, I think I have no faith in Kellen Mond. I think we watched him play for five years and he he was hot and cold in college, so why would he all of a sudden not be uh, all that great in the NFL? Uh, Davis Mills, you know, You've seen some things, but I think that's been the Stanford quarterback essentially the last 10 years. There have been games where you see it, and then you see games where he throws five picks, and you're like, well, eh. And, uh, you know, Shane Bouchelle, you know, uh, I, I think the talent's there, but uh, he couldn't even hold his job at Texas, so that makes me a well, little nervous. It's like we said, you know, you get past the top five or six, in this quarterback draft, there's really not much. Uh, you've got you can find a rough, rough, you know, maybe solid backup, and then you know he comes in and we'll see. But I think past those top five guys, you, there's there's no real starters here. Yeah, definitely. So, all right, so we got past the quarterbacks. Uh, we're going to move to the running backs, and uh, I am really, really surprised at how down everybody is on the running backs this year. I love this running back class. You know, uh, I, I talked to. Uh, Achilles uh, the other day about it I was like you know would I take a running back in the top 10 no probably not but it, once I get to around 15 uh, especially in this draft I'd really start to look at uh, you know some of these guys and I'm just shocked that they're so far down the I mean some places don't even have these guys going in the first round and I'm like uh, you know, once you get there and your team is pretty much fill, filled with this deep uh, running back class, I mean, there are a couple guys who you have don't have in your top 10 who I think could even, you know, be able to at least be third, solid third down backs in the league. So uh, I'm curious, you got uh, 
definitely the two guys, Najee Harris and Travis ATN in here. So uh, what do you like about those two? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Najee Harris. I think he's, he's going to be special. He's been consistent. Um, he's, he's stayed healthy. And I just – I think he could be a game-changing, uh, you know, three-down back coming in, ready to go on any team. And I just – I think he should be the first one off the board. I was kind of shocked when I went to pff.com and saw that they have Javante Williams number one over him and NTN. I, I'm not sure on that. I've got uh, I've got Javante Williams down at number three past those two because I, I think Harris is a game-changer. And I think if you find – uh, a team that's got a solid offensive line with a little bit of weapons, he could fit in really, really well. Yeah, definitely. I, I think I'd lean a little more Travis Etienne over Najee Harris, uh, but, you know, that's really a hard call. That's just mostly because we've seen a lot more of Travis Etienne than, uh, you know, Najee Harris. We've really only seen Najee Harris play for one real full season where he's not, you know, uh, you know, splitting carries with a bunch of guys. What, what I like about Etienne is – He's actually shown that he's been this past year a pretty good pass catcher, and and we know an NFL offense's issue that's that's a big, big thing to have out of your running backs, and I think that would fit into a lot of weapons. He he led the league in catches by running backs this year. Yeah, uh, you got the uh, the uh, North Carolina guys, Williams and Carter. Uh, I don't know how much you saw of North Carolina. These guys play. Uh, you got them. Three, four, Williams at three, uh, Carter at four. I'm curious uh, how you grade these guys out and what you think they'll be able to do on the NFL level. Yeah, I, I, you know, Williams is good. I don't think he's the best in the in the class for sure, uh, but he breaks a lot of tackles, and uh, which is pretty pretty astounding. And he's he's still pretty young. I think he's he's not even he's 20 now, but I, I like his broken tackles. But looking at Michael Carter. Uh, not as many opportunities as Williams, but, you know, big play, big play capability. And I like his, his average yards per carry there. Yeah. Uh, I, I probably have uh, the Ohio State guy, uh, Trey Sermon, uh, probably at number three on my guy. Uh, just because, you know, Javante I like, but I don't know how he's going to translate into the NFL. He might translate great, but uh, I, I'm a little worried that his style of running back play it really will have to be team specific and, uh, you know, a style of uh, team that will gradually run the ball and pound the ball, uh, you know, uh, Titans like where they're willing to, you know, pound the guy away and uh, let him wear down teams. And, you, you know, the way the NFL runs these days, half the teams won't even do that. I am very curious about uh, Michael Carter because he is that explosive guy who can catch passes out of the backfield. Now, you know, uh, he could be a, like a Giovanni Bernard, who's, you know, another North Carolina alum, who's managed to stay in the league for uh, a very long time now. He's been solid. Yeah, but uh, it, it's just hard to say with those, you know, sort of explosive backs, you never know. But, well, you know, what the big thing is, like, this is such a good running back class, and, and it's, it's unfortunate for running backs as far as uh, getting paid, because you can – if you have a need for running back here, you could get one probably second, third round that I still think is is really solid potential here. Uh, you know, not to knock the top dogs here, but I just – so many people are, you know, focused in on, on the rare commodities like the good quarterbacks and such this season that you could get a good steal of running back in the mid-rounds. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, my guy at three was uh, Trey Sermon. So uh, what do you like? What do you dislike about Trey here? I, I think he's solid. I, I didn't see anything that really separates him from the pack. Uh, that's why I've got him at number five. I've just kind of – he's he's solid, but uh, not huge on yards per carry, not not any you – know, he had a few big explosive plays, uh, some good games. But I just – I don't see him coming in and, and carrying an offense like some of these top guys could. Uh, Najee Harris, I think, could come in and average a 20 and 100 a game right yeah. off the bat if he gets in an offense that's going to do that. And ATN, I could see coming in and putting up like Alvin Kamara numbers just being all over the field. Uh, Trey Sermon, I think he come in, you know, maybe come into a system where it's a two running back system and he, you know, could be in there two downs and then hit the bench or spell a guy or I just don't see him coming in and being the guy right away. 
Yeah, I, I might be overrating a little bit because he was really good those last uh, couple games, especially the Clemson game in the playoffs. But uh, I don't know. I just sort of liked his running style. I, I think he could be a really solid running back for somebody in the NFL. Um, let's touch on some of the guys on the back end of it. Um, uh, who are some of the guys you uh, like in there who you think will uh, – Maybe the uh, sleepers or good late round running backs, you think? Well, I'll just go ahead and round out my uh, top 10 here, uh, six through 10. I've actually liked Khalil Herbert at Virginia Tech, at number six. Uh, I think he came, came out of a bad situation in Kansas and, and looked pretty good at a, a solid Virginia Tech team with a high yards per carry average. Uh, followed by uh, Kenneth Gainwell. I actually really like his uh, receiving capabilities out of the backfield. He could come in as a good third down back somewhere in the NFL wherever he fits in, uh, followed by Elijah Mitchell out of Louisiana Lafayette at number eight. Um, he's, like I said, he's, he kind of falls in that Trey Sermon area for me. Nothing too explosive, but he could be, if he could stay healthy, he could be a, a two-down guy that could come in, get you going, uh, but nothing too impressive out of him. Uh, finally followed off by Chris Evans and at, uh, from Michigan and number 10, I like Puka Williams out of Kansas. Uh, he may could come in and, and weird down situations. He's, he's kind of got an interesting, uh, uh, weapons that he could come in, but he's not going to be your every down guy, but he, he could come in and make some plays. So that's my top 10. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to throw a couple guys at you that you didn't have in there. Uh, one, the Oklahoma state guy, uh, Chuba yeah. Hubbard, who was probably, you know, the number three back uh, uh, coming into the college season. And then I really had a, I'd say disappointing, but uh, Oklahoma state overall was disappointing. Uh, yep. What do you think uh, it was just overall his disappointing season and maybe he'll find his legs here in the NFL or maybe he just uh, had a good season and it's going to be we'll never hear from him again? I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, the, the really great ones find a way to shine in bad situations and he really struggled to shine this past year. And uh, I don't know where he's going to fall in the draft. I, I'd see he's probably uh, – fourth round or later would be my guess yeah uh just compared to some of these other guys i don't i don't think he's going to be the one so he may go into a situation and, and get down on the depth chart but as we know running backs go down pretty quickly and he may get a shot uh so we'll see i think he's just uh the result of a, a, a poor season this year that's kind of hurt his stock yeah and the last one i'm gonna go with one of your guys out of the mac uh jared patterson out of buffalo who uh if you look at rushing totals yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably should be the greatest running back of all time but um so what do you make of jared patterson do you think he can find a a, a niche here in the nfl i uh, honestly i I'm, i really couldn't tell you i i don't know how that difficulty uh, his his defenses he was going against would translate to NFL uh, size and speed. I I don't know if he could – he was really good at just running it right up the gut, and I don't know if he's going to be able to do that against these NFL lines. Um, but, you know, it, it, it could translate to the NFL. He, he'll get a shot. But, again, I think he's going to be someone uh, that someone just takes a chance on late in the draft. Yeah, I'm, I'm rooting for him to be good. I'll be the first one to get a Jarrett Patterson jersey if he can find a way to make it in here. Uh, I, I, I think he'll definitely get – somebody will take a chance on him late, late. But uh, I, I I just – I don't know uh, how late it'll go. It could be yeah. sixth, seventh round. You touched on it. Uh, you know, his style of running back, he's a real pounder. He doesn't yeah. have a ton of – you know, out and out speed. And um, I, I think if we know anything, those defenses in the, the Mac were <laughs> a, a little yeah. porous at times. So uh, it's really hard to get a judge. But uh, I think anyone who goes for like 10 touchdowns in a college game, no matter what it is, is uh, at least worthy of uh, some mention. But uh, we'll go to uh, the wide receivers here. Pretty deep. Uh, yep class here but uh i think uh the way football is go gone uh wide receiver is always going to be a deep class until we have a little bit of a offensive shift again but uh i i think people are definitely uh have different thoughts on who the best wide receivers are so uh 
What are your top uh, three wide receivers? Let's go there. So top three, I'm going to start with Jamar Chase. I, I don't see any reason why he should drop off as the number one wide receiver. Uh, he was incredible uh, before last season, and he's spent a whole year doing nothing but conditioning his body and training for the NFL, uh, not taking any hits. I think this guy is going to be ready to go, and I think he's going to be the first one off the board. Um, but he may fall out of the top five. Uh, I'm, I think he's going to go to the Dolphins at six, uh, but we'll see. Uh, yeah. After that, uh, this is one where a lot of people have these two guys switched, but I'm, I'm really big on Jalen Waddell here as number two. Uh, I like Devontae Smith. He had a great year, Heisman, Heisman candidate, but I think before he got hurt, you know, Jalen Waddell was the guy at Alabama, um, really good at the deep ball. And I just don't know if Devontae Smith's size is going to hold up uh, as a number one guy in the NFL. So I, I'm going to take Waddle. And then uh, I think Smith is the number three guy behind him. Yeah. Uh, I really like Devontae Smith, but uh, I, I like him because I, I think I know he'll be a good NFL. He might not end up being a one, but I don't think he's – like a complete bust and you end up, uh, you know, like a Lacon Treadwell, you know, type thing where you're cutting him three years into it and you've never even seen him. Now, I don't think Chase will be that uh, bad a bust, but uh, I just, Devontae Smith is going to be a good receiver. Now he might end up being, you know, a number three receiver, but he will be somebody who can maintain his roster spot for, you know, years to come. So I really like Devontae Smith. Then I probably go Chase and then Waddle. The only thing I worry a little bit about Waddle was that was a pretty bad uh, ankle break, and uh, he's really based on speed. So I, I mean, you probably shouldn't, uh, you know, overrate it. Uh, somebody just on an ankle break that young, they're probably able to recover, but somebody based so much on speed, it makes me a little nervous. But uh, so you have Chase Waddle and, uh, Devonte Smith. Uh, then it's a it's a bit of a mixed bag there uh, between about uh, four through ten. Uh, uh, people like many different things. Uh, who do you have uh, as your number four guy? I like Elijah Moore out of Ole Miss. I don't know if it's just my my love of AJ Brown and and the physicality of these Ole Miss wide receivers that have come out of late. But I I think if you if you want a guy you know first and goal, second and goal, and you need a guy to go up and get one in the end zone. I think Elijah Moore is going to be your guy. And uh, honestly, I think he fits a need for my Titans. I'm hoping maybe he could fall to them. Uh, I think he's going to go around their pick. So we'll see. Uh, but I've actually, I like him over Rashad Bateman out of Minnesota. I've got Bateman at number five, um, but we'll see. Uh, he struggled a little bit this last year and, uh, but he's, was good the year before. I just – I like the physicality of Elijah Moore there. Yeah. Uh, I, I see both of us are a little down on uh, – here on Kadarius Tony. I am not a huge fan. This one has uh, a little bit of bust written all over he's, it, but uh, a lot of he's people – He's what I'm hoping my Titans don't go get. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a lot of people have him right under Waddle, and he's starting to push up the draft board. I, I'm just curious what you don't like about uh, – because I just – it's been too inconsistent for me, and it's been a lot of – he hits a deep play, and then it's nothing, uh, basically, for the rest of the game. Yeah, he's – I think he's more of, of just a, a, a physical talent. He's – I think he's really raw route running, and, and I don't know as much about you know, size if he's going to battle and post up and get some catches. Uh, but he, he could – you know, if you draw up the right play for him, but I don't know if he's going to consistently go in and get you uh, – you know, six to ten catches a game. He could be a, a one to three catch kind of guy. And I just don't think he's going to be uh, the consistent thing that people are looking for. He could be a big play opportunity guy. Uh, but just as far as developed wide receiver, there's there's a few other guys out there that I, I like in this class better than uh, Tony. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I equate him to like a, a less explosive, uh, smaller version of like Cordell Patterson. So uh, you, yeah, you feel how that uh, wide receiving career has gone. It, it, it's going to be hard to find him a place to fit in. And I just, I, I hope, 
like I said, I hope my team doesn't take a chance on him because I think he's going to be rough coming out. And he, he may start to shine two, three years from now, but I, I don't think he's going to fit right in immediately. Uh, yeah. Whereas I think guys like Elijah Moore and, uh, and Terrace Marshall at LSU are both ready to go. And, you know, LSU has been producing great wide receivers. You know, they've got Jamar Chase, but I think Terrace Marshall is uh, going to be really good. He's, he's, filled in for Justin Jefferson this last year pretty solid and I've got him at my number six position before Tony at number seven yeah the <laughs> only other guy I really wanted to touch on was uh Rondell Moore who's I know uh, you did he's yeah, your guy <laughs> he's my guy now he's had two like really sort of injury plagued seasons um you know that be begins to become really scary for a guy of you know his size yeah. I mean, his explosiveness is something ridiculous. Uh, you you could be drafting him and you could get Tyreek Hill, or you could be drafting him and you could get Peter Warwick here. <laughs> so I'm just curious, uh, where do you think someone should take their uh, probably chance on somebody like Rondell Moore? Uh, I think he's probably a mid to late second round pick. Uh, just with his injury history and his size, I think uh, people are going to be afraid to pull the trigger on him, uh, but I think he he's he's talented. But we'll we'll see how people how he comes back from those injuries, and then just being small. I mean, he's he's definitely going to be a slot guy. You know, he could fill in for you know, say a Julian Edelman type or something like that. Uh, but you know, getting there on the inside with his injury history can, is going to scare off a lot of teams. I think. Yeah, definitely so. All right, any other receivers you had in there that you might think could be uh, come uh, solid level uh, NFL pass catchers? I'm going to throw my ball out there. I've got him at number 10, Josh Palmer. He had a heck of a, a senior bowl game, and I think he's a, he's another guy that's going to come in and just give his heart for whoever he plays for. And, and physically, he, he, he can do the job. So, uh, And he's he struggled having – not the greatest quarterback throwing to him, but he's made some great catches, and uh, I'd like to see him get a shot. Yeah. All right. So we'll move to the tight ends, and uh, really, uh, the number one overall like uh, receiver in this draft. Um, yep. <laughs> I, I'm assuming Kyle Pitts is number one. So uh, let's uh, just go over Pitts. Uh, really, how high would you uh, go with a Kyle Pitts here? I'm just curious where you'd go. If if I was a team that needed a pass catcher, I would take him before Jamar Chase. I think he's the best pass catcher in this draft. And I think for the position he plays, he is one of those uh, just – you don't see him very often. He's the unicorn of this draft. And for that reason, I think it's going to be really hard for Atlanta to pass on him at four. I think they still are going to try to shop that pick around just because – They've got a ton of offensive weapons as it is, and I don't know if that's really their biggest team need. But if they aren't able to get what they want in a trade, he's so talented, you have to take him if he's sitting there at four. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I think he's probably the second best player in this draft overall. If but you don't get Lawrence, I, I'd go after Pitts. I, this, the way this guy can play on the uh, tight end spot, you know, down the line. And Which then is, you, it's and a, then, the way the NFL's played the past 10 years, the tight end yes. is almost as important to the offense as wide receiver position. Yeah, and then you have the ability to uh, split him out at wide, too, and he can, you know, he has the type of speed to be able to burn corners. So his uh, – just and he can block a little bit, too. I mean, he's not, you know, like the greatest blocker it. ever, but, you know, he has the <laughs> capability of – you know, putting him in run sets and being able to block as well. So I, I'm really, really high on Pitts. And uh, I, I told Achilles the other day, the Niners should uh, have traded up and draft Kyle Pitts, keep Jimmy G and have Kittle and Pitts as a two tight end set I, with Devo Samuel out there. And it I just saw someone up. talking about that on Twitter yesterday, actually. I, you know, I don't hate that offense, and especially with the, that, the way uh, they play in, in San Francisco. I think that could be – Quite interesting. Now they're they're not going to do that. They're looking to get their quarterback, but I would love to see uh, uh, Pitts playing alongside that yeah. offense. Yeah, I know Pitts, Kittle, Ayuk, and uh, Debo Spaniel. I, I I I'm like, well, that's something you could draw up some interesting plays with that. that yeah, I know. Lineup there. All right, so uh, number one uh, is number one. Uh, I, this class really drops off off <laughs> Kyle Pitts. This is not a – Got a lot of good blockers this year. Yeah, 
this is not a deep, deep tight end uh, class at all. But uh, why don't you give us uh, your top uh, other guy rankings in here? All right. So after Pitts, I've got uh, Freermuth out of Penn State. I think he's a guy that could come in. Uh, could be a solid fullback. He's he's big guy. Uh, maybe a good goal line situation guy. I think we're going to see that a lot here out of these tight ends. Uh, after him, I've got Tommy Trimble out of Notre Dame. He's also a really solid blocker. Uh, got the highest run blocking grade of the tight ends uh, last year. Uh, Hunter Long, Boston College product. They produce a lot of good tight ends, and he's actually a little slimmer than some of these other guys, maybe a solid pass catcher. Uh, so he's he's one that's not a blocker. Uh, after him, I've got uh, Briley Moore Jr. out of Kansas State. Uh, Brevin Jordan, uh, I think he's a guy you've been big on out of Miami. Uh, but I just – I don't know uh, – I don't know if he's going to fit an NFL tight end spot. Uh, he He's really more of a fullback running back type, so they, they may could bring him in at fullback and run him in pass situations. Uh, after that, I've got uh, John Bates out of Boise State, Noah Gray out of Duke, Kyle Granson out of SMU, and finally Matt uh, Bushman out of BYU. Yeah, uh, the only one I really like, I, I think there's a – an ability for Brevin Jordan to be uh, an interesting, uh, you know, a Miami did use him sort of out of a fullback. I, yeah. I mean, he was basically a hybrid guy who could go all over. Now uh, you need a very special and smart team to sort of draft him and know what to do with him. You know, it, I, you know, if he could end up at a Patriots or something where, you know, they're a little bit more thinky and everybody is not just, you know, it's position. He's a pretty good dump down guy where you could you could have him in a, a situation where just the quarterback gets in trouble, drops it off to him. He breaks a tackle, can get you, you know, five or six yards. Uh, but I don't think he's really shines as a weapon of any type at the moment. No, I, I don't look at him as a weapon. I, I just I mostly look at him as sort of a unique hybrid. If somebody is smart and can think outside the box, you know, he could be a, a pretty useful player, especially since he could, you mentioned he can go out of that fullback set. He can line up at tight end. He, he even, I mean, he's not blazing fast, but he could, you know, get into that slot position and use his size to get inside a little bit. Uh, the other one I, I, I sort of like, uh, John Bates out of uh, Boise State, really big size, uh, pretty decent player uh, when I watched him at Boise State, uh, decent speed, could get uh, away from things. So I think maybe he could be a little bit useful in this uh, tight end draft. But uh, overall, this is really more of a, a blocking class. And I, I don't think anyone really breaks out of here that uh, isn't Kyle Pitts. All right, let's move on from the pass catchers to the line. Let's yep. go to the offensive line in here. And uh, I'm assuming you have Pinay Suell as your number one tackle. Now, he's had a bit of a drop in this draft. I think like Trey Lance and a couple other guys who have didn't decide to play the season for some reason have dropped down to this draft board. And uh, now we're looking at him dropping into maybe seven or eight territory. And then some I, I saw also had Rashawn Slater ahead of him. Now, uh, I, I think Slater's a solid tackle. But, uh, I mean, the year before, we were all in love with – I mean, if he had left after his, uh, you know – sophomore year he would have been one of the top tackles taken but because of yep. rules where he couldn't leave and then the COVID hit he sort of gets screwed over and now has dropped down the draft board but uh I'm curious about your offensive tackle ratings uh yeah Sewell I think the Bengals are foolish if they if they pass on him I think Joe Burrow needs that protection they've got to get that protection um I, I don't think going out and getting Jamar Chase, Burrow's buddy at four, is going to help Burrow from getting just destroyed. Uh, and I mean, he already blew his knee out one year in his first year. So he's going to need some protection. I think Sewell's that guy. I think he's a guy that's going to come in and be the guy for 10 years anchoring somebody's offensive line. And I just don't think he's a guy you pass on. Uh, 
I've actually got my interior and offensive line and my tackles uh, ranked together. So I've got all my offensive linemen together in the top ten. But I've got Slater number two. Uh, I think he's he's solid and and just really kept a lot of pressure off his quarterback. And then I've also got uh, another tackle, uh, Christian Darisaw, as my top three uh, at a Virginia Tech. And I think he's he's another good potential. Uh, big 315 pound guy and uh, I think uh, didn't allow a sack this year so I really like that um, past that I think I move uh, let me see on my notes here I think I moved to one of my interior uh, linemen here next uh, out of USC the Elijah Vera Tucker I think uh, he's not got the the size to play on the exterior, but you know, every line needs a good guy in the middle. And I think he's, he's got a great pass blocking set, uh, which most NFL uh, teams are looking for. Yeah. Uh, I, if I was at Bengals, I definitely take uh, one of those tackles. I, I, I don't care which, but I'd so solidify that offensive line as best you could. I, I mean, we talked about it that the receiver classes every year have been loaded for probably the last like, three, four, five years. So, I mean, if you need a receiver next year, I'm sure there will be plenty of receivers to go grab. Uh, and uh, to you just need to shore up that line and protect Joe Burrow if you want Joe Burrow to be a healthy, functioning quarterback in this league. And I tell you what, and you can even go later in this 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 tackle class. Uh, not too many interior offensive linemen in this class, but there's a lot of good tackles. This is a really good year, uh, but uh, Sewell's definitely uh, – stands alone on up there at the top but uh you know down two through six on these guys could all go in and be starters right away yeah but uh, the only other tackle I, I liked but uh was really on a bad team was uh walker literal out of stanford yep. uh, i think he might be a little bit better than uh what he showed in college uh i think that was a bad situation he's a really really big guy uh but uh, I, I think that uh, might be a, a, a nice guy to, uh, you were talking about that you could grab uh, a tackle a little later. But uh, Walker Little would be one of those I'd look at. All right, let's move to the defensive side of things. Let's move to the defensive line and add rushers here. Uh, interesting class. I, I don't think it's been probably as deep as it has been in the past couple years but uh i'm curious of uh where you got uh, your top guys here so i've got a big uh big tackle out of alabama as my first defensive line prospect and then i got a bunch of edge rushers after him uh but i i really like christian barmore out of alabama i think he's going to be solid um he's a big guy that can plug up in the middle of any defensive line and, and be a good run stopper. Uh, but after beyond that, I got a lot of edge rushers here, uh, with pay, uh, coming in at my number two spot. And, uh, let me see here. I'm trying to get my notes up here. Sorry. Uh, out of, out of, out of Michigan. Uh, he's fast, uh, strong. I think he's going to be a good edge rusher. And then I also like Owe out of Penn State. I think he didn't get a sack last year, uh, but he's just really physical and really fast on that edge position. Yeah. Uh, the two Miami guys, uh, the Jalen Phillips has moved up there. Uh, I, really jumped ahead of uh, Gregory Riosu, who uh, was the number one defensive end before he set out. So uh, I'm just curious what you make of those two guys uh, out of uh, edge rushers here. Well, Phillips, I dropped down quite a bit, uh, just injury concerns there. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that that worries me. And just, you know, concussions is not something that you want to mess with. And and I, don't, I worry about his, his long-term uh, NFL future uh, going forward there. And then uh, Rousseau, I've actually got him at number four. Uh, I, I think uh, he had a huge freshman season uh, a couple years ago. And struggled a little bit this last year, but I, I think he's just really fast and physical. Uh, I think he needs to get a little bit of work on his uh, – on his swim moves and his edge rush moves, but I think his physical talents are going to be uh, putting him right up there in the top five of these defensive line prospects. Yeah, I, I definitely like Rousseau. I'm really, really shocked. Uh, as much as I like uh, Jalen Phillips, uh, 
I, I really think he's a great edge rusher, but you mentioned it. Uh, he's had some really, really uh, disturbing yeah. injuries. and uh, Almost quit football altogether. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, and it's not like he's at a position where he's going to be contactless <laughs> for uh, long stretches. I mean, essentially every position he's banging into an offensive lineman. So uh, if you could maybe tell me he was guaranteed health for the next uh, eight years, I'd probably have him a little higher, but I was very shocked that he climbed up the board. I probably shouldn't be too shocked because when you get him in uh, shorts and a t-shirt and you start doing measurables, he's clearly one of the elite ones, but I, I just very scared that uh, uh, he's going to be uh, banged up a lot. Another one I like is Aziz Ojolari out of Georgia. Well, that was the next one I was actually going to bring up. I was curious what you make of Aziz. Uh, I, I, you know, I like his speed and, and, you know, he's a little on the smaller side, but he, the, we've seen the NFL's changing and, and it's not all about being the biggest guy. It's about being the just explosiveness and, and the speed. And I, I think he's going to be that guy that can, that can get out there and contain on the outside. Uh, and I, I actually think he's got really good potential here and, and may could sneak up the boards. Yeah. I, I, I'm very, very, uh, I can't make my decision on Aziz totally because uh, his overall just raw explosiveness, him getting off the ball is really, really impressive. But uh, it, I think you saw it in like the Bama game and stuff. If you get yeah. that big offensive lineman, he doesn't have a whole lot of moves other than his, you know, overall raw explosiveness and speed. But uh, I, I, I mean, you've seen it in uh, guys like Bud Dupree, who also didn't have a ton of moves, but is ridiculously fast. If he gets in a system, like the Pittsburgh Steelers, I, I think he could be really, really uh, successful overall. Are there any other uh, defensive linemen, uh, edge rushers you want to touch on you think Mike could uh, spring in here? Uh, not really a whole lot. This is actually uh, probably one of the leaner uh, defensive line classes in a while. Like uh, interior defensive line is, is really lacking this year. Uh, yeah. It's mostly edge rushers. Uh, uh, but like I said, that Christian Barmore, I think he's the one that stands out as far as interior defensive line. But other than that, I think once you get past Aziz Ojolari, it becomes a little bit of uh, just uh, future potential. Uh, you know, Basham Jr. out of Wake Forest is 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 good for a really large guy, uh, but you you want to see a little bit more explosiveness out of out of that. Uh, I don't know if he's got the speed, uh, but he's definitely got the size. Uh, past that, it's it's just a little bit of a just whoever you think fits your system a little bit better. They are all ranked pretty closely together as far as their grades, uh, but not a really deep class for defensive line. Yeah, definitely not. All right, uh, we'll move to the linebacker class, which actually I really like this year. I think there are some guys in here, but uh, linebacker, much like running back, is sort of uh, – drop down a little bit people aren't quite as in love with them now a lot of that is because you know most people sit in nickel and dime sets the whole game now and there aren't always uh, too many linebackers on the board but uh, a couple of these guys I really really like so uh, what do you got your uh, linebacker ratings at yeah number one Micah Parsons out of Penn State I think he's special uh, I think he could potentially go top 10 we'll see uh, how everything plays out but he's he's the guy that can come in and and uh, just be a leader on a defense that he goes in. He does it all. He's always finding the ball. He's involved in every play. And um, he can also rush the passer. So I just – I think he's far and away the best linebacker in this class. Yeah, definitely. Well, I – I really, really like the uh, Notre Dame guy, Jeremiah. I, uh, let's see if I can get this out. <laughs> I, Karamoa and uh, Koromoa. Koromoa. Uh, <laughs> I I really like this guy, and uh, I, I like him because he's sort of a he fits into this, this style yeah. of football where he, he can, can play a nickel spot. Yes, he can pretty much do everything. You can put him anywhere on the field, and he can adapt. Uh, where you got uh, uh, you know these other linebackers who are a little more uh, old school, typical linebackers. So I really, really like this guy. Now, the thing with that is. Uh, you still got uh, old school defensive coaches who might not quite understand how to use him. And if you just stick him 
in the middle of the field and tell him to be a linebacker, it might not work out quite as well. But I, I think teams are uh, getting a little bit smarter with that. You saw that with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And uh, you see that with like the Seattle Seahawks and uh, like Jamal Adams and stuff where you, you got these guys who can just sort of fly around and you just put them in a spot where you need them to be and they can cover. So I, I really, well, really am high on that guy. And, and speaking of coverage, I'm actually big on Zayvon Collins out of Tulsa. Uh, I think his size makes it a little interesting. He's six foot five, uh, but he's got a 93 coverage grade this past season for Tulsa and, and a really solid Tulsa defense. And I, I think he could get out there and uh, and be a little versatile too. So I think he could fit into a, this uh, modern NFL defensive style. Yeah, I was going to ask you about him. Uh, he's very, very interesting because – I'm a little concerned about his speed. Yeah, because, uh, you know, he's actually – if you go look at the uh, defensive <laughs> lineman edge rushers we were talking about, he's actually bigger than most of them. Now, uh, yeah. I, I watched him a little bit at Tulsa, and he could stay in pass coverage um, – but, I mean, that's past coverage in the college game. It would be very interesting to see how he adapts to that sort of stuff in the NFL when he's matched up against really, really, you know, uh, elite-level tight ends, elite-level, you know, slot receivers and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, his speed is not, you know, elite-level speed, but uh, – he really is a smart playmaker too. I think that's his brain really helps him a, a whole lot. So I really like uh, Xavier Collins a lot too. I, I'm very curious to see how he turns out. Are there any other linebackers you wanted to uh, touch on that you think might uh, make their way into a oh. nice NFL roster? I like Jabril Cox. Uh, you know, he, he falls in the same lines that we've been discussing really good coverage back. Um, and he's played, he's been, a big part of this LSU defense for three years now, part of that national championship team. And I think he could come in and fit in really well uh, as an outside linebacker somewhere. Yeah. Uh, one last one, uh, Dylan Moses. Uh, I, I don't know if his game's going to translate all that well uh, to the NFL. Solid tackler, decent, you know, sort of middle linebacker guy. I'm curious if you think he'll make his way in the NFL and, or do you think he'll probably be a, a short uh, lifespan? Uh, we'll see on that one. I'm, 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 he's not in my top 10. That's for sure. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I, I, I really liked him at Bama, but I, I don't think his game is going to translate, you know, all that well to the NFL uh, style of game. All right. Last set, let's move to the defensive back. This is a pretty decent class here. Uh, so uh, what do you got defensive back-wise? Uh, this is another class I was, I was kind of looking at pretty closely for just uh, specifically for my Titans' needs here. There's some good players in this defensive back class, but I'm going to start out with the corners. Uh, I like Patrick Sertain, the second at Alabama. I think, uh, I think this is the guy who Dallas needs to go get at number 10. If they don't get Sertain at 10, I, I, I think they're just – well, they'll probably do something like Dallas always does. But I think he's going to come in, be a starting corner wherever he goes, and I think he's the, the most talented corner out of here. Uh, after that, I really like Greg Newsom out of North, Northwestern. Oh, dude, uh, you're big on the Newsom. Yeah, I, I I would love to see my Titans go get Greg Newsom here at uh, around you know, the mid twenties picks. I I think he could drop around there if if they decide to not get a wide receiver to replace Corey Davis. I think those are the two guys that I really like. Uh, and after that, uh, Caleb Farley out of Virginia Tech. There's a lot of good corners here, and I think they're all going to go uh, mid to late first round. Uh, but it, it should be interesting to see what order they go in. Yeah. Uh... I, I'm really big on J.C. Horn, the South Carolina uh, guy. I, I just think he's real, real uh, explosive. So I think he's ready to play, uh, you know, elite level NFL type defense. Now I am curious uh, how if he doesn't go into a like man coverage system. He played a lot of man. I don't know what he's like in zone. So I'm curious what that would be like. But uh, I really, really like uh, J.C. Horn. I, I have him really high up my board i am what? just under uh patrick certain what do you think about asante samuel jr out of florida state oh uh, yeah. i'm i don't know i have him pretty far down when i was making my rankings um I, it just it never quite uh hit on me in Florida State. Now, that might have been because they're – it's hard to judge because Florida State's defense has been, you know, 
really so bad. Well, I say defense. Florida State has been really <laughs> so bad, uh, both offense and defensively, uh, for the last couple of years. So I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, he has good breeding. I will say that. So, uh, <laughs> I, I think I've, I've got him at the bottom. I think there's a drop off about halfway down my top 10 where you go from bottom of the first round picks, early second round to to third round i think there's a big gap there uh between the top five and the and the and the top 10 there and i've got him anchoring my top five you you i i'm not uh i i I mean like i said i there's a possible he's really good once he gets surrounded by you know better players on a better team who hadn't you know quit four games into the season for the last you know three years uh the other one I, I really liked was uh, – I've liked him for a couple of years now. Uh, Elijah Molden out of Washington. I, I really think this guy is uh, an aggressive type of, of defensive back, uh, and I think he can make plays. So uh, I, I just really, really like him. I think we already said this class is so deep. I mean, we're getting you know yep. down here with guys who I, I think could be uh, elite-level guys uh, and play – long have long careers in the nfl so i I, just a couple elijah molden i really like and uh the uh oregon safety um uh javon holland i I like as well so uh they're just guys all over this uh yeah i i really like trayvon morig out of tcu oh Uh, yeah i didn't even mention him yeah he's he's really really uh he's my he's i've got my Defensive backs broke down into corners and, and safeties. He's my number yes. one safety off the board. Uh, I don't think uh, I, I I just he's he's gonna one of those guys that's got a nose for the ball. You know, you see the end of the play, he's there. And I just there's something special about guys like that. Yeah, I I agree. The, I maybe the only thing is he's a little small, but uh, in the NFL these days, I I don't you know even factor that in all that too much because I mean everybody's thrown every time anyway. All right. Uh, any other defensive back guys you wanted to touch on in your rankings before we uh, wrap this up? Just one other, you know, safety. I like uh, Jamar Johnson out of Indiana. Uh, oh, that's I think a good he, call. Yeah, I think he's really solid. Um, and uh, his coverage is really good. I worried a little bit about downfield tackling, but I think he's another good coverage guy that's got a lot of experience and uh, and could come in and, and, and fit in well somewhere. Yeah, it, it'll be very interesting to see how these uh, all get drafted since uh, this is really, really a deep position this year in the secondary. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, I think a lot of these uh, – we're going to get past the quarterbacks and then the wide receivers. I think I think this wide receiver class is just so good. Uh, now, the NFL has shown that you can find productive wide receivers late yeah. rounds. But I think there's, you know, the top five wide receivers are going to be going early. Quarterbacks are going to be going early. Uh, but if I was if I was one of these teams down towards the end of the first round that have some needs, I'd be kind of licking my chops a little bit because there's going to be some good guys coming down to you uh, down towards the late of the first round. Yeah, definitely. All right, that's our show on our college uh, draft rankings. Dynamite David will be back with us uh, next week, we believe. <laughs> we're, on, we're on baby watch at the moment, but uh, uh, I definitely could jump, jump in for a mock at some point, hopefully. Do uh, do our mock draft during the week. That might We might have to shift those dates as uh, they come along, but we will get our mock draft in next week with Achilles Rain. Achilles Rain will join us on Sunday to finish out the AF side of things on the team needs. Where can we find you, Dynamite? Uh, follow me on Twitter at GLN Dynamite underscore D. Uh, I'm going to be uh, getting a little bit more active the closer we get to the college football season and start getting ready for my uh, preseason reviews of the conferences. You uh, need to start studying up on your Olympics as well. I need you you to know all the archers and shooting and uh, the crew. (laughs) I'll I'll look at that while I'm researching my Mac football. (laughs) All right. You can find us on greenlightnetwork.org, Greenlight Network on Facebook and YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe to all our videos. That's our show, and we're out.
Presents Football Time. Hey, hey, and welcome to the Football Time Show with Achilles Rain and Champ Chesterfield. We got our NFL draft special starting up. We're going to do team needs with Achilles Rain. Achilles, are you ready to get into some NFL draft content? Yeah, buddy, I'm excited. Uh, we're just a uh, little short ways away from uh, the actual draft itself, so. Uh, let's see what we can uh, get in with uh, regards to AFC needs. All right. So we're going to start out with the NFC. We're going to do a two-part series. Our second part on the AFC will be doing on Sunday. So this is part one. We're going to do the NFC team needs. We're going to start out East. Achilles, let's start out with the one, the only, Cowboys. Where do you see team needs for the Dallas Cowboys? And you can't just go every defensive position. Wait, <laughs> hold on. I just want to make sure. Uh, we doing AFC or NFC? The NFC. All right, I'm ready for the NFC. <laughs> I thought we're doing AFC. <laughs> All right, NFC Cowboys. Where are your team needs going here? I mean, realistically, if we have to point to anything, the fact they're getting the quarterback back this season. Uh, it's probably a huge left now. We don't know when he's going to be available. You, you have to assume that at some point he's going to be available. So I'm not too concerned about the offensive needs. I think that once they get their whole offense back together, uh, they'll be at least somewhat explosive like we saw in the beginning of last season. Uh, but defensively, even though they played a little bit better towards the end of the season, I think that's where the main focus is going to be. Uh, I know they brought in a couple of guys they thought was going to help, but uh, – just based on the way they kind of threw the money around, I think that they're best suited right now to look for some defense now. Yeah, definitely. I, I think defense, uh, I think probably the biggest need would definitely uh, be cornerback for sure. Uh, uh, they lost a lot of uh, ed edge rushers, um, so I think they probably need to shore that up a little bit. But uh, otherwise, I think they're pretty solid. Uh, you know, linebacker-wise now, they tend to get hurt a lot. But uh, if there was a, one uh, call to the defensive side of things that I thought was uh, half okay. Uh, it was uh, the linebacker position, but cornerback definitely. Uh, the other thing I sort of thought they might uh, – look into a little bit and and you sort of saw it as their offensive line which they're still a a solid uh group but it started to deteriorate it's probably started to deteriorate for two years now uh, a whole lot of injuries i definitely think the cowboys probably need to take at least a little peek at uh getting a little younger on that offensive uh, line yeah i mean at one point i remember the dallas cowboys being probably the best offensive line in football. So the fact that they've fallen, I wouldn't say this far down, but they've fallen down pretty significant. Um, I think it's definitely something that you have to look at. Uh, but overall, I think that defensively, that's going to be the like the main need. And then, you know, you kind of have to uh, be smart about the way you draft and maybe you can find, uh, you know, one of those guys that can become a consistent uh, presence on that offensive line. Yeah. Um, so uh, there have been rumors floating about that the uh, Cowboys would look to uh, take Kyle Pitts. Now, um, you know, uh, I think everybody would <laughs> look to take Kyle Pitts if he was available. So I'm not sure quite how credible that rumor is. But, you know, there are rumors floating out that they're going to try to trade up and get Kyle Pitts. Um, yes, they sort of need a tight end, um, but... I mean, I thought they got away with having solid tight ends last year without Jason Witten. I don't know if I'd necessarily put another... I mean, you called Kyle Pitts a tight end, but really he's a just a hybrid wide receiver that you can place in the tight end position. Would you, if the Cowboys skip a defensive guy and go after another offensive weapon uh, when really your whole team is built and being paid for already offensive weapons? Yeah, I mean, honestly, listen, it seems like an attractive pick. You know, he seems like he would be a pretty good fit in just about any team. And and I really wouldn't fault him, but I would definitely, it would at least leave me scratching my head um, because I think that the uh, defense, you know, defensive uh, back position, 
uh, in that secondary. And I mean, even the offensive line, if they took an offensive lineman, I still couldn't fault them at that because there's something to be said about having, you know, that consistent guy who's, you know, going to lock down the position for, you know, years to come. But for them to go with tight end, I think would be a little surprising. Maybe later on, you know, in the draft, uh, as we get into the later rounds, they could find a guy, you know, that uh, probably is not as well known, but uh, could still offer some versatility there for that offense. Yeah, definitely. I, I just, uh, I don't know if I'd sacrifice that. And I'm guessing if you have to trade up, uh, really your only piece to trade up was B to ship, uh, CD lamb, uh, out to trade up. So really, I, while I think Pitts is probably going to be overall the better player, I, I don't think the gap is that much. So essentially you give up on last year's number one pick to get a new number one pick this year. So I, I don't think that's a great strategy for the Cowboys. I, I definitely think they should look in the uh, secondary uh, offensive line type of thing. And uh, maybe if uh, a, a good, an edge rusher you trust would be the thing that uh, I, I definitely look there for the Dallas Cowboys. Now, not to throw in a shameless plug mm -hmm. or anything, but I'm actually kind of excited to hear what the, what uh, you and Dynamite are going to talk about mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the uh, prospects show, mm -hmm. uh, because I see some needs for this team, uh, but they're not too far off from contending in the East. I mean, yeah. it's the East. So uh, it's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely be uh, tuning in to listen to you guys talk about that. Well, I, I can say this now. We both think Kyle Pitts is really good. <laughs> Yeah, like the uh, rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, I think that's almost a foregone conclusion. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll move on to our next team. We got the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, like I said, I, you can't just say Dallas Cowboys in defense. You can't say Philadelphia Eagles in the whole roster. Uh, that does not count as uh, draft analysis for your uh, team needs. But uh, anyway, uh, Philadelphia Eagles, team needs. Where are you sitting here uh, with the Philadelphia Eagles in team needs now i know that their pass rush last season was um probably the you know the bright spot on that team last season um the problem for them was that they couldn't really show up every single game um and if they had any type of help in that secondary that defense probably would have been you know at least formidable um but i think that right now they have to focus on offensive weapons that's probably going to be their biggest need whether it be a wide receiver or a, a tight end. Uh, this is a team that I could not fault if they went after your tight end because um, they need weapons. You know, they, they shipped out their, uh, their former franchise quarterback and um, it's a new look offense. So I think you start by, you know, surrounding whatever is going to be your starting quarterback, whoever it may be that you surround him with, you know, at least some decent weapons um, to, at least give them a chance to win games because you are in the East. So as long as you can put something somewhat competent on the field, uh, you're going to have a chance to contend. Yeah. Uh, this one I was really torn with um, mostly because I, I agree with you. They need some sort of wide receiver tight end upgrade. Uh, but then, you know, I think both you and I watched that secondary <laughs> last year and, you know, uh, I don't know if, what I put as their number one concern, I might lean more like the Cowboys and maybe corner safety just because it was so bad last year. And technically speaking, the Eagles did take Jalen Rieger last year as a first round ride receiver. Now he was beat up and hurt. And uh, I just, I don't know. I, I, I can see both sides of things here where, you know, I tried to get some offensive punch. I'd certainly try to help uh, Jalen Hurts out by giving him, some sort of weapons to throw through because if you look at their uh, weapons right now, it's Rieger, it's Ward, it's Fulgram. Um, you still got Dallas Goddard there. Uh, you know, it just, you know, it's either old or probably barely raw. Yeah, or barely rosterable. You know, uh, as much as I think we liked the uh, Travis Fulgram and Greg Ward era, as fun as it might have been, um, you know, those are fringe level NFL receivers. You know, if they weren't on a roster last year, I'm not sure any of us would, you know, pay any mind. So I, I would. But I mean, that, that's sorry to cut you off, but that's not to say that they can't become, you know, solid wide receivers. Oh, yeah. They, they have the potential. 
you know, I, I like some of their young guys, but like you said, they're they're just inexperienced and we still don't know what type of consistency we can get from those type of guys. So I, I like where you're coming from uh, as far as maybe going defense, but that that offense, man, I, I don't know. I, I think you need to upgrade the offensive weapons a little bit. Yeah, I, I guess we'll split the difference here. I, I think you have to try to shore up that secondary a little bit and uh, maybe just hope, uh, you know, Rieger – uh, sets up a little bit. This is a very deep wide receiver draft, so uh, maybe uh, you get lucky and uh, some guys fall to you and maybe the second round, third round, and you can find someone there, but then you're sort of stuck in the same position you are with the receivers you have, sort of hoping these guys mature and grow instead of, you know, grabbing a uh, Pitts, a Jamar Chase, uh, Deontay Smith, you know, a Waddle, you know, any of those guys who you're pretty sure are going to be high-level receivers instead of grabbing a guy and hoping he becomes a high-level receiver. But, uh, I mean, that secondary was so bad last year. I just think you got to lean a little bit towards trying to shore that up. And also, I I, I mean, I, and I know a lot of people don't do it anymore in taking linebackers in the first or second round, but... Uh, I, I thought their middle of the field was just as bad as their secondary. I thought those linebackers were really, really poor as well. Um, the edge rushers, uh, you mentioned it, were really, really still pretty solid. They are aging a bit, but uh, I, I'm not sure with this team and the team needs. Uh, you sort of factor that into your thing right now. You live with the aging edge rushers and try to build up a secondary and wide receiver. Where there's there any, well, uh, was there any other positions that you thought uh, Philadelphia might try to spring after in this draft? No, you know, the more you talk about it, the more it, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Um, I wouldn't fault them if they went defense, you know, early on. Because uh, like you said, this definitely is a deep wide receiver uh, draft um, with at least a lot of really solid guys. Uh, so, I wouldn't fault them if they went defense early, but I just think that they definitely need to load up that offense because uh, we still don't know what we're going to get from Rieger. So if, if they sure up that offensive weapon uh, need, at least I think it helps that quarterback going forward a little bit. Yeah, I, I think you might just try to wait. Maybe a Tony falls to you. Maybe a Rondell Moore. Uh, maybe a Elijah Moore. You know, uh, guys who were, are – Probably a couple of those guys were going to be first-round picks, but, you know, weird COVID seasons, injuries have stacked up against them. So I I think you can wait. Um, I was going to just bring up one other thing to you. Um, Miles Sanders really been banged up, you know, last year. Uh, I think when he's healthy, he's a pretty high-end running back. Um, and then you got, you know, Boston Scott and uh, Jordan Howard, you know, who are second and third, to, you know, dairy backs but uh would you take a peek maybe a little bit uh second third round maybe at a running back here or do you think uh that's uh just way too much of a reach no actually i wouldn't i wouldn't think it's too much of a reach for that simple reason that you know they, they've got some pretty good guys i think that their their running back death is okay but it's just too many issues with the injuries and it's really derailed, you know, some sort of consistency in the backfield, uh, which hurts that quarterback, especially a young quarterback. So uh, I wouldn't fault them for, you know, looking later on uh, mid rounds, maybe second, third round. Uh, if there's one of those guys out there, there's a lot of running backs out there that are probably going to fly under the radar. Uh, so I wouldn't fault them if they went after a running back. Well, yeah, that that was just my thing. Uh, I, I like Miles Sanders, but, you know, uh, if he's not in the lineup, then – sort of everything gets thrown off. As much as I like Boston Scott, Boston Scott is a third down back who comes in on third down, catches a pass out of the backfield. You run a screen pass for him. He's not an every down back that you can hand the ball to 15 to 20 times a game. And, you know, it, it's just seemed, even uh, that first year where Miles Sanders was hurt in the first part of the year, it, it just seems it gets him off track, especially with a team who I think is going to probably try to heavily focus on the running game with uh, Jalen Hurts back there. Uh, you know, so I, I, it just crossed my mind that maybe you try in the mid rounds to grab uh, one of these running backs who uh, it, it seems like everybody's dropping off in running back territory nobody wants to draft for running back in first round so there might be a little bit uh, of value there uh for the eagles yeah all right let's move on to the new york giants so uh 
they were one of the players in the free agency market. We went off of that on our past shows, but uh, I'm curious where you think they need to uh, upgrade uh, the New York Giants. You know, I've heard a couple things about what they want to do in the first round or supposedly want to what they want to do. You never know how real any of this stuff that's being leaked is. But where are you sitting with the Giants here? Now, I know that this probably won't be a very popular choice, but I think that being as deep as this draft is with wide receiver talent, I think that they should probably look at picking one of those talented guys up early on. Um, I think that you can only benefit from giving more weapons to your quarterback who's going to be coming off an injury, um, injury plague season. So I think it, it does it does you a lot of good to build up. We saw that defense show flashes last season and play really well against some pretty tough teams uh, like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, so they had definitely shown some signs of improvement on defense. I think that you can keep developing those guys you have there. Maybe, uh, you know, with a couple of the guys you brought in, maybe later on the round, you pick up a few guys that will help you out on that secondary, but that defense, I think is starting to mature, starting to turn the corner. Uh, but the offense, I think you need to surround your quarterback with as many weapons as possible. You're getting your running back back this season, which is only going to help take some of the pressure off of him. Um, we've already seen him. He's very capable of scrambling, getting outside and, you know, scrambling for yards. Um, so if you can get him some wide receiver help to really open up those gaps, I think it's only going to benefit him and the team in the long run. Yeah, that's, that's what I've been hearing. Uh, the rumors are the Giants are, you know, sort of in the game to look for a, uh, a wide receiver, even though they did, you know, spend on Kenny Galladay. You know, they have Darius Slate and Sterling Shepard in there. Uh, also Evan Ingram. But uh, Ingram's, I think, going to be a free agent next season. So I don't know what the market's going to be or how much you want to pay him. But I have been hearing they have been looking at wide receiver you know, to give Daniel Jones, I guess, quote unquote, the best weapons possible to advance. Uh, my really uh, focus on the uh, Giants was probably an edge rusher. I, I thought the secondary was pretty solid. I really thought the linebackers were pretty solid. And I thought the interior of their line was pretty solid. But I, I did think they sometimes struggled to get a, a real good, consistent pass rush uh, without blitzing. So I, I thought maybe... Uh, now, this isn't a great draft for edge rushers uh, overall, so, you know, it's hard to, you know, uh, take an edge rusher if you don't think they're really a elite-level guy and then a, you know, elite-level, like, receiver is sitting there. You know, if you think, like, a second-round grade uh, defensive end is sitting there and then you have a first-round grade wide receiver sitting there, it sort of makes your decision for you, but... Uh, Overall, I just thought maybe the Giants would look a little towards the edge rushing uh, side of things, uh, but uh, with the thin sort of edge rushing needs in this draft, I, I think they probably are pretty uh, definite to go wide receiver wise. Yeah, I mean, I, I get your argument. I, I personally think that even though, like I said earlier, it's probably not a super popular choice. I think that you probably look for a weapon on on the outside and probably get some offensive line help because uh, a few times, uh, you know, especially with, I, I know that a lot of it has to do with Saquon Barkley being out, uh, but it seemed like whenever the, any team was facing off against the Giants, you really didn't have to account for the running back as much and you could really focus on containing the quarterback and bring in pressure from the interior. So uh, maybe get, you know, a little extra offensive lineman help, but um yeah, I see your argument, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely. I, I think an O-line helped, too. Uh, but I just don't know if it's, like, a huge, huge uh, thing for them But because uh, they spent the uh, year before on some O-linemen. But uh, you, I, you're right. Uh, you know, it, it did look like at times he was still running for his life a little bit. And uh, I, I didn't see many holes for Saquon Barkley, uh, really any the last two years even uh before he got hurt but I, I wanted to throw a little uh wild card at you here would the giants look for a quarterback at all or i i mean we're coming into daniel jones third year uh so you know that's one year left on the contract you sort of got to make the decision are you going to extend him and pay him or are you going to go back in the draft here uh you know uh I think most of the quarterbacks are going to be gone uh, first round wise by the time you uh, get to the Giants pick. I'm assuming so. But uh, would you maybe take a, a little bit of a chance at one of these uh, 
you know, projects, uh, Kyle Trask to Kelly, Kellen Mund to Jamie Newman uh, type of quarterback here and uh, see if uh, it's an upgrade? Uh, personally, I wouldn't like that pick. I think that, you know, there's a few quarterbacks we know this this particular draft that are going to make a big splash. Um, and there's a couple of sleepers out there that always is, you know, we, we've seen it year, year in and year out. There's always a guy or two that, you know, kind of come out of nowhere. But I don't think that you, you know, necessarily need to go quarterback uh, planning for the future. I think that we've seen enough from Jones to know that he can take that next leap forward. He's been improving, you know, pretty much year in and year out. Um, even without Saquon last year, which really put a lot of pressure on him, he was able to really take this team and put him on his back. And, you know, we saw uh, several games where the only reason they were close was because of his legs. And, you know, uh, I, that's why I think that if you can – add more weapons to the outside. I think it's going to help him out and um, it would have it would stop him from having to run, you know, every single down and um, maybe keep him healthy a little bit longer, which, and then uh, only helps the whole team out. So I, I think going quarterback would probably be um, unwise, but uh, I mean, it, I get the financial reasons, you know, behind it. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if I'd, I'd take a flyer on uh, one of these quarterbacks, uh, you know, the secondary types. I, I assume you aren't going after a Lawrence Fields, Wilson, you know, Lance type, but uh, I was just sort of staring at the secondary ones. Maybe you make a grab, but uh, I, I think that's where you sort of might waste a pick and that's where you're better off going for, uh, like you said, one of your linemen, uh, maybe an edge rusher, you know, maybe uh, just gather linebacker and cornerback death because I did really like the way this defense was growing. And uh, you mentioned it, uh, Daniel Jones, before he got hurt in that uh, little like five game winning streak stretch was starting to play pretty good football. Now, uh, whether that's, you know, Daniel Jones career, we get stretches of good football, we get stretches of bad football. But, uh, you know, I, I think you probably go another year before you start uh, seriously uh investigating whether to uh, invest in another quarterback. All right, we'll go to the champions of the NFC East, the Washington football team. Uh, this is a pretty interesting roster here. Um, I'm curious what you're thinking uh, where they need to go draft-wise. I think that defense is pretty solid. And I know they, they've had a little bit of movement there, but I think they'll be okay. So I'm not too concerned about looking you know, defensively in this draft. I think you have to focus on shoring up that uh, offensive line and uh, you know, any type of help you can bring in on the offensive side, I think it's going to be key uh, for this team. We didn't see a lot of offensive production. I think that the best offense we saw from them was when Alex Smith took over uh, at the quarterback position. Um, how much of that was a quarterback? How much of that was the lack of weapons? How much of that was the, you know, the, the big gaps in the offensive line. I, I really couldn't tell you, but I know that the offense needs help. I'm not concerned about the defense going forward. I think they'll be okay, especially playing in the uh, in the NFC East. So I think you definitely have to focus on probably bringing in some offensive line help and uh, some something else on offense. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely think the offensive line probably needs the most improvement here, and uh, that's where you uh, probably need to shore up the best. Uh, you know, I. I, their defense is really good, but uh, I, I do think they could probably use some linebacker depth, maybe a little secondary depth, uh, you know, sort of help out that uh, defensive line a little bit. Uh, you know, as if you can get like a, I don't know if one of the top level corners will fall to them, but one, if one of them does, and you, the more corner depth you can put down there to lock down receivers, uh, just the bonus you get with that defensive line, you know, being able to get to the quarterback. I think we both know this uh, Washington team needs to be good, really good on defense to win games, even now and bringing in Ryan Fitzpatrick. I, I just don't think they have the overall depth at all. Um, I think they probably draft a little too low to get one of those high-end receivers. But if one were to uh, fall to them, do you maybe skip out on an offensive lineman or maybe some defensive depth and maybe try to grab one of them if they were to happen to fall to Washington at the uh, end, uh, sort of in the uh, tail end of the draft here? I mean, if I'm Washington, I think it really depends on – you know, which wide receiver it is and uh, where do I have them on my big board? Because I'm not going to, you know, pass on the offensive line. 
uh, to bring in a guy who it, I don't think is going to, you know, at least help uh, reduce the obvious uh, lacks lack of a uh, of talent on that offensive line. So I, I think it really depends if there's a guy that they have pretty high on their board and he just happens to fall. I think you definitely pick him up because like I said, anything you can bring in on the offense is probably going to help this team overall. Um, I do somewhat agree with you uh, as far as bringing in a little bit of a defense, but I think they can get by and uh, they, they play in the, in the East so they can keep it close with the defense they have but they still need to score points. So I think that they really need to focus on offense. Yeah. The, uh, the, a couple other things I'd look at, uh, maybe trying to upgrade that tight end position, but really the problem there is uh, you have Kyle Pitts and then it's really, really a pretty big drop off. This is a very light uh, tight end uh, draft here. So I, I mean, maybe that's something you grab in the third, fourth, fifth round and hope your scouting has done well enough to find you a guy that can, at least contribute on that side of the things. Um, I bring up the same question I bring to you with the Giants here. Uh, you aren't going to get one of the you know four top quarterbacks here. You did bring in Ryan Fitzpatrick. Uh, they have Kyle Allen. They have Tyler Hineke here. Uh, do you maybe uh, draft one of those secondary guys in third round? Uh, maybe to see if... Uh, he might have some life and he can maybe take over the job. Uh, or do you just wait it out and assume next year you're probably going to go full bore and take a first round uh, pick, pick at quarterback? Well, I wouldn't bank my money on the draft next season because you actually won the division this last season. Uh, so I wouldn't bank on, you know, you get a high pick. The AFC, uh, sorry, the NFC East is pretty bad. So. I'm not banking on next season. This is one of those teams that I wouldn't fault for taking a quarterback. I think that as long as there's a reasonable, uh, you know, round you pick him in, uh, we saw guys like Russell Wilson that got picked, you know, in the first, uh, you know, three, three rounds of the draft and look at what he turned out to be. Now, I'm not saying that there's another Russell Wilson out there, but uh, <laughs> the possibility always remains, uh, you know, look at Brady, you know, these are guys that just, you know, they're, they're almost like, a, you know, they turn into gems later on, but no one really sees it early on. Uh, they might see some talent. And I think that that's what they have to go after. If they're going to draft the quarterback. So I wouldn't fault them for going quarterback. Anything on the offense is going to help. Uh, and, you know, maybe you bring in some competition. Some of these guys will actually step up. Yeah. All right. So that's the NFC East. Let's move on to the NFC South. So really interesting. Uh, this is going to be just a fun division next year. I'm already uh, looking forward to previewing this division because quite honestly, you could tell me any one of these teams is either going to be completely awful or completely great. I, I just don't know what I'm going to get here, but uh, let's start out with the champs, uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, they sort of bring everybody back. Uh, I'm curious where you're sitting on where they need to upgrade stuff. I don't know. I mean, the Buccaneers are one of those guys, uh, teams that are pretty much stacked, and and they were, you know, kind of they were going to be stacked for you know a, a very small window because of the type of money that a lot of these players are demanding. Um, as long as you have Brady, I think you're solid. Uh, we've seen him operate. I know a lot of people are saying that maybe they need they need to get another wide receiver. I don't see it. I think that Brady can turn any wide receiver into a, a competent wide receiver. We've seen that happen time and time again. Guys like him and Manning, you know, didn't matter who they were thrown to. They could always get you the ball. You know, um, these guys are just really smart quarterbacks. So I'm not too concerned about, you know, the wide receiver position. I, I don't know. This is, it's hard for me to really nitpick. I think that they can kind of go either way. Um, I think that they really need to focus on adding some depth. Um, that's all they really need. And if you can get guys for cheap, guys that you can rotate, you know, uh, on both defense and offense, I, I think it, it's helpful to your team. I think you're pretty much set to make another run at a Super Bowl. So you pretty much have free range as far as where you go here. Yeah, uh, I, I can see the wide receiver thing. Now, I don't know if uh, a good enough one is going to fall to them, but I, I'm assuming someone like Charles Godwin, who, you know, signed the franchise tag and probably is a 
more year to year guy by the time, you know, Brady leaves and this thing resets. My guess is he goes to greener pastures where somebody is going to pay him a lot of money to be a wide receiver for them. Uh, so maybe I'd look to upgrade there. Uh, honestly, I don't, I know teams have a weird thing about it, but I don't have quite as weird a thing. I would look at running back, uh, especially you're drafting so late in the first round. Uh, I mean, if you can get uh, one of these top tier running backs, I, I you know, a Travis, Travis ATN, a Najee Harris, uh, you know, uh, I'd even look at Javante Williams. I really, really like him out of Carolina. But I mean, you could upgrade that position. You can get him on the cheap and, uh, you know, you aren't really hurting yourself anywhere else. And, uh, I, I guess you could maybe look edge rusher, you know, Pierre Paul's getting a little old. William Golston's getting a little old, uh, maybe linebacker where, uh, Levante David's starting to get a little old and, uh, you know, Shaq Barrett probably isn't long for this team either. And you can already start to maybe, uh, plug in pieces where you're going to have to rebuild in the next couple of years. Once this team sort of, you know, falls apart after making the run. But, uh, I, I'm curious about you and your thoughts on like, taking a running back in the first round. I mean, teams are now absolutely against it. Now, I, I'm not for taking a running back like your top five pick, but I think once you get past like the top 15 guys, if that's a position you need to upgrade and you can bring in a cheap running back who you know will be good, I, I say go for it. Yeah, I, I get, like I said, I don't think this team could do uh, any – I don't think they could do any wrong uh, – any way they decide to go, if they went running back, I completely understand, you know, adding death to that, to that backfield is only going to help you out. And, uh, you know, being a Ram fan, you know, one of the last teams that actually uh, drafted a uh, running back early on in the, in the draft, it, it's, it's really, it's a rough position, man. You know, we know these guys are getting pounded into the ground. They're getting running, you know, 20, some of these guys touch the ball 30 times a game and, they're just about getting hit in every single play. So it's a rough position, especially to give up such, you know, valuable draft capital uh, for a position that you really don't know how, what the longevity is for it. So, I mean, this team's so loaded that I wouldn't blame them even if they did that because uh, they're, they've got weapons at every spot. But I think that if you can bring in, like you mentioned, that edge is a, a little bit old, you know, I, they can still handle their own. Uh, and I'm not talking about bringing in any guy who's going to replace any of them, but you bring in some guys that are going to be rotational guys yeah. that give these guys a breather. I, and, and probably you won't lose that much of, of a step when it comes to, you know, pass rushing uh, and filling up the gaps on the run. I think that is probably your best option. But again, they're so loaded that if they went running back, I wouldn't fault them. Yeah. All right. Let's move off the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Let's move to the Atlanta Falcons. And uh, a lot of uh, rumors flying out of the Falcons. Uh, you know, the coaching staff supposedly loves Kyle Pitts. The front office uh, wants to draft, uh, you know, a quarterback of the future. The coaching staff... Uh, doesn't want to uh, deal with a quarterback in the future because that means uh, they're probably getting fired in three years while they wait for the quarterback of the future to be good. But um, I, I think their needs are definitely at defense and offensive tackle. But, uh, you know, Kyle Pitts is staring at you at the face. And uh, Ridley, Jones, uh, Pitts, uh, that's a whole lot of firepower to throw to. So uh, I I'm just curious uh, – what your thinking is on the Atlanta Falcons? I, I think that I'm with the with the majority. I think that they're going to go tight end here. Uh, you know, they haven't had. I mean, they 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 tend to have explosive offense. You know, pretty early on in the season, we saw it last season they were really explosive offensively, and defensively they were atrocious. And towards the you know latter half of the season, the roles reversed, and that defense was actually playing a lot better, while that offense you know just couldn't close out games. And they haven't had that very high energy explosive offense ever since they lost their tight end Gonzalez. So uh, I think that they're going to go tight end this, this draft. I think that's what they're doing. And if for some weird reason, they, their tight ends not there, uh, which I, I expect them to be, but if he's not there, um, I think that they're probably going to focus on that secondary. Um, that entire defense could use uh, an upgrade here and there in every single position. Uh, like I said, they did play better towards the end of last season, but I don't 
see any consistency with it. So I think you need to definitely upgrade that defense. Yeah. Um, would you personally, you're the GM, would you take a Kyle Pitts or would you maybe trade back and uh, sort of build uh, that secondary, maybe the linebacking corp, uh, you know, and maybe try to get another asset down the road? Uh, I, I guess it probably depends how secure you think your job is. Uh, but uh, it probably is just, I, I think we all know Kyle Pitts is going to be a good player in this league. You trade back, you draft a corner, you, you the learning curve there is a little bit longer. So I, I'm just curious what your uh, thinking is. Do you just go Kyle Pitts, and, or are you a little more, let's try to get an asset and let's try to build this defense? We already have weapons on offense. Uh, look, I like Pitts, okay? I think he's going to be a solid player. But the problem with thinking guys are going to be solid players is you, a lot of people thought Ryan Leaf was going to be a solid player. Um, you know, We go down an endless list of guys that – you know, were big prospects and turned out to not, you know, really make it in the NFL. Now I'm not saying that's Pitt's, you know, uh, path in the NFL, but he, he's not guaranteed anything. He still has to work for everything. So yes. Would it be a nice fit there? Yes. And and if I was a GM and he was there, I'd definitely be tempted to take him, but in the NFL defense wins championships. And we saw it, you know, last Super Bowl. You had the high, you know, powered offense of the Chiefs going up against that really stacked Tampa Bay team with a lot of studs on the defensive, you know, side of the ball. And who won that game? That defense completely shut down, you know, Kansas City's offense. So defense still wins championships. So I think that if I'm the GM, I'm probably more focused on improving that overall defense. Yeah, I, I, I it's very hard because I, I think I'd be very excited to. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, see uh, Pitts, Ridley, team. Julio Jones, uh, you know, uh, offense here. But uh, y you're probably right. I, I think the smart move is to gain an asset and maybe go defense and try to build that up, especially since your offense is already uh, pretty stacked. Uh, we'll move to an interesting team again. I, like I said, this uh, whole defense is really, really interesting. Uh, the New Orleans Saints. Now, uh, they had to cut a whole lot of defensive guys here so i'm guessing you're probably thinking they need to rebuild that defense a little bit but uh where are you uh thinking here for the saints i think that their focus is probably going to be on that secondary as you mentioned they lost a little bit of uh of that death at the positions uh you know it's it's tough um I'm so used to kind of seeing Drew Brees on this team. And I know that they have, you know, plan B and plan C already, you know, on the roster, but I don't know, man, this team, you know, defensively, they played really well last season and it seemed like as soon as they got their quarterback back, that defense was able to take a breather. They kind of took a step back from, you know, the way they were pressuring the opposition. So, but even so they still had a, a, one of the better defenses, in my opinion, just, you know, giving it the old eyeball test. I'm not sure what they ranked on paper, but I know that watching games, they had a pretty decent defense. So I think you keep improving on that and you just kind of bank on what you already had set as far as, you know, on the offense side of the ball, you've got Williams, you know, you've got Kamara, you've got some, some, you know, you got some pretty explosive players on offense and your quarterback position's been basically groomed for quite a while, whether you're going to go with Winston or whether you're going to go uh, with Hill. You have a guy that you brought in that you thought could you know maybe make a difference, and then you have your guy that you've been grooming. I think you go defense in this draft. Uh, as tempting as it is to go after one of those wide receivers, I still think you go defense. Yeah, I, I think you got to go defense here. Uh, you know, I, I really look hard at the secondary. Uh, it, it's a uh, Sort of deep uh, cornerback draft, uh, safety draft. So some of those guys might fall to the Saints where they're sitting at. Um, the only thing I, I'm curious about, uh, their depth at wide receiver is a little thin. Um, but uh, the Saints really, uh, throughout their whole history with Sean Payton, have not really spent uh you know high draft capital on uh wide receivers they've sort of been able to find guys uh, even michael thomas was a i believe a second round pick so you know um would you uh maybe uh 
if you were the Saints and one of those top, I, I'm talking the top guys. I, I'm not talking the secondary guys in the second or third round, but uh, say a Smith or Waddle uh, falls to you in that uh, 20s range, would you maybe grab that if you were the Saints? Or is it your needs right now are just too much uh, in the secondary after losing so many guys to free agency? I mean, if one, if one of those guys falls to you at that pick, I think it's really hard not to take him. Um, even though I think that Sean Payton's uh, game plan, you know, the way he builds his offense, it's really factored around, you know, you don't know which way they're going to attack you. You know that they have weapons at certain spots, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's how they're going to attack you. Um, he's very methodical when it comes to running that offense. So I think that he can take just about any wide receiver and put him in a good spot or the best possible spot for them to succeed. So, you know, I wouldn't be too worried, but I mean, it'd be so tempting to take a wide receiver. I think that if they fell to that position, I probably would have to jump on it just, you know, I'm just out of how much I like these guys there. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, we'll move on to the Carolina Panthers. Uh, rebuilding city this team looks uh very very interesting here uh they drafted all defense um last year so uh are they going to go a little more offensive here or do they continue to build uh i guess the question of drafting a quarterback is probably out uh, now that they have sam darnold and uh technically speaking yeah yes uh and technically teddy b is still there so uh they don't even really need depth um where are you seeing the uh, Carolina Panthers here? I think we're going to see a little bit of what we saw last season. I think we're going to see them sure up that secondary a little bit, bring in some extra help. Um, I think that was probably their weakest point when it came to uh, their defensive stats. I think their linebacking core and their front, you know, their their front uh, line did a pretty good job at containing people and getting pressure on the against the quarterback, but. Uh, it's that secondary that let them down in several uh, situations. So I think they probably go secondary a little bit, and I think they probably try to shore up that offensive lineman and uh, get either Darnold or uh, Bridgewater the the protection that they need, uh, seeing as how they're going to get you know a pretty decent pair of running backs in that backfield. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to see them go with a couple of two back sets, you know, this upcoming season, and. and if they can get him enough protection to let these guys kind of get open and get some open field, uh, they'll probably have a little bit of success. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely have a offensive line penciled in here. I, I think you want uh, Darnold to be protected, uh, you know, so... Hey. I, I do see a, their secondary was still very, very poor last year. I, I think it probably cost them a handful of games and really probably cost them. I don't know if it cost them a playoff spot necessarily, but I think on that back end down the stretch, they would have been more in the running, uh, you know, to be in the mix to get a playoff spot there if that uh, secondary had been a little bit better and they didn't have to get into so many shootouts. But uh, I, I think with this uh, running back uh, tandem, you got – McCaffrey there and uh, back, and I just think you shore up that offensive line a little bit. Uh, a couple of these guys in, on the offensive line are drafting down there. You're sort of in the perfect spot to uh, land one of them. Uh, I, I doubt Penny Sewell will be around, but uh, later I'll probably be there. Uh, Christian uh, Darius will probably be there. Uh, so uh, really, really uh, think that will be be where uh, Carolina goes, but uh, I also see the need uh, for a whole lot of secondary help. And then uh, maybe later on the draft, uh, you try to upgrade a couple of those skill positions. I, st I, I like the wide receivers. I love Robbie Anderson and uh, stuff, but I, you know, it probably could use a upgrade. I, I think if you have like a uh, Robbie Anderson and a DJ Moore, uh, you know, as your two and three receiver, and then you have an elite one, you you got a you got a nice trio there, but when you have Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore as sort of your ones, uh, it, it it probably could use an upgrade, uh, maybe an upgrade at tight end. But like we talked about, if you aren't getting Kyle Pitts, the uh, drop off at tight end is really really big. But uh, maybe later in the draft, you can look to upgrade that position a little bit. Yeah, I, I totally get where you're coming from. Makes a lot of sense. All right, let's move up north and uh, 
Now, you can't say uh, for every team but the Packers, they need everything. Uh, we have to <laughs> shrink it down just a tad. But uh, I, I do think pretty much every team but the Packers uh, essentially needs everything. But uh, let's start out with the uh, fun Chicago Bears. Um, I, I I don't even know where to begin, but uh, let's see where you go. Let's see. What did they do? They got rid of the only quarterback that was winning them games, regardless of how liked or disliked he was by the coach and the fans. Um, so I think the quarterback position is probably a big need. I know that they brought in a couple guys, and I don't think they're necessarily the answer. So I think that you have to probably go all in on setting guys up uh, to be developed. This is a complicated team, and I, I, I don't think that this draft is going to completely, you know, get them over the hump. They played pretty well for, you know, spurts last season, and it, it was really when Trubisky was there. So uh, this team is going to be completely different. Uh, on You know, they still got pretty good, you know, skill position uh, players. I think that they're pretty set at that, but I think they're probably going to have to focus a lot on the offensive line. Um on some secondary help. And if you can somehow get a quarterback in there, uh, some guy you can develop, I think that you have to do all these things. But when it goes to team needs, I think that they have quite, you know, uh, they have their hands full when it goes to the team needs. So they could go just about either way. I would personally focus on the offensive line first and uh, maybe the uh, secondary. And then if you can find a quarterback, uh, I'd go after a quarterback also. Yeah, uh, line was probably my number one choice. Uh, certainly, if you're going to put uh, Andy Dalton in there, uh, I, I'd be sure to protect him. Now, I don't know about just throwing a rookie offensive tackle in there as a uh, answer to uh, protect, protecting him or not. But, uh, hey, whatever. I, you, you know, um I, I could see an upgrade at wide receiver needing to be had. Uh, you know, Allen Robinson is a very, very good possession receiver, but he's not going to break the bank downfield. Uh, Anthony Miller has not shown really, uh, really much. Uh, you know, it's very thin at receiver. Uh, running back, you're probably okay. David Montgomery really started to play well towards the uh, end there, but there's no telling uh, what you're getting because uh, before the uh, first the first eight weeks of the season, I think David Montgomery might have been the worst running back in the NFL. So, uh, yeah, I think I recall you saying some of that. So uh, I don't know. And then, uh, quite honestly. Um, I didn't think their defense was all that great. It has some names that I like, but uh, there were plenty of games where I, I saw that defense being a little leaky. So I, I think you mentioned secondary help would be nice there. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Not everything would be nice there. <laughs> yes, I, I think I literally have said every position possible other than maybe you don't need to upgrade the running back. <laughs> this is no, no offense to any Bears fans out there. I'm not you know trying to bash on your team here, but... They do need help, and uh, you know this is. We're just discussing what they need. They need help at just about every position. But like you said, offensive line, secondary, uh, maybe quarterback, maybe wide receiver help, uh, maybe a little bit of edge rush. Again, you need help just about everywhere. Yeah, uh, you do need quarterback help, but I I'm assuming the Bears are never trading up again to draft a quarterback. So. Uh, the quarterbacks that are at least maybe impact makers will probably not be where they're drafting. So uh, you probably aren't getting that. That's probably a next year type thing. Uh, I don't know. Is there any other position we need to go over for the Bears? <laughs> uh, did you touch on the head coach ship? Well, uh, that'll be next year or probably week Wait. one when we're naming our worst coach of the week. Can you draft the coach? Uh, I, I sure think you probably should, but uh, knowing the Bears, they'd probably draft the wrong one. So <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll move to our uh, next huge embarrassing failure, uh, the Detroit Lions. Um, where are we going here? That isn't every position possible. <laughs> okay, so for the Lions... You, I think they got the better end of the deal when it came to the Jared Goff trade. 
I, I'll just go out and say that. Uh, now, this was going to be obvious no matter what, just because of the type of contract he signed in LA. So let's get that out of the way. Okay, now let's let's just assume that Jared Goff is going back to the Jared Goff that led the Rams to the Super Bowl against the Patriots. Then if you want to get him in the best possible situation, you got to, first of all, get him some help at the wide receiver spot. They, they have some guys that are uh, okay, but I think that they can definitely improve at that position. Now, this is a deep draft when it comes to wide receivers, so you definitely have your options of whether you want to go for these guys early or, you know, maybe in the mid rounds. Um, a lot of it depends on who's there and who's not there. You have to shore up that offensive line, get Jared Goff some protection. We've seen that if Jared Goff is uh, brushed, if he's pressured, he tends to make, you know, big bonehead mistakes. So you want to keep him as protected and as comfortable as possible. Uh, so I think after that, then it's really open game. I know that you need some help on defense, but I think that your your key uh, focus this, this draft is going to be on um, getting some weapons on the outside and getting some help on the interior line, uh, the offensive line. Yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, I'm not going to call the defense great, but uh, it, it has more people that I think are... NFL level players than uh, the offensive side of things. So if I'm looking to upgrade in the draft, uh, you mentioned it, offensive line and uh, skill position guys, receivers. Uh, you're probably sort of okay at running back, though. I, I'm not 100% sold on uh, DeAndre Swift, but uh, I, I do think the receivers need a little bit of an upgrade. The line definitely needs a lot of an upgrade. They sit in a very interesting position here at 7. So I'm going to ask you... Um, both uh, elite, a couple of the elite level tackles will be there, and uh, for sure, a couple of the elite level receivers will be there. At seven, which way are you going here? As, as much as I think that one of those wide receivers is really attractive, you could probably find a good wide receiver at that spot. I, I still think this draft is deep enough at the wide receiver position that you can really focus on getting that anchor on the offensive line. Uh, if you can get a guy that you know, you know is going to lock down the position for the next, you know, eight to ten years, you're, you're sold. You know, you're, you're, you're done. You don't have to focus about that position, you know, for the foreseeable future. So I think that if, even if there, a wide receiver is there, I, I think that, you know, you go after one of those top offensive linemen. Um, there's nothing, man, like having, you know, that consistency when it comes to, you know, your, your big guys protecting your quarterback. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I think if the elite level lineman's there, you got to go that over the uh, wide receiver. Um, Perriman and Terrell Williams, uh, you know, were hurt most of last year, but they've shown at times they have been capable of being really good NFL receivers. So I, I think you just need to upgrade that uh, offensive line. Uh, defensively, I'm curious, do you think they need to upgrade uh where do you think they need to upgrade there? I mean, if I had to say anything, I'm obviously going to go with the secondary. Um, I think that they lost a few games last season, even some, some pretty close games because of that secondary. Um, now, there were a lot of situations where they were just completely outmatched when it came to their defense going up against the opposing team's offense, um, which is why we saw Matthew Stafford, you know, rack up a ton of uh, garbage time stats. But... You know, you can never go wrong with either uh, adding rotational guys to that, uh, to that front seven um, or even shoring up that secondary. So I wouldn't fault them either way. I think their defense is okay. Uh, I don't think it's great, but I don't think it's the main focus as far as uh, getting this team to the next level. Yeah, I, I, if I was just looking for depth, I, I'd go uh, probably cornerback-wise, maybe linebacker-wise. But uh, I, I honestly, I think the offensive side – is what needs all the upgrade uh, really on the Detroit Lions and where their draft capital needs to be uh, used. Okay, we'll go to the Minnesota Vikings. Aging, old, eh, I think they still have a little life in there, but uh, I, that defense is definitely aging at old. So I'm assuming we'll probably lead with defense, but uh, I, I think uh, there probably could be some skill positions that could be upgraded as well. Now, this was going to come a little bit as a shock to you. Um, I know that they need help on that defensive line. But honestly, this draft, 
it, where they're drafting, I think they're best suited to go for an offensive lineman, uh, whether it be on the interior or on the outside, you know, a tackle or a guard. Um, I think that your best asset on that team is going to be your running back. So anybody you can get that's going to help open up gaps, you know, and uh, make that hole even just slightly, slightly bigger for him uh, is only going to improve your team. That team is going to get as far as the running back is going to take him. And that running back needs help through that offensive line. So I think you focus on the offensive line and then you shore up the, that, uh, that, that edge rush. Yeah. Uh, I'm really torn here. Uh, I, the receivers don't need an upgrade. Uh, running back don't need an upgrade. I, I really look at uh, a tight end upgrade, but uh, you know, the depth just isn't there. You're going to have to take a, a flyer on somebody. Um it's just this defense, while when it's perfectly healthy and uh, flowing, it's still a pretty solid defense. But I, I think we saw last year it was never really healthy and it was never really all that great, which uh, sort of cost them games because the only way the Vikings are going to win games is pounding away Dalvin Cook and then, you know, getting a play action hit to uh, a Thalen or a, a Jefferson here. So I probably lean a little more towards trying to upgrade uh, definitely that uh, edge rush defensive line um, tandem. But uh, I, I could see your point, definitely upgrading the offensive line too because uh, it, it wasn't all that great. Uh, I think uh, Delvin Cook had to do a lot, lot of work as well. Um, I'm curious, you're sitting at 14 for the Vikings. Uh, you know, somebody like the Falcons we talked about uh, don't necessarily need that uh, four pick. They might be one of the ones you could look at to trade back. If you were the Vikings, would you maybe uh, give up some capital, move into that four, and try to get one of those top elite quarterbacks? Um, I wouldn't go uh, after a quarterback. Um, if I was trading up with the Falcons... And I know it's a little bit high, but I, I think I'd still go for one of those top tackles. I think that um, that offensive line, in my opinion, is probably the the biggest uh, you know hole you need to fill in this draft. And there's only a handful of guys that I think are going to be really good, uh, you know, first day type starters. So I think that I'd go offensive line, even if I traded up uh, with the Falcons at that high of a spot. All right, so let's move from the Vikings and let's move to the Green Bay Packers. Uh, I, I'm going to say they need a wide receiver, but uh, we've watched the Packers uh, draft for, uh, I don't know, forever, and they never draft a wide receiver. So uh, where are you thinking the Packers are going to go here? Ah, oh, geez, you know, this team... It doesn't matter. It seems like it doesn't matter who's on that roster. It seems like somehow they just happen to play pretty good, uh, at least good enough to kind of get that team into a division title every year. Um, but I guess if I had to pick, I would probably say that uh, it never hurts to have more offensive linemen, especially the way those guys tend to get hurt over in Green Bay. Um, maybe a little cornerback help, uh, some defensive tackles. Um, but Overall, I don't think this team is, is really hurting for, uh, you know, that lockdown type guy. I think that they really could use some depth, um, rotational guys. I think that's what's really going to help this team out. Uh, I don't foresee them uh, losing this division this year. Uh, so if they can get a little bit of help at depth at a reasonable price, I think that's probably going to be what helps them out the most. Yeah, I, I think you said it best, uh, a, a little depth and help. Uh, so, you know, I, I think really, uh, you mentioned cornerback, uh, you know, I mentioned wide receiver, we mentioned tackle. I think where they sit in that uh, late 20 spot, you sort of just see how the draft unfolds. You see what's there. And uh, then you sort of make your uh, choice from there. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you can just say, we're going to take a cornerback, and then all the cornerbacks are gone, and you're forced to take a cornerback there late. You sort of see what how the draft is unfolded, and if a good... Yeah, if a good lineman's there, that's where you go. If one of those elite receivers falls, that's where you go. If one of those corners uh, falls, you know, that's where you go. It just sort of, I think the Packers are hard to sort of pigeonhole where you go. They have to have this position to really upgrade. It's just sort of, what is our best, you know, position of weakness that is available, you know, at that sort of end of the draft, uh, end of the first round that they're there and pretty much throughout the draft. Yeah, there aren't a lot of teams out there right now that have the luxury of saying that 
they can really go off their big board at best available. Just uh, don't take I, a running back. That's all yeah. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, I think the Packers are going to be okay. I say that, and then Travis Etienne's going to get drafted. Yeah. All right, so we've gone through the North. Let's move out to your division, the NFC West. Let's start out with the uh, 49ers. Uh, they made the big moves on draft day. Um, I don't know if it's what they need, but uh, I pretty much can, we can both say where they're going in this first round. But uh, after quarterback, what else are you looking at uh, for the Niners to upgrade here? Well, let's see. I, I just want this to go on record so that I sound like a genius when we play this back. Um, I think that the 49ers are going to go quarterback with the first. With the first um, but uh, besides that, I mean, uh, again, this team, you don't really think about it because of, uh, you know, where they're drafting. Um, obviously, there's a trade involved, but even even before that, the position they were drafting at um, and – the record. So the, when you look at those things, you don't really think about this team as being good, but they're actually surprisingly good. Uh, they had a few bad games last season and they were plagued with injuries uh, basically all season long at just about every single position, both on offense and defense. So that really hurt them. But I think this team as, as a whole is pretty complete. They have a, a really good head coach that implements a really good system and uh, game plans really well against his opponents. Um, they went up against really tough competition within their division and, you know, against the Rams and the Seahawks and even the Cardinals, and they played them all really tough. Uh, so I, I think that this team is going to go quarterback, obviously the first with their first pick, they made that pretty obvious by, you know, that blockbuster trade. And I think after that, they're really going to focus on a lot of depth, uh, guys that they can bring in, uh, when guys get hurt, because, you know, that's an unfortunate reality of uh, football is guys are going to get hurt. It's a physical game. And, they saw a lot of that last season. So I think they're going to prep for something like that by adding more depth uh, after they fill that quarterback hole. Yeah, uh, depth. Uh, I, I'm looking maybe a little defensive line depth after those, uh, you know, really, really elite guys on that uh, D-line got hurt. It, it was a pretty big drop-off, so maybe they upgrade a little there to have some guys in the rotation. Um, you know, maybe the line could use a little bit of an upgrade, but uh, the Niners use that sort of zone blocking scheme like the uh, old-school Denver Broncos used to do and like uh, the Washington football team did, you know, um, when Shanahan was there so it, you know it's not necessarily where they have to uh go you know with a high-end offensive lineman i mean it always helps to have a high-end offensive lineman but shanahan's have been you know drafting linemen late and uh molding them into what they want uh pretty much for 30 years <laughs> now probably since the beginning of when both you and i <laughs> were born so um the i i I guess uh, defensive uh, line, maybe uh, some corner depth would be where I'd look. Uh, I, I just wanted to throw a fun thing at you, though. Uh, maybe the Niners trade it up, draft Kyle Pitts, and uh, they're happy with Garoppolo, and we get a Pitts-Kittle two-night in set in there. How fun would that freaking be? Can, can you imagine that? That'd be pretty scary, man. I mean, Kittle on his own is, is a very scary tight end, uh, mismatch nightmare type of guy. Uh, and then adding Pitts, oh man, that, oh man. Yeah, I know. Then you got Debo say. Samuel running freaky, uh, you know, yeah, weirdness like out on the outside. It, I don't know. It just seemed like a fun thing to me. I don't know if you trade uh, three first-round picks to draft uh, Kyle Pitts, but. Uh, no, I, I don't think that's the deal, you know, but I, I've said it before. I like Garoppolo. Mm -hmm. I think that if he can stay healthy, I think that he's adequate enough to help this team get over the hump. But. You know, they obviously didn't trade all that draft capital to pick up a tight end. Although, like I said, yeah, that would be scary, man. And I hate the fact that you've brought it up. I don't want to think about it. I know. I just, I'm like, you have Garoppolo there. You Mozart in the backfield, Samuel and Ayuk on the outside. Then you got Kittle and uh, Pitts there as a double tight end. I'm like, that's pretty nasty offensive side of things. So uh, anyway, I think we both know they're going quarterback. And then I, I think we said it, uh, you know, just add depth places. I, I don't think there's necessarily an out-and-out -out position of uh, need that the uh, Niners really need. Uh, we'll move to the Seahawks here. Um, 
Where do you think the Seahawks can get better here? Uh, the, the Seahawks probably need to improve that defense. Uh, a lot of the uh, the reason why they, you know, had such a poor defense last season was that secondary. But realistically, that secondary is not that bad. Um, their issue was the fact that they they had to defend a wide receiver for very, for a long time. They had to chase these guys pretty much down the field. Um, a lot of the issues with them was the fact that they couldn't get pressure on the quarterback. So I think that. Uh, probably shoring up that defensive line is probably going to be their main focus. Uh, and then if they can add some linebacker help, I think that's also going to help them out. Um, they really need to fix that front seven. Uh, I know that they've got some guys that they like that already there, but if they can bring in some extra guys that are, are going to complement their play style, um, I think that's really going to benefit them. You know, you got Russell Wilson on offense, so I'm not too concerned about, you know, any of those positions. You obviously got a big time wide receiver uh, and even their complementary skill position players, are, are really good. A lot of teams will take them as their number one. Um, so with all that being said, I think that their focus is going to be on defense. If they can rebuild that defense to what it was a few years ago, then this is definitely a Super Bowl contender uh, year in and year out. And this is coming from, uh, you know, division rival fan uh, as myself being a Ram fan. Yeah, uh, I, I think defense probably is their number one uh, upgrade. Uh, I, I'd certainly look to see if they could find an edge rusher out there. I know they re-signed uh, Dunlap, but uh, they, they definitely could use a, a bit of a pass rush uh, that just was not there at all last year. Um, you know, linebacker probably needs a little bit of an upgrade. It's starting to get a little old there. I, I, I agree with you. I think their secondary is pretty solid, so I don't know how much of an upgrade uh, it is there. You do have the weird thing where uh, Russell uh, Westbrook went on there and pretty much trashed his whole O line. So I don't, I don't know wait, if wait, wait. Russell Westbrook. Oh, Russell. Well, he probably trashed the O line too. But, uh... <laughs> I just had to. I just had to give you a hard time. I'm sorry. But uh, Russell Wilson uh, trashed that whole uh, O line. I, I don't know if you uh, necessarily draft because your quarterback is uh, whining. But uh, anyway, uh, I, it, it isn't a great O line. Do you uh, sort of look to the offensive line just because of the uh, you know uh, fit? Uh, Russell Wilson through. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to. Uh, and this is not, listen, that offensive line definitely has some issues, but it's not the worst, okay? Their problem is the fact that they play in the NFC West. And you're going to have guys like Donald and, you know, guys like that San Francisco front seven is also pretty ferocious. Even Arizona now. Yeah, they can rush the passer as well. You know, so it, that's part of the issue is that these are, you know, six games out of your, you know, 16 game schedule. You're facing up against these guys. And then obviously we know the NFL is filled with a bunch of pass rushes, a bunch of really talented guys that can get after the quarterback. So, you know, everybody, everyone's always going to, if you're a quarterback, you're going to want offensive line help. Everyone wants more protection. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's just doesn't always happen for everybody. It's not a perfect world. So yes, if you can upgrade the offensive line, most definitely, you know, you want to keep your quarterback happy. Uh, Russell Wilson is what's going to carry this team to victory. So you want to keep him happy, even if it's just guys that are you bringing in for death. Uh, maybe that's enough to keep him happy. And and but you're going you're going to be against a really tough pass rush within your division six times a year. It's going to be tough to make that offensive line look uh, like a lockdown line. Yeah, definitely. So, all right, let's move to your boys. The Los Angeles Rams. So uh, uh, this one's uh, a little bit like the Green Bay Packers, where I think they just need uh, depth pretty much at, uh, I, I'd go pretty much every position here. Uh, maybe not running back. They still have a pretty decent uh, uh, running back tandem there. But uh, otherwise, uh, their starters are all really, really solid. But I, I think they need to plug and play, you know, a handful of depth, handful of rotation guys here. Where are you looking uh, specifically for the Rams? Uh, I think that you have to probably focus first on that secondary. You lost a couple of guys in free agency. Um, and even though they weren't necessarily starters, they were impactful players that uh, really made a difference, uh, even when they came to the rotation. Um, so I think you have to look at the secondary, and then I think you have to probably add some depth to that offensive line. Um, we saw last season they had a few injuries on that uh, across the line, and it really impacted Jared Goff's protection, which really threw uh, his his play out of whack. So I think those are probably your main focuses. But like you said, 
they're in a similar type of position where, you know, financially they're, they got a lot of money tied up already. So um, just adding a lot of help, cheap help is going to be beneficial to them. So they probably have their big board um, and they're looking, they obviously have positions that they have higher up in their big board, but they're looking at their big board and best available player where you're at is what you're going with. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Probably line would be, probably what I'd put is most pressing issue to sort of upgrade a little bit just because, you know, a handful of those guys are getting a little bit old. Uh, they started to get a little banged up last year. So maybe add some depth behind there, I, I think would be a, a good thing. Uh, maybe uh, put a little depth as an edge rushers. You know, you lost a couple of the edge rushers. You mentioned they lost a couple of secondary guys to add a little depth there. Uh I, I I think they need to upgrade. Uh, not necessarily. I'm saying upgrade. I think they need to add a deep threat at receiver. I, I think two years ago when they lost Brandon Cooks, I, I think it showed up that they just didn't have an explosive guy down the field. Like their Higby was probably their most explosive, you know, downfield receiver, and he's a big tight end. Now they did add Deshaun Jackson. Um, in theory, that is an explosive threat down the field. But uh, every time that guy runs now, his hamstring explodes. So, <laughs> Listen, if, if, if you're getting the Madden version of the Sean Jackson, then I think you're going to be okay because I believe his speed is, uh, is still in the high 90s. Uh, but if you're getting the real life to Sean Jackson, as much as I like the guy, um, you know, you're not getting the type of wheels that we, we once saw from him. So I don't know how much that really, you know, answers your uh, deep threat uh, call, but. Uh, you know, he, he helps a little bit. Uh, yeah, but, I'm sure there will be two games that he hits explosive plays and then 14 others where his hamstring has exploded and he no longer can play. So As long as he helps his win, man, <laughs> then that, that contract was warranted. Yes, yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, depth and uh, it, the receiver thing, you don't necessarily need the upgrade. I, I just think they're a little bit more dangerous when they had that, uh, you know, Brandon Cook style receiver that could get deep pull the secondary and then uh you know woods and cup could get underneath a little bit and make a few more plays i i think that second uh the defensive secondaries can push down a little bit and tend to hammer woods and cup a little more without that uh deep threat back there a lot of people are saying that and simply because of the uh you know uh we we lost a, a wide receiver but i don't think that he was necessarily you know uh the type of wide receiver that, that we really need to succeed. Yeah, I thought he was more in the same mold of a Woods and Cup, you know, an underneath guy. Yeah, I think Reynolds really kind of stepped up this season uh, because of uh, the situation that we were in with injuries. But I don't think necessarily that he was really um, worth the type of money that he ended up getting. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy for him. But I, I don't think that Reynolds has really been that type of guy. Uh, so going forward, probably, you know, best for him and best for us that we parted ways. Uh, but I also heard people saying that they need to look at a kicker. And I, I don't understand where this was even coming from, because when I look back at all the games, uh, you know, once we got him in there, we got him settled in. I think he did just fine. So I think we just stick with him. I, I didn't see much of an issue with him going forward. So I think, you know, we're going to keep him going forward. I think they're going to add some depth to that offensive line and uh, protect Stafford. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. All right, one more team to go. We're going down to Phoenix in the desert here. Uh, the Arizona Cardinals. Um, In a tough division, where do you think they need to upgrade here? Oh, geez. Uh, I, they, <laughs> offensively, I think they're okay. You know, uh, they already had, uh, you know, they have the Murray. They have a pretty decent slate of running backs. They have two pretty good wide receivers, even though you hate one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have pretty good uh, skill position players already. Defensive-wise, uh, they can get after the, the quarterback a little bit. Uh, probably secondary. I think that's probably where they need to focus on. Uh, a lot of their games were lost because uh, just about everybody could throw against them and uh, keep the ball away from their offense, which is really explosive. So I think they're probably going to try and shore up that secondary first, and then after that, uh, maybe bring in some depth at offensive linemen, which in that division is always helpful. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, they also lost Patrick Peterson, who uh, wasn't what he was, but was still a solid still, corner. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, you probably definitely need to look uh, secondary, uh, mostly, you know, corner. But um, uh, I, I, 
I don't know if you necessarily need to upgrade the wide receiver positions. I like Christian Kirk. Now, uh, you know, he's sort of boomer bust. Uh, speaking of, you know, <laughs> receivers who can get downfield but don't do much else, that's Kirk. But uh, Hopkins is there. Green is there. Uh, maybe look to upgrade the tight end position, but we've gone over there's not a lot of depth at the tight end position. Um Really, uh, now they signed James Conner, but uh, I don't think either of us are a huge. Uh, James Conner is a, a running back of the future. They have Chase Edmonds there. I don't know if you can spend uh, first round def capital where the Cardinals sit on a running back, but uh, I definitely look to upgrade that running back position. Now, granted, uh, Kingsbury uh, doesn't like to run the ball, but uh, he might want to think about it uh, every now and then. Anyway, uh, you mentioned drafting a new coach. Um, I, I, I would definitely look into that if they were going to allow it. But uh, I, I don't know if they can pull that off. But uh, secondary would be a definite choice. Some offensive line depth. Uh, I, I think you probably need to look at maybe like a wide receiver tight end type and uh, running back for sure. They pay J.J. Watt. <laughs> well, that that's not the uh, defensive depth I was looking at. That's just a fun player whose sports cards are fun to collect. They pay J.J. Mm -hmm. Watt. Yeah, well, they also... Gave uh, D, uh, AJ Green money too, so uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's good news for me. If we're building that 2014 All Pro team. I'm very excited, but uh, we're building the 2021-2022 uh, All Pro team. I don't think either will be on it. So uh, the cards of the future. All right, that's the NFC side of draft things. We will be back on Sunday to do the AFC side of things on the uh, draft needs. Our man Dynamite David will be in on Friday to do the uh, rankings of the college players. And then the next week, we'll all be together. A big mock draft. We'll put our GM hats on and uh, go through and uh, make our picks. So uh, that's where we are. Be sure to follow us on GreenLightNetwork.org, GreenLight Network, on Facebook and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe and like the show. And where can we find you, Achilles? Uh, as always, you can find me on Twitter at TD Achilles. You can also find me on Facebook under Achilles Reign. You can find me, GLN Champ 5, on Twitter and Instagram. That's our show, and we're out.
Hey, and welcome to the Know It All podcast with our Oscar special. We're doing a two for one today due to the medical community poisoning me. We had to break this into one whole show and go our picks and then our real picks for the Academy Awards instead of breaking it up for a Wednesday and Saturday show. So we're getting both things done. We're first going to go over our picks for our best movies of the year, and then we're going to break down and do our picks and best bets for the Academy Awards on Sunday night. So with me, of course, is Rita Cinema and Dr. N. Sage, our entertainment analyst, here to break down the Academy Awards. Are you ready to get into some movies here today? Yep, absolutely. All right, so we're going to go into our picks, and these are our picks. They don't have to be Academy Award-nominated uh, films. They are just the films that came out in uh, 2020, which feels like almost 10 years ago. Uh, I exactly. went back and looking up, and I forgot that half these movies even came out in the time period up to the Academy Awards uh, end date, which was February 23rd of 2021. So let's start out at the bottom with best visual effects. Rita oh. Cinema, what did oh. you have as your best visual effects in the 2020 uh, Academy Awards? Okay, well, I did not have any alternative films in this one um, to add to those already nominated um, and because I think there's only one film that could possibly win this award, uh, and that's Tenet. And I believe um, I'm going to give my, it actually was, probably one of the better visual effects I've ever seen in a movie, period. It, it was not a movie I really enjoyed that much, but the visual effects- well, I don't think you're going to like my list then. <laughs> well, it, it was absolutely awesome. So I'm just gonna go with Tenet on this one. I'm not even gonna offer any alternatives. All right, Dr. M. Sage, what do you have in the visual effects category? Well, I don't even know if mine was technically eligible, <laughs> but, I'm going with Wonder Woman 1984. It was eligible. <laughs> and right. I don't know why it wasn't nominated. What a tremendous <laughs> movie with an awesome, like, 80s montage in it. You know, the, the um, whole trying on the clothes thing. And it had an invisible plane. So, I mean, come on. Yeah, uh, I had Tenet as my best visual effects film. And then uh, as a couple runners up, uh, we'll go with nominees. I had Wonder Woman 1984 in there. Yes. I had <laughs> Bad Boys for Life in there. I had Ooh, the Birds yeah. of Prey film in there. And I also had the film Soul in there. So uh, those were my uh, five films. But my winner in the best visual effects category was definitely Tenet. I just thought that was a ridiculously put together uh, visually effective film. So uh, we'll move on from that. And we'll go into the musical categories. Uh, best <laughs> score. So Rita Cinema, where are we going with best score? And you're moving around a little bit, so I'm going to have to move my notes around a little bit. I think I'm going from bottom to Actually, top. Actually, she's going from bottom to top. I know, but my list doesn't follow <laughs> that exactly. Um, okay, to be perfectly honest, I found this one hard to do. I, I can't even, I'm not sure, because when I watched the movies, um, I wasn't really thinking about original score. Sometimes I noticed the music. But the fact that it's an original score, it's not always something I pay that much attention to. So I have to admit, other than the ones that were nominated, I really didn't go out and look for anything else. Although I will say, I do remember that I thought the music in Mank was awfully good. So maybe it's just that it wasn't... Um, Am I looking at, yeah. Oh, it is nominated. Sorry, I'm yeah, looking at original there. song. <laughs> I'm looking at the list for original song. Sorry, because Mank was very good. Yes. Um, however, I'm going to give the award to Soul because I thought it had very good, uh, you know, sound uh, music. I'm not, sound is a different thing. Um, That's next. That, that was very original sounding. And look, it worked so well with the story itself and the characters and, so I like the way the story and the characters and the music blended. So um, I will say also that I thought maybe 
if I'm going to offer an alternative, that Tennant also had a very interesting original score and probably should have been nominated. So. Yeah. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with best score? Well, I'm a little off the board here. I have two picks. One is Hamilton because, I mean, it's Hamilton, right? <laughs> the other is the documentary, The Bee Gees, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, which had awesome music. It you had were, awesome music, but I would, don't think that would be considered an original You're going score. by weird Golden Globe rules in your... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just ask it. See, that's what I'm saying. When you think about original <laughs> score, doesn't that mean the music has to be written... I think, we, I think we're okay with it. Uh, right. These are my awards. <laughs> yes, I know. Let me it's, own them. But that's what I'm asking. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's hard when you're watching a movie uh, to review it or to think about it or just to be entertained by it to think about, is this an original score or not? You know, well, that's what I'm, uh, next year you, you, can, the you can you focus know. more on original scores. So you well, I pay a... more attention to original <laughs> song, which you didn't include on this list. I, I sort of threw that all into original scores. It was well, a it's very different, actually. <laughs> yes, I know, but it was a universal uh, music thing because I didn't want to make twenty-five musical awards that we had to go <laughs> over on the day. But uh, best score for me was also. Tenet I had in there. Uh, my nominees for it was Judas and the Black Messiah. Mank was in there as well. I, I really actually liked uh, The Life and Times of David Copperfield as well. And then uh, Hans Zimmer, uh, Wonder Woman 1984. Uh, I, I really love. Now, it was much better in the uh, original Wonder Woman movie, but it's still yeah. uh, really, really uh, a fun theme. Uh, also, I had Mark down there, uh, Defy Bloods. Uh, Spike Lee usually has a really good score for his film. I did not think this was his best one, yeah. but uh, it still needs uh, at least a little mention. But uh, Tenet got my best score for I this I went back and well. listened to the, I went back and watched Defy Bloods again because I would watched it so long ago, a, a, a few days ago, because I was interested in listening to the music more. And it, I, I was kind of surprised that it was nominated, actually. I mean, I enjoyed the music, the score, but I was a little surprised. Yeah, it, it was not Spike's best, but uh, that's grading on a very uh, big curve. But uh, we'll move from score to sound. Uh, Rita, where are we going with best sound? Well, I don't even, I, hang on, I gotta find my page here, I'm moving. I didn't, oh, well, I thought, again, um, just like with original score, I thought Tenet should have been nominated here as well because the sound, as it followed the things that happened in the movie, were, I, I just thought that- Well, it's I been just, punished for ruining movie theaters, so I, I guess it was just awards. amazing. I just thought Tenet's sound was amazing. However, I think there's only one movie that can win this award. I couldn't go beyond it again, um, so I don't have a long list of, and that is Sound of Metal, because what they did, to convey the story with the sound and the, it, it was uh, amazing. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with best sound? Sound of metal. Sound I of think metal. that it's amazing what they did with that movie. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think this is actually a pretty deep category, but uh, I went with Tenet again, but also <laughs> in there was uh, Sound of Metal, and uh, I thought Mank was really good too, the way they uh, <laughs> drived in the old school sort of uh, feel of Hollywood in mm -hmm. there. And uh, then lastly, uh, Bad Boys for Life also <laughs> gets my best sound. Uh, you know, I watch Bad Boys for Life, but I can't for the life of me remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was because it came out in pre-pandemic times, oh, no, and we really were all happier <laughs> and uh, more joyous people at that uh, point in life. Uh, all right, so Tenet has swept my awards right now, but uh, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but uh, it might be fading out as we get into uh, the next handful of categories. Uh, we're going with best editing, so. Uh, Rita Cinema, where are we going with best editing here? Well, this one was a hard. I again, I think it's awfully hard not to include Tenant in this one <laughs> as well because of the way it was put together. 
you know, technically, the problem is technically that movie was just very well done. It's mm-hmm. just that the Nobody movie liked itself, it. <laughs> I did not like the movie, <laughs> which makes it hard with most of the other awards. But with, uh, but to tell you the truth, again, I, I felt like the two best, uh, th- there were two that w- I thought were the best in terms of editing. And one was um, The Trial of the Chicago Seven with the way they uh, put together um, the older Oh, the film, old footage? The older footage with and blended it with the current, uh, I mean, with the movie itself, mm-hmm. plus the courtroom scenes as well, I thought were so well done. And so, you know, it definitely, to me, was one of the better edited films. But I would also throw in Nomadland because the way the photography flows and you see the, the way they put together the scenes the where vistas. the individuals were talking and... Um, you know, living in their trailers, it, I, I just, it's hard not to say that's not the best edited film. Yeah. Uh, Dr. M. Saved, where did you go with the best editing? Well, I'm going in a very different direction again. I think that Borat, subsequent movie film, was extremely well edited to have all of those different sides. I can't argue sides, with that. <laughs> all of those different Move, you know, all of those different scenes and put them together in a movie that actually flowed. Where they I were faking the people editing. out as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Borat. Uh, so, you really are making a pitch to get on that Golden Globes committee. You've had the Bee Gees documentary <laughs> and uh, Borat uh, nominated exactly. for the uh, Academy Awards uh, today. I'm just waiting for my invitation. <laughs> uh, best editing for me was uh, Chloe Zhao in Nomadland. Uh, if mm-hmm. there was something I really, really uh thought that film did excellent was just the way it uh, was put together and moved and uh, the shots were just uh, ridiculously good. So uh, I I thought that uh, deserved the award. And if uh, Nomadland uh, wins anything, that one she should definitely win uh, for sure. The other ones, uh, Mikkel Nelson for Sound of Metal, I thought was a really uh, nice piece of filmmaking, especially on the budget that they uh, you know, sort of had to work with uh, there. Uh, James Herbert, uh, The Gentleman, the Guy Ritchie movie, which nobody probably remembers, came out uh, also around the same time as Bad Boys for Life uh, because (laughs) it was pre-pandemic and we were all living the good life. But uh, The Gentleman was a really solid film. And then uh, Jay Cassidy for Birds of Prey were also in my nominees for Best Editing. But I I think Chloe Zhao and Nomadland really, really uh, deserve that award. But... uh, Next up, we have costume design. Where are we going with that one, Rita Cinema? Well, actually, I think um, one of the ones that was left out here was Wonder Woman in this case, where they did the 80s kind of thing. I thought that was kind of interesting in costume. Oh, um, it was terrible. But, but um, <laughs> the, the, they, they, it won't, you know, it's not winning my award. I just thought okay, it was good, kind of good. interesting. Um, no, no, I think, uh, and I did wonder, the list you sent out of films included Coming to America, but I assume it's in next year's group, because I think so. cost, the costumes for that movie. Well, no, were, you had to look at, I sent you 2021, but you had to look at the cutoff date. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. Well, I think it's after the cutoff <laughs> yes. date. Really. Yeah, it is. Well, it better be nominated next year. It better be. Those were, those were great your costuming. Mind great. Yeah, they, I, I don't know how anybody will beat that. No, I think Emma by far. I and that I also went back and watched that recently. Um, the costume, and I was amazed because the first time I saw the film, I was really watching more for the story. This time, I watched for more of the things around the story, and one of them being the costumes. And oh my goodness, this movie needs to win best costume design. It's just fantastic. Yeah. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going here? I, I would agree with that. Now, Borat's costumes were pretty amazing, but <laughs> Emma's costumes were beautiful. You well, can't, there, there isn't anything else in that category. I don't think that can compare. Well, this is uh, one for the ages because it's a three-way sweep here because <gasps> I also had Emma. Uh, it's a sweep. 
Alexander Brine uh, for Emma. I had best costume design. Now, I did think there were two others that were really, really good. Uh, Trish Somerville and Mank. I thought the Mank costumes were they ridiculously were. good, too. And then uh, uh, Pina Dagler uh, for Mulan. Uh, the Mulan uh, movie mm. uh, really was uh, something you know, to behold. I forgot I, I really about did Mulan. Like that as well. Well, I have trouble. I two. There are two animated films that are nominated, and I guess you know you design costumes for animated films as well. But somehow or another, when you don't put real people in them, you know it. it um, I think they're talking about the live action Mulan, not the animated one. Yeah, oh, the, the live the, action. Mulan. Yes, I know, but it had it, it was it had animation in it as well. Did it? No, no I guess it was it all live costumes. action. No, yeah. it was yes, all I'm live sorry, action. Sorry, having a senior moment here. <laughs> Maybe well, it's just Pinocchio. <laughs> Pinocchio, was it a live action? <laughs> yes. I didn't yes. see it. Okay, well, I, I feel don't think better anybody now. watched it. No, no, I feel better now. I Because I looked at that and I thought, why would you include? <laughs> but yes, I watched, and I watched Mulan too. I can't believe it. Okay. My Sorry last one that. in there, I, I was you know throwing what, in a, though? None a of more us modern one. Wait a minute, none of us mentioned Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which everyone actually, we'll do this in our next show, which, but is what everybody thinks will win. Yes, uh, but uh, the other one I threw in there, a more modern style, was Bad Boys for Life, uh, Donya <laughs> Uh For best costumes. What costumes did they wear? They're all wearing very nice designer shirts. Go look at what Mike Lowry's wardrobe <laughs> is. Okay. <sighs> Check out Mike Lowry's wardrobe in Bad Boys for Life, and you'll see. It's a very stylish uh, movie. So uh, that Let me throw out one more thing about Wonder Woman. <laughs> I know I've been chastised here for picking a bad costume design, but one of the things they do in that movie is use clothes to show power on the women. Yeah. Wonder Woman's costume in this movie is fantastic. But the cheetah If they hadn't too. done the stupid... Thing where he's trying on all the 80s clothes, which just drove me nuts. It was too long. I hated that scene in the whole movie. Well, but Wonder Woman's costume and I thought, is fantastic. I, actually, I, thought it, I thought it was kind of funny because I can remember wearing those stupid clothes <laughs> like that. Well, I didn't wear well. those clothes, but, you know, I thought it was pretty accurate, actually. They were stupid looking clothes. But, you know, they as that character um, that Kristen Wiig plays changes they yeah. change her clothing. Oh, yes, absolutely. her personality, which, you know, but it yeah. doesn't yeah. even approach Emma, so. No, I, 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 or, Wonder Woman uh, had some really nice uh, costume design, but uh, I think Emma and then Mank and uh, I, I think. Yeah, Mulan. they're all better. Yeah. Uh, no, no question. To the best uh, looking film, we're going to go with best cinematography here. So uh, cinematography, where are you going, Rita Cinema? This one was, I didn't add any additional movies, although I suppose Tenet could kind of get in here. Um, I think it's more visual effects than it is cinematography, if you want to, you know, truly define cinematography. I think the two best are, I, I don't think there's anything better than Nomadland and Mank. I think those two were by far the best in terms of cinematography. Um, I would probably... And it's hard for me to say. I can't pick between those two. I think they're very different kinds of films. One uses more digital. The other uses more true photography. But I thought both of them were very good in terms of the, the, yeah, you know, the cinema so. aspects. I haven't seen News of the World. Um, I kind of wondered. I don't know whether it, you know... Uh, cowboy hats and uh, okay. I think we're okay. Well, just in terms of the landscapes and the yeah. cinema yeah. aspect. I haven't had a chance to see that I one either. Seen it, so I feel like I haven't, it wasn't nominated. Well, it was nominated, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Where are we going, Dr. M. Sage, for best cinematography? I have to agree with Rita Cinema on this. And um, I would give it to Mank over Nomadland. I like the cinematography in Nomadland. I mean, it's pretty amazing, the photography in general there. But the look of Mank is so similar to the movie it's trying to emulate that I just really thought they did a good job with it. 
Yeah, uh, I, I think this is a fairly deep category. I, I could have probably written down about uh, 15 or 20 movies uh, down here, but uh, I have Eric Messer Schmidt for Mank as uh, my best cinema photography, but uh, I think Hoyt Van Hama for Tenet definitely deserves a little bit of a mention. Uh, Angus Hudson for The Life of Head, uh, the Italian movie with Sophia Loren, mm -hmm. oh, I thought definitely yeah. uh, at least deserves a, a yep. mention there. Uh, Sean Bobbitt, Judas and the Black Messiah, definitely uh, I, I thought had a really nice uh, had a great look, yeah, as well. And then uh, uh, of course Nomadland and uh, Joshua James Richards, I thought were really good, but uh, I don't think there's really anywhere to go but uh, Mank here because uh, that thing. Uh, while it's not my favorite film, it, it looked and sounded uh, ridiculously well. It, yeah, it did. All right, we'll move very on. much conveyed the period, the time yes, period. Yes, definitely. It so did. You got the old Hollywood uh, sort of feel out of that thing. Uh, best screenplay we're going to. So uh, I think we probably well, all. Two, by the way, there's two screenplay. Yes, awards. I know, but I didn't feel like researching whether it was an adapted or <laughs> original. So uh, that's for you, Tim. Good for you. <laughs> so which so, one are we doing though? You can any you screenplay. Can do either or <laughs> both. All right. Thank so, you. So best screenplay. What are you looking for? <laughs> Oh, am I up here? Yes. Okay. Sure. Uh, let's see. I think in terms of original spring, I seem to have not written any of my notes on this one. Um, Go from the top of your head. You could do it. Yes. I'm just trying to remember if I had any films <laughs> I wanted to add here. Um, I think uh, original screenplay, I really... Uh, I think the trial of the Chicago Seven is my favorite. Yeah. Wow. Um, and while I did like Promising Young Woman, I would give the screenplay to try. I thought, you know, it was I know a lot of people don't like Aaron Sorkin, but he does this fast-paced dialogue thing. Yeah. And he did that in that movie, and it just made all the scenes work. I think by doing that, and so. Um, I, I liked that. As far as adapted screenplay, again, I haven't seen The Father, so this was a little more difficult in terms of picking a winner. But I thought One Night in Miami was very good because he took his play and made it a movie, and it's very contained by the fact that it's all in one room with these five characters, and yet he was able... Uh, unlike Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which I think did not do well in terms of adaptation, this one did quite well, so I kind of would like to give the movie um, the the award to to One Night in in Miami. Doctor M um, Sage, where are you going? Well, I have two for this category. One is an animated film, Shaun the Sheep, Farmageddon. <laughs> awesome story. How can you do better than a great story of a cute alien that loves pizza and lands on a farm? You know. And then I actually like Sound of Metal screenplay because mm -hmm. it just tells such a good story. And Minari, of course, has a great screenplay, but I'm saving that. Yeah. Um, uh, best screenplay. I didn't finish, by the way. Oh, oh, oh okay. sorry. I had a couple <laughs> of others to throw out there. All right, go give us your other. I don't know. This is where I don't have. My, I don't know whether they're adapted screenplays or original screenplays. That's not matter for us. All right, um, we'll accept your answer. This is okay. why I did one These are two because of my I didn't want to look that I'll talk about later in my overlooked list. One of them is Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, which I thought had a very, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was just. It, it was a moving story with a great screenplay. And the other is The Assistant, which I thought was quite a interesting uh, yes. concept and the way it was written and everything about it made me really love that screenplay. Now, I don't know, I would guess that both of those are original screenplays, but I'm not yes. sure. Well, uh, yeah. I, I think uh, we can tell uh, you are my mother because uh, my uh, winner is Aaron Sorkin in the trial of the Chicago yeah. Seven. 
Uh, wow. my, other, my other screenplays are Kemp Powers, um, One Night in Miami, yeah. Kitty Green and the Assistant, and uh, Eleanor Catton and uh, Emma. So, uh, but yeah. my winner is Aaron Sorkin. I, I don't like his directing, uh, but uh, he can write a screenplay or a TV show, I will admit. Yeah, this is what happens when That's I don't true. have my notes, because Emma was on my list as well. That would be, of course, adapted screenplay. Yes. Yeah, uh, but, but it was just adorable. Yeah, so. It was, it was very good. So uh, you hit everyone I hit down, so. Uh, All right. <laughs> shared brain. And neither huh? of you liked Sean the Sheep Farmageddon. I cannot believe it. No. I don't think I saw that movie, so I can't say. But I did see the other animated film that was uh, getting, that's getting a lot of attention, Wolf Walkers. Wolf Walkers. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I, I, I assume, I don't know if it's from an Irish tale or if it's original, it is. but. Wow, that's you know, yeah, yeah, yeah that good. one was really good. I almost put it into my movie list up here, but it didn't quite, yeah, uh, edge out. But uh, we'll move to the big time awards here, and we're gonna start out with best supporting actress. So, uh, Rita Cinema, where are you going with best supporting actress? Oh, you didn't put that on our list, but I did. Oh, it yes, it is. Oh, is it? I yes. guess it is. I just didn't write it down, that's all. Okay, but I did it anyway. Which one are we doing? Best Supporting Actress. <laughs> actress. Well, I couldn't yes. tell he said actor or actress. Okay. Uh, best Supporting Actress. Should I start with the actresses I think were overlooked? Yes, go with your nominees. This is our Academy Awards. We aren't yes. even into that part yet. <laughs> well, because I think, you know, well, we get we have our will win, should win coming up, and I know who exactly. will Exactly. I think there were two actresses who did very just beautiful jobs in their roles who were overlooked. One is Ellen Burstyn, who played the mother in Pieces of a Woman. I think her acting was, she, I, and believe me, I think Vanessa Kirby is great in that movie. It's not a good movie. Um, you know, it's not going to win any awards, but those two actors stood out. And I yeah, thought, they Ellen, were, Burst they were I thought Ellen Burstyn was overlooked. The other one, who actually I think might be somebody who should win the award, I'm going to go with her, was Dominique Fishback in Judas and the Black Messiah. She oh. played his girlfriend slash partner. And, you know, I think she's overlooked because there are two male stars in that movie who stand right. out so much. And yet, Fred Hampton was who he was and did a lot of what he did because of her, the, that character. And she yep. played that so subtly and yet strong woman. And she, she, you just felt her influence. I just thought she did an astounding job and was overlooked and should have been a best supporting nominee. I, I would agree. You know, like, she was take fantastic. Glenn Close out. Take Glenn Close <laughs> out. I know she's a, you know, like, and put uh, Dominic Fish back in. Yeah. yeah. Dr. M. Sage, where are you going with best supporting? All right. I'm going out into left field here. And I know Rita Cinema is not going to agree with me. <laughs> but I liked Kristen Scott Thomas as Mrs. Danvers in Rebecca. Mm. Oh, my. I thought yeah. she was an awesome <laughs> Mrs. Danvers. <laughs> so, Kristen Scott <laughs> Thomas. All right. I don't, I, She's I'll live nice. with that one. <laughs> that might be her career achievement award there. Uh, I didn't no, really No, she like... was a good Mrs. Danvers. Yeah, she scared she the was... crap out of me. Okay. I don't want to live with her. <laughs> uh, Come on. My best supporting actors, I really didn't like any of the ones who were nominated than the real <laughs> ones. Uh, other than Amanda Safride for Mank, I thought she was yeah, really she was good my favorite character in the whole it's, film. Uh, you mentioned yeah. Dominic Fishback in Judas and the Black yeah. Messiah. It's uh, ridiculous that she wasn't nominated. And then uh, Kristen Wiig in Wonder Woman 1984. Kristen Wiig was, was good. No, she no. Was she, was the good. Best, she was no. actually the best part of the film. They should have had more. Oh my goodness. They should have had more. I couldn't disagree more. If they had more Cheetah, 
we would have been okay. The problem is we didn't have more cheetah. So Cranston wig in 1984. But oh, my winner no. overall for best supporting actress is uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead in Birds of Prey. She plays the huntress. Uh, I yeah. really, really liked her in that film. Uh, she was really, really great. I thought she just, uh, that's probably the best uh, role she's ever had. So uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead in Birds of Prey. So that's my winner. Well, you liked Birds of Prey a lot more than I did. <laughs> yes, I don't think you quite, uh, that's probably not hit your comic book genre. You don't understand the cheekiness. It's a I understand the cheekiness. I just, <laughs> you know. Uh, all right, so we'll go from the girls to the boys here and the best supporting actor. Where are we going with best supporting actor? Okay, well, I have actually, this is, this is strange because this one, I had several that I thought had been overlooked. Oh, I don't think that's strange at all, Rita Cinema. Uh, <laughs> one is actually <laughs> Chadwick Boseman, who got nominated for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom as, Black, as Best Actor. And of course, you know, was, we, well, there are issues there. It's okay. Anyway, we all know I actually, why. I actually thought the nomination that he didn't get that he should have was as Best Supporting Actor in The Five Bloods. I, I thought he, you know, that movie was not, you know, I liked it when I watched it, but when I watched it again, I realized the things that were kind of wrong with that movie that, you know, why it didn't get nominated. Yeah. Although, um, you know, anyway, but Chadwick Boseman uh, playing a supporting role in that was very good, very good. And the other one, <laughs> I don't know, I, and I never see anything about this, I thought Mark Rylance playing William Kunstler in The Trial of the Chicago Seven. Of course, he's one of my favorite actors, so there's a little bit of a personal thing here. I really like him. But I thought he was pretty convincing. <laughs> I just loved him as William Kunstler, although probably Kunstler was a little more druggy. I think he was probably <laughs> high on marijuana or LSD most of the time he was in court. But anyway, and, and that, I... I don't know. I really think there. I'm going to say for the next show who I think should win this award. But those are the those are the ones I think were overlooked. Yes. So right. okay. Actually, just as a fun nominee, to <laughs> Bill Nighy in I, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing his last name right. Uh, in Emma played the father. He oh, was hilarious. Oh, yeah. He was. Fantastic. He was hilarious, but you know, I wouldn't put him as a best supporting actor yeah. necessarily. Dr. Ibsage, where are you going for best supporting actor? Once again, I'm going into far, far away from Is it the sheep again? Everyone else. <laughs> it is Christopher Jackson as George Washington in Hamilton. Yeah, I couldn't do Hamilton. <laughs> You're really big on the <laughs> Hamilton. So, uh, I enjoyed I, watching Hamilton. Yeah. And when I make up my awards, it's about if I see this movie, scro well, I'm scrolling through the channels and it's on, will I stop and watch it? Yes, I will. I'm not sure I categorize it even as a movie. I, I think I need to categorize it as a film. But it has an Oscar nomination, so yes, that's why I, I did it. I know, but... <laughs> And I uh, love George Washington. He's a great character. Uh, my best supporting actor probably is uh, the favorite to win it is uh, Daniel Kaluuya in uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, he was just great in that film. Uh, the guys I, I, I thought uh, my nominees, uh, Hugh Grant and The Gentleman, I really, really liked uh, him there. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> Mark. You mentioned Mark <laughs> Rylands in The Trial of the Chicago Seven. Uh, really, really good. Uh, Chadwick Boseman in Defy Bloods, the actual nomination he should have got. I, I thought there were two really good performances in The Five Bloods, even though it's not really a, a film I loved, loved. And then uh, I, I thought as a token nod, uh, Bill Murray on the Rocks. I yeah. thought deserved a little bit of love. It was, he was he was the funnest part of that movie. So uh, he was he very was. good in that, but he played himself. Yes, I know, but uh, yes, it's pretty okay much. for Bill to play himself. <laughs> All right, so we'll move from supporting actor to best actress. Where are we going with best actress here? Best actress. I want to tell you that actually this year, I think this is one of the strongest fields I have seen in a while in terms of best actress. To me, 
This is the hardest one. This will be the hardest one. If I were, if I were a member of the Academy and had to vote, on the actresses that are nominated, I don't even know if I could choose. I, they are all so, Interesting. they're just so good in their roles. I think all of them are. Now, do I think there were some actresses overlooked? Yes. I think that Julia Garner for The Assistant, um, I thought she was outstanding. I'm sorry she wasn't nominated, but you know, you can only pick five. And I actually thought Anna Taylor Joy Anya Taylor Joy was quite good in Emma. She, yes, she was. I, I don't know that she. I don't think her performance stands up to these five who have been nominated, who have you know different really meaty roles. I think. Um, you think Viola I, Davis should have been nominated? Yes, I think she should have been nominated. I. I Interesting. I, she's. Actually, I would replace. She's actually the favorite right now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm reading. Um, yeah, I think she should have been nominated. I just, my problem is I don't want to drag an actor or actress down by virtue of not liking the movie. And that movie I didn't like, but I thought she did do a good job um, playing the role. But she wouldn't, I wouldn't give her the Academy Award. I, I think maybe I'll give the Academy Award to Vanessa Kirby. Oh, Ooh. Vanessa Kirby. All right. Dr. M. Sage, where are you Nothing else. She didn't get enough attention from The Crown back when she played Margaret. <laughs> she was awesome in The Crown. Yes, she is. Oh. All right, Dr. I M. Would Sage. Give, I would give Best Actress to Julia Garner in The Assistant. She carried that movie. The yes, movie wouldn't be great. there without Julia Garner in it. Right. Well, and now her I... subtle acting was so good. Now I think we're realizing we're all related here because my winner is Julia Gee, Garner for the assistant. <laughs> so, well, it's too uh, bad the Academy overlooked her. Yes, I know. It uh, is. It's a shame. That, that movie I really did like. I, I sort of forgot it did come out when it had come out. And then uh, when I did my research, I remembered it. And I was like, that was really probably one of the better movies of the year. Yeah. And it just sort of got lost. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if it's sort of being on Hulu or something uh, just sort of uh, made it disappear. But uh, you mentioned Anya Taylor-Joy as Emma, I really thought uh, was really good. Uh, Margot Robbie and Birds of Prey uh, was another nominee. Sophia Loren in The Life Ahead, yeah. I have. Uh, and then uh, the two nominees that got nominations, uh, Carrie Milligan in Promising Young Woman, and then uh, Frances McDormand in Nomadland were uh, my nominees overall. But I, I really liked uh, Julie Gardner in The, uh, the you know, 